The Brothers Karamazov. Translated from the Russian of Fyodor Dostoevsky. By Constance Garnett. The Lowell Press. New York. Epilogue. Chapter 1 Plans for Mitya's Escape. Chapter 2 For a Moment the Lie Becomes Truth. Chapter 3 Elusha's Funeral. The Speech at the Stone. Footnotes. Part 1. Book I. The History of a Family. Chapter 1. Fyodor Pavlovich Karamazov. Alexei Fyodorovich Karamazov was the third son of Fyodor Pavlovich Karamazov, a landowner well known in our district in his own day, and still remembered among us owing to his gloomy and tragic death, which happened thirteen years ago, and which I shall describe in its proper place. For the present I will only say that this landowner, for so we used to call him, although he hardly spent a day of his life on his own estate, was a strange type, yet one pretty frequently to be met with, a type abject and vicious and at the same time senseless. But he was one of those senseless persons who are very well capable of looking after their worldly affairs, and, apparently, after nothing else. Fyodor Pavlovich, for instance, began with next to nothing, his estate was of the smallest, he ran to dine at other men's tables, and fastened on them as a toady, yet at his death it appeared that he had a hundred thousand rubles in hard cash. At the same time, he was all his life one of the most senseless, fantastical fellows in the whole district. I repeat, it was not stupidity, the majority of these fantastical fellows are shrewd and intelligent enough, but just senselessness, and a peculiar national form of it. He was married twice, and had three sons, the eldest, Dmitri, by his first wife, and two, Ivan and Alexei, by his second. Fyodor Pavlovich's first wife, Adelaida Ivanovna, belonged to a fairly rich and distinguished noble family, also landowners in our district, the Myasovs. How it came to pass that an heiress, who was also a beauty, and moreover one of those vigorous, intelligent girls, so common in this generation, but sometimes also to be found in the last, could have married such a worthless, puny weakling, as we all called him, I won't attempt to explain. I knew a young lady of the last, romantic, generation who after some years of an enigmatic passion for a gentleman, whom she might quite easily have married at any moment, invented insuperable obstacles to their union, and ended by throwing herself one stormy night into a rather deep and rapid river from a high bank, almost a precipice, and so perished, entirely to satisfy her own caprice and to be like Shakespeare's Ophelia. Indeed, if this precipice, a chosen and favorite spot of hers, had been less picturesque, if there had been a prosaic flat bank in its place, most likely the suicide would never have taken place. This is a fact, and probably there have been not a few similar instances in the last two or three generations. Adelaida Ivanovna Myasov's action was similarly, no doubt, an echo of other people's ideas, and was due to the irritation caused by lack of mental freedom. She wanted, perhaps, to show her feminine independence, to override class distinctions and the despotism of her family. An appliable imagination persuaded her, we must suppose, for a brief moment, that Fyodor Pavlovich, in spite of his parasitic position, was one of the bold and ironical spirits of that progressive epoch, though he was, in fact, an ill-natured buffoon and nothing more. What gave the marriage piquancy was that it was preceded by an elopement, and this greatly captivated Adelaida Ivanovna's fancy. Fyodor Pavlovich's position at the time made him specially eager for any such enterprise, for he was passionately anxious to make a career in one way or another. To attach himself to a good family and obtain a dowry was an alluring prospect. As for mutual love it did not exist apparently, either in the bride or in him, in spite of Adelaida Ivanovna's beauty. This was, perhaps, a unique case of the kind in the life of Fyodor Pavlovich, who was always of a voluptuous temper, and ready to run after any petticoat on the slightest encouragement. She seems to have been the only woman who made no particular appeal to his senses. Immediately after the elopement Adelaida Ivanovna discerned in a flash that she had no feeling for her husband but contempt. The marriage accordingly showed itself in its true colors with extraordinary rapidity. Although the family accepted the event pretty quickly and apportioned the runaway bride her dowry, the husband and wife began to lead a most disorderly life, 
and there were everlasting scenes between them. It was said that the young wife showed incomparably more generosity and dignity than Fyodor Pavlovich, who, as is now known, got hold of all her money up to 25,000 rubles as soon as she received it, so that those thousands were lost to her forever. The little village and the rather fine town house which formed part of her dowry he did his utmost for a long time to transfer to his name, by means of some deed of conveyance. He would probably have succeeded, merely from her moral fatigue and desire to get rid of him, and from the contempt and loathing he aroused by his persistent and shameless importunity. But, fortunately, Adelaida Ivanovna's family intervened and circumvented his greediness. It is known for a fact that frequent fights took place between the husband and wife, but rumor had it that Fyodor Pavlovich did not beat his wife but was beaten by her, for she was a hot-tempered, bold, dark-browed, impatient woman, possessed of remarkable physical strength. Finally, she left the house and ran away from Fyodor Pavlovich with a destitute divinity student, leaving Mitya, a child of three years old, in her husband's hands. Immediately Fyodor Pavlovich introduced a regular harem into the house, and abandoned himself to orgies of drunkenness. In the intervals he used to drive all over the province, complaining tearfully to each and all of Adelaida Ivanovna's having left him, going into details too disgraceful for a husband to mention in regard to his own married life. What seemed to gratify him and flatter his self-love most was to play the ridiculous part of the injured husband, and to parade his woes with embellishments. One would think that you'd got a promotion, Fyodor Pavlovich, you seem so pleased in spite of your sorrow, scoffers said to him. Many even added that he was glad of a new comic part in which to play the buffoon, and that it was simply to make it funnier that he pretended to be unaware of his ludicrous position. But, who knows, it may have been simplicity. At last he succeeded in getting on the track of his runaway wife. The poor woman turned out to be in Petersburg, where she had gone with her divinity student, and where she had thrown herself into a life of complete emancipation. Fyodor Pavlovich at once began bustling about, making preparations to go to Petersburg, with what object he could not himself have said. He would perhaps have really gone, but having determined to do so he felt at once entitled to fortify himself for the journey by another bout of reckless drinking. And just at that time his wife's family received the news of her death in Petersburg. She had died quite suddenly in a garret, according to one story, of typhus, or as another version had it, of starvation. Fyodor Pavlovich was drunk when he heard of his wife's death, and the story is that he ran out into the street and began shouting with joy, raising his hands to heaven, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace, but others say he wept without restraint like a little child, so much so that people were sorry for him, in spite of the repulsion he inspired. It is quite possible that both versions were true, that he rejoiced at his release, and at the same time wept for her who released him. As a general rule, people, even the wicked, are much more naive and simple-hearted than we suppose. And we ourselves are, too. Chapter 2. He Gets Rid of His Eldest Son you can easily imagine what a father such a man could be and how he would bring up his children. His behavior as a father was exactly what might be expected. He completely abandoned the child of his marriage with Adelaida Ivanovna, not from malice, nor because of his matrimonial grievances, but simply because he forgot him. While he was wearying everyone with his tears and complaints, and turning his house into a sink of debauchery, a faithful servant of the family, Grigory, took the three-year-old Mitya into his care. If he hadn't looked after him there would have been no one even to change the baby's little shirt. It happened moreover that the child's relations on his mother's side forgot him too at first. His grandfather was no longer living, his widow, Mitya's grandmother, had moved to Moscow, and was seriously ill, while his daughters were married, so that Mitya remained for almost a whole year in old Grigory's charge and lived with him in the servant's cottage. But if his father had remembered him, he could not, indeed, have been altogether unaware of his existence, he would have sent him back to the cottage, as the child would only have been in the way of his debaucheries. But a cousin of Mitya's mother, Pyotr Alexandrovich Myasov, happened to return from Paris. He lived for many years afterwards abroad, but was at that time quite a young man, and distinguished among the Myasovs as a man of enlightened ideas and of European culture, who had been in the capitals and abroad. Towards the end of his life he became a liberal of the type common in the forties and fifties.
In the course of his career he had come into contact with many of the most liberal men of his epoch, both in Russia and abroad. He had known Proudhon and Bakunin personally, and in his declining years was very fond of describing the three days of the Paris Revolution of February 1848, hinting that he himself had almost taken part in the fighting on the barricades. This was one of the most grateful recollections of his youth. He had an independent property of about a thousand souls, to reckon in the old style. His splendid estate lay on the outskirts of our little town and bordered on the lands of our famous monastery, with which Pyotr Alexandrovich began an endless lawsuit, almost as soon as he came into the estate, concerning the rights of fishing in the river or wood-cutting in the forest, I don't know exactly which. He regarded it as his duty as a citizen and a man of culture to open an attack upon the clericals. Hearing all about Adelaida Ivanovna, whom he, of course, remembered, and in whom he had at one time been interested, and learning of the existence of Mitya, he intervened, in spite of all his youthful indignation and contempt for Fyodor Pavlovich. He made the latter's acquaintance for the first time, and told him directly that he wished to undertake the child's education. He used long afterwards to tell as a characteristic touch, that when he began to speak of Mitya, Fyodor Pavlovich looked for some time as though he did not understand what child he was talking about, and even as though he was surprised to hear that he had a little son in the house. The story may have been exaggerated, yet it must have been something like the truth. Fyodor Pavlovich was all his life fond of acting, of suddenly playing an unexpected part, sometimes without any motive for doing so, and even to his own direct disadvantage, as, for instance, in the present case. This habit, however, is characteristic of a very great number of people, some of them very clever ones, not like Fyodor Pavlovich. Pyotr Alexandrovich carried the business through vigorously, and was appointed, with Fyodor Pavlovich, joint guardian of the child, who had a small property, a house and land, left him by his mother. Mitya did, in fact, pass into this cousin's keeping, but as the latter had no family of his own, and after securing the revenues of his estates was in haste to return at once to Paris, he left the boy in charge of one of his cousins, a lady living in Moscow. It came to pass that, settling permanently in Paris he, too, forgot the child, especially when the revolution of February broke out, making an impression on his mind that he remembered all the rest of his life. The Moscow lady died, and Mitya passed into the care of one of her married daughters. I believe he changed his home a fourth time later on. I won't enlarge upon that now, as I shall have much to tell later of Fyodor Pavlovich's firstborn, and must confine myself now to the most essential facts about him, without which I could not begin my story. In the first place, this Mitya, or rather Dmitri Fyodorovich, was the only one of Fyodor Pavlovich's three sons who grew up in the belief that he had property, and that he would be independent on coming of age. He spent an irregular boyhood and youth. He did not finish his studies at the gymnasium, he got into a military school, then went to the Caucasus, was promoted, fought a duel, and was degraded to the ranks, earned promotion again, led a wild life, and spent a good deal of money. He did not begin to receive any income from Fyodor Pavlovich until he came of age, and until then got into debt. He saw and knew his father, Fyodor Pavlovich, for the first time on coming of age, when he visited our neighborhood on purpose to settle with him about his property. He seems not to have liked his father. He did not stay long with him, and made haste to get away, having only succeeded in obtaining a sum of money, and entering into an agreement for future payments from the estate, of the revenues and value of which he was unable, a fact worthy of note, upon this occasion, to get a statement from his father. Fyodor Pavlovich remarked for the first time then, this, too, should be noted, that Mitya had a vague and exaggerated idea of his property. Fyodor Pavlovich was very well satisfied with this, as it fell in with his own designs. He gathered only that the young man was frivolous, unruly, of violent passions, impatient, and dissipated, and that if he could only obtain ready money he would be satisfied, although only, of course, for a short time. So Fyodor Pavlovich began to take advantage of this fact, sending him from time to time small doles, installments. In the end, when four years later, Mitya, losing patience, came a second time to our little town to settle up once for all with his father, it turned out to his amazement that he had nothing, that it was difficult to get an account even, 
that he had received the whole value of his property in sums of money from Fyodor Pavlovich, and was perhaps even in debt to him, that by various agreements into which he had, of his own desire, entered at various previous dates, he had no right to expect anything more, and so on, and so on. The young man was overwhelmed, suspected deceit and cheating, and was almost beside himself. And, indeed, this circumstance led to the catastrophe, the account of which forms the subject of my first introductory story, or rather the external side of it. But before I pass to that story I must say a little of Fyodor Pavlovich's other two sons, and of their origin. Chapter 3 The Second Marriage and the Second Family Very shortly after getting his four-year-old Mitya off his hands Fyodor Pavlovich married a second time. His second marriage lasted eight years. He took this second wife, Sofia Ivanovna, also a very young girl, from another province, where he had gone upon some small piece of business in company with a Jew. Though Fyodor Pavlovich was a drunkard and a vicious debauchee he never neglected investing his capital, and managed his business affairs very successfully, though, no doubt, not over-scrupulously. Sofia Ivanovna was the daughter of an obscure deacon, and was left from childhood an orphan without relations. She grew up in the house of a general's widow, a wealthy old lady of good position, who was at once her benefactress and tormentor. I do not know the details, but I have only heard that the orphan girl, a meek and gentle creature, was once cut down from a halter in which she was hanging from a nail in the loft, so terrible were her sufferings from the caprice and everlasting nagging of this old woman, who was apparently not bad-hearted but had become an insufferable tyrant through idleness. Fyodor Pavlovich made her an offer, inquiries were made about him and he was refused. But again, as in his first marriage, he proposed an elopement to the orphan girl. There is very little doubt that she would not on any account have married him if she had known a little more about him in time. But she lived in another province, besides, what could a little girl of sixteen know about it, except that she would be better at the bottom of the river than remaining with her benefactress. So the poor child exchanged a benefactress for a benefactor. Fyodor Pavlovich did not get a penny this time, for the general's widow was furious. She gave them nothing and cursed them both. But he had not reckoned on a dowry, what allured him was the remarkable beauty of the innocent girl, above all her innocent appearance, which had a peculiar attraction for a vicious profligate, who had hitherto admired only the coarser types of feminine beauty. Those innocent eyes slit my soul up like a razor, he used to say afterwards, with his loathsome snigger. In a man so depraved this might, of course, mean no more than sensual attraction. As he had received no dowry with his wife, and had, so to speak, taken her, from the halter, he did not stand on ceremony with her. Making her feel that she had, wronged, him, he took advantage of her phenomenal meekness and submissiveness to trample on the elementary decencies of marriage. He gathered loose women into his house, and carried on orgies of debauchery in his wife's presence. To show what a pass things had come to, I may mention that Grigory, the gloomy, stupid, obstinate, argumentative servant, who had always hated his first mistress, Adelaida Ivanovna, took the side of his new mistress. He championed her cause, abusing Fyodor Pavlovich in a manner little befitting a servant, and on one occasion broke up the revels and drove all the disorderly women out of the house. In the end this unhappy young woman, kept in terror from her childhood, fell into that kind of nervous disease which is most frequently found in peasant women who are said to be possessed by devils. At times after terrible fits of hysterics she even lost her reason. Yet she bore Fyodor Pavlovich two sons, Ivan and Alexei, the eldest in the first year of marriage and the second three years later. When she died, little Alexei was in his fourth year, and, strange as it seems, I know that he remembered his mother all his life, like a dream, of course. At her death almost exactly the same thing happened to the two little boys as to their elder brother, Mitya. They were completely forgotten and abandoned by their father. They were looked after by the same Grigory and lived in his cottage, where they were found by the tyrannical old lady who had brought up their mother. She was still alive, and had not, all those eight years, forgotten the insult done her. All that time she was obtaining exact information as to her Sophia's manner of life, and hearing of her illness and hideous surroundings she declared aloud two or three times to her retainers. 
It serves her right. God has punished her for her ingratitude. Exactly three months after Sofia Ivanovna's death the general's widow suddenly appeared in our town, and went straight to Fyodor Pavlovich's house. She spent only half an hour in the town but she did a great deal. It was evening. Fyodor Pavlovich, whom she had not seen for those eight years, came in to her drunk. The story is that instantly upon seeing him, without any sort of explanation, she gave him two good, resounding slaps on the face, seized him by a tuft of hair, and shook him three times up and down. Then, without a word, she went straight to the cottage to the two boys. Seeing, at the first glance, that they were unwashed and in dirty linen, she promptly gave Grigory, too, a box on the ear, and announcing that she would carry off both the children she wrapped them just as they were in a rug, put them in the carriage, and drove off to her own town. Grigory accepted the blow like a devoted slave, without a word, and when he escorted the old lady to her carriage he made her a low bow and pronounced impressively that, God would repay her for the orphans. You are a blockhead all the same, the old lady shouted to him as she drove away. Fyodor Pavlovich, thinking it over, decided that it was a good thing, and did not refuse the general's widow his formal consent to any proposition in regard to his children's education. As for the slaps she had given him, he drove all over the town telling the story. It happened that the old lady died soon after this, but she left the boys in her will a thousand rubles each, for their instruction, and so that all be spent on them exclusively, with the condition that it be so portioned out as to last till they are twenty-one, for it is more than adequate provision for such children. If other people think fit to throw away their money, let them. I have not read the will myself, but I heard there was something queer of the sort, very whimsically expressed. The principal heir, Yefim Petrovich Polnov, the marshal of nobility of the province, turned out, however, to be an honest man. Writing to Fyodor Pavlovich, and discerning at once that he could extract nothing from him for his children's education, though the latter never directly refused but only procrastinated as he always did in such cases, and was, indeed, at times effusively sentimental, Yefim Petrovich took a personal interest in the orphans. He became especially fond of the younger, Alexei, who lived for a long while as one of his family. I beg the reader to note this from the beginning. And to Yefim Petrovich, a man of a generosity and humanity rarely to be met with, the young people were more indebted for their education and bringing up than to any one. He kept the two thousand rubles left to them by the general's widow intact, so that by the time they came of age their portions had been doubled by the accumulation of interest. He educated them both at his own expense, and certainly spent far more than a thousand rubles upon each of them. I won't enter into a detailed account of their boyhood and youth, but will only mention a few of the most important events. Of the elder, Ivan, I will only say that he grew into a somewhat morose and reserved, though far from timid boy. At ten years old he had realized that they were living not in their own home but on other people's charity, and that their father was a man of whom it was disgraceful to speak. This boy began very early, almost in his infancy, so they say at least, to show a brilliant and unusual aptitude for learning. I don't know precisely why, but he left the family of Yefim Petrovich when he was hardly thirteen, entering a Moscow gymnasium, and boarding with an experienced and celebrated teacher, an old friend of Yefim Petrovich. Ivan used to declare afterwards that this was all due to the ardor for good works of Yefim Petrovich, who was captivated by the idea that the boy's genius should be trained by a teacher of genius. But neither Yefim Petrovich nor this teacher was living when the young man finished at the gymnasium and entered the university. As Yefim Petrovich had made no provision for the payment of the tyrannical old lady's legacy, which had grown from one thousand to two, it was delayed, owing to formalities inevitable in Russia, and the young man was in great straits for the first two years at the university, as he was forced to keep himself all the time he was studying. It must be noted that he did not even attempt to communicate with his father, perhaps from pride, from contempt for him, or perhaps from his cool common sense, which told him that from such a father he would get no real assistance. However that may have been, the young man was by no means despondent and succeeded in getting work, at first giving sixpenny lessons and afterwards getting paragraphs on street incidents into the newspapers under the signature of eyewitness. These paragraphs, it was said, were so interesting and piquant that they were soon taken. 
This alone showed the young man's practical and intellectual superiority over the masses of needy and unfortunate students of both sexes who hang about the offices of the newspapers and journals, unable to think of anything better than everlasting entreaties for copying and translations from the French. Having once got into touch with the editors Ivan Fyodorovich always kept up his connection with them, and in his latter years at the university he published brilliant reviews of books upon various special subjects, so that he became well known in literary circles. But only in his last year he suddenly succeeded in attracting the attention of a far wider circle of readers, so that a great many people noticed and remembered him. It was rather a curious incident. When he had just left the university and was preparing to go abroad upon his 2,000 rubles, Ivan Fyodorovich published in one of the more important journals a strange article, which attracted general notice, on a subject of which he might have been supposed to know nothing, as he was a student of natural science. The article dealt with a subject which was being debated everywhere at the time, the position of the ecclesiastical courts. After discussing several opinions on the subject he went on to explain his own view. What was most striking about the article was its tone, and its unexpected conclusion. Many of the church party regarded him unquestioningly as on their side. And yet not only the secularists but even atheists joined them in their applause. Finally some sagacious persons opined that the article was nothing but an impudent satirical burlesque. I mention this incident particularly because this article penetrated into the famous monastery in our neighborhood, where the inmates, being particularly interested in the question of the ecclesiastical courts, were completely bewildered by it. Learning the author's name, they were interested in his being a native of the town and the son of, that Fyodor Pavlovich. And just then it was that the author himself made his appearance among us. Why Ivan Fyodorovich had come amongst us I remember asking myself at the time with a certain uneasiness. This fateful visit, which was the first step leading to so many consequences, I never fully explained to myself. It seemed strange on the face of it that a young man so learned, so proud, and apparently so cautious, should suddenly visit such an infamous house and a father who had ignored him all his life, hardly knew him, never thought of him, and would not under any circumstances have given him money, though he was always afraid that his sons Ivan and Alexei would also come to ask him for it. And here the young man was staying in the house of such a father, had been living with him for two months, and they were on the best possible terms. This last fact was a special cause of wonder to many others as well as to me. Pyotr Alexandrovich Myasov, of whom we have spoken already, the cousin of Fyodor Pavlovich's first wife, happened to be in the neighborhood again on a visit to his estate. He had come from Paris, which was his permanent home. I remember that he was more surprised than any one when he made the acquaintance of the young man, who interested him extremely, and with whom he sometimes argued and not without an inner pang compared himself in acquirements. He is proud, he used to say, he will never be in one of pence, he has got money enough to go abroad now. What does he want here? Everyone can see that he hasn't come for money, for his father would never give him any. He has no taste for drink and dissipation, and yet his father can't do without him. They get on so well together. That was the truth, the young man had an unmistakable influence over his father, who positively appeared to be behaving more decently and even seemed at times ready to obey his son, though often extremely and even spitefully perverse. It was only later that we learned that Ivan had come partly at the request of, and in the interests of, his elder brother, Dmitri, whom he saw for the first time on this very visit, though he had before leaving Moscow been in correspondence with him about an important matter of more concern to Dmitri than himself. What that business was the reader will learn fully in due time. Yet even when I did know of this special circumstance I still felt Ivan Fyodorovich to be an enigmatic figure, and thought his visit rather mysterious. I may add that Ivan appeared at the time in the light of a mediator between his father and his elder brother Dmitri, who was in open quarrel with his father and even planning to bring an action against him. The family, I repeat, was now united for the first time, and some of its members met for the first time in their lives. The younger brother, Alexei, had been a year already among us, having been the first of the three to arrive. It is of that brother Alexei I find it most difficult to speak in this introduction. Yet I must give some preliminary account of him, if only to explain one queer fact, which is that I have to introduce my hero to the reader wearing the cassock of a novice. 
Yes, he had been for the last year in our monastery, and seemed willing to be cloistered there for the rest of his life. Chapter 4 The Third Son, Alyosha He was only twenty, his brother Ivan was in his twenty-fourth year at the time, while their elder brother Dmitri was twenty-seven. First of all, I must explain that this young man, Alyosha, was not a fanatic, and, in my opinion at least, was not even a mystic. I may as well give my full opinion from the beginning. He was simply an early lover of humanity, and that he adopted the monastic life was simply because at that time it struck him, so to say, as the ideal escape for his soul struggling from the darkness of worldly wickedness to the light of love. And the reason this life struck him in this way was that he found in it at that time, as he thought, an extraordinary being, our celebrated elder, Zosima, to whom he became attached with all the warm first love of his ardent heart. But I do not dispute that he was very strange even at that time, and had been so indeed from his cradle. I have mentioned already, by the way, that though he lost his mother in his fourth year he remembered her all his life, her face, her caresses, as though she stood living before me. Such memories may persist, as every one knows, from an even earlier age, even from two years old, but scarcely standing out through a whole lifetime like spots of light out of darkness, like a corner torn out of a huge picture, which has all faded and disappeared except that fragment. That is how it was with him. He remembered one still summer evening, an open window, the slanting rays of the setting sun, that he recalled most vividly of all, in a corner of the room the holy image, before it a lighted lamp, and on her knees before the image his mother, sobbing hysterically with cries and moans, snatching him up in both arms, squeezing him close till it hurt, and praying for him to the mother of God, holding him out in both arms to the image as though to put him under the mother's protection, and suddenly a nurse runs in and snatches him from her in terror. That was the picture. And Alyosha remembered his mother's face at that minute. He used to say that it was frenzied but beautiful as he remembered. But he rarely cared to speak of this memory to anyone. In his childhood and youth he was by no means expansive, and talked little indeed, but not from shyness or a sullen unsociability, quite the contrary, from something different, from a sort of inner preoccupation entirely personal and unconcerned with other people, but so important to him that he seemed, as it were, to forget others on account of it. But he was fond of people, he seemed throughout his life to put implicit trust in people, yet no one ever looked on him as a simpleton or naive person. There was something about him which made one feel at once, and it was so all his life afterwards, that he did not care to be a judge of others, that he would never take it upon himself to criticize and would never condemn anyone for anything. He seemed, indeed, to accept everything without the least condemnation though often grieving bitterly, and this was so much so that no one could surprise or frighten him even in his earliest youth. Coming at twenty to his father's house, which was a very sink of filthy debauchery, he, chaste and pure as he was, simply withdrew in silence when to look on was unbearable, but without the slightest sign of contempt or condemnation. His father, who had once been in a dependent position, and so was sensitive and ready to take offense, met him at first with distrust and sullenness. He does not say much, he used to say, and thinks the more. But soon, within a fortnight indeed, he took to embracing him and kissing him terribly often, with drunken tears, with sottish sentimentality, yet he evidently felt real and deep affection for him, such as he had never been capable of feeling for anyone before. Everyone, indeed, loved this young man wherever he went, and it was so from his earliest childhood. When he entered the household of his patron and benefactor, Yefim Petrovich Polnov, he gained the hearts of all the family, so that they looked on him quite as their own child. Yet he entered the house at such a tender age that he could not have acted from design nor artfulness in winning affection. So that the gift of making himself loved directly and unconsciously was inherent in him, in his very nature, so to speak. It was the same at school, though he seemed to be just one of those children who are distrusted, sometimes ridiculed, and even disliked by their schoolfellows. He was dreamy, for instance, and rather solitary. From his earliest childhood he was fond of creeping into a corner to read, and yet he was a general favorite all the while he was at school. He was rarely playful or merry, but anyone could see at the first glance that this was not from any sullenness. 
On the contrary he was bright and good-tempered. He never tried to show off among his schoolfellows. Perhaps because of this, he was never afraid of anyone, yet the boys immediately understood that he was not proud of his fearlessness and seemed to be unaware that he was bold and courageous. He never resented an insult. It would happen that an hour after the offense he would address the offender or answer some question with as trustful and candid an expression as though nothing had happened between them. And it was not that he seemed to have forgotten or intentionally forgiven the affront, but simply that he did not regard it as an affront, and this completely conquered and captivated the boys. He had one characteristic which made all his schoolfellows from the bottom class to the top want to mock at him, not from malice but because it amused them. This characteristic was a wild fanatical modesty and chastity. He could not bear to hear certain words and certain conversations about women. There are certain words and conversations unhappily impossible to eradicate in schools. Boys pure in mind and heart, almost children, are fond of talking in school among themselves, and even aloud, of things, pictures, and images of which even soldiers would sometimes hesitate to speak. More than that, much that soldiers have no knowledge or conception of is familiar to quite young children of our intellectual and higher classes. There is no moral depravity, no real corrupt inner cynicism in it, but there is the appearance of it, and it is often looked upon among them as something refined, subtle, daring, and worthy of imitation. Seeing that Alyosha Karamazov put his fingers in his ears when they talked of that, they used sometimes to crowd round him, pull his hands away, and shout nastiness into both ears, while he struggled, slipped to the floor, tried to hide himself without uttering one word of abuse, enduring their insults in silence. But at last they left him alone and gave up taunting him with being a regular girl, and what's more they looked upon it with compassion as a weakness. He was always one of the best in the class but was never first. At the time of Yefim Petrovich's death Alyosha had two more years to complete at the provincial gymnasium. The inconsolable widow went almost immediately after his death for a long visit to Italy with her whole family, which consisted only of women and girls. Alyosha went to live in the house of two distant relations of Yefim Petrovich, ladies whom he had never seen before. On what terms he lived with them he did not know himself. It was very characteristic of him, indeed, that he never cared at whose expense he was living. In that respect he was a striking contrast to his elder brother Ivan, who struggled with poverty for his first two years in the university, maintained himself by his own efforts, and had from childhood been bitterly conscious of living at the expense of his benefactor. But this strange trait in Alyosha's character must not, I think, be criticized too severely, for at the slightest acquaintance with him anyone would have perceived that Alyosha was one of those youths, almost of the type of religious enthusiast, who, if they were suddenly to come into possession of a large fortune, would not hesitate to give it away for the asking, either for good works or perhaps to a clever rogue. In general he seemed scarcely to know the value of money, not, of course, in a literal sense. When he was given pocket money, which he never asked for, he was either terribly careless of it so that it was gone in a moment, or he kept it for weeks together, not knowing what to do with it. In later years Pyotr Alexandrovich Myasov, a man very sensitive on the score of money and bourgeois honesty, pronounced the following judgment, after getting to know Alyosha. Here is perhaps the one man in the world whom you might leave alone without a penny, in the center of an unknown town of a million inhabitants, and he would not come to harm, he would not die of cold and hunger, for he would be fed and sheltered at once, and if he were not, he would find a shelter for himself, and it would cost him no effort or humiliation. And to shelter him would be no burden, but, on the contrary, would probably be looked on as a pleasure. He did not finish his studies at the gymnasium. A year before the end of the course he suddenly announced to the ladies that he was going to see his father about a plan which had occurred to him. They were sorry and unwilling to let him go. The journey was not an expensive one, and the ladies would not let him pawn his watch, a parting present from his benefactor's family. They provided him liberally with money and even fitted him out with new clothes and linen. But he returned half the money they gave him, saying that he intended to go third class. On his arrival in the town he made no answer to his father's first inquiry why he had come before completing his studies, and seemed, so they say, unusually thoughtful. 
it soon became apparent that he was looking for his mother's tomb. He practically acknowledged at the time that that was the only object of his visit. But it can hardly have been the whole reason of it. It is more probable that he himself did not understand and could not explain what had suddenly arisen in his soul and drawn him irresistibly into a new, unknown, but inevitable path. Fyodor Pavlovich could not show him where his second wife was buried, for he had never visited her grave since he had thrown earth upon her coffin, and in the course of years had entirely forgotten where she was buried. Fyodor Pavlovich, by the way, had for some time previously not been living in our town. Three or four years after his wife's death he had gone to the south of Russia and finally turned up in Odessa, where he spent several years. He made the acquaintance at first, in his own words, of a lot of low Jews, Jewesses, and Jukins, and ended by being received by Jews high and low alike. It may be presumed that at this period he developed a peculiar faculty for making and hoarding money. He finally returned to our town only three years before Alyosha's arrival. His former acquaintances found him looking terribly aged, although he was by no means an old man. He behaved not exactly with more dignity but with more effrontery. The former buffoon showed an insolent propensity for making buffoons of others. His depravity with women was not simply what it used to be, but even more revolting. In a short time he opened a great number of new taverns in the district. It was evident that he had perhaps a hundred thousand rubles or not much less. Many of the inhabitants of the town and district were soon in his debt, and, of course, had given good security. Of late, too, he looked somehow bloated and seemed more irresponsible, more uneven, had sunk into a sort of incoherence, used to begin one thing and go on with another, as though he were letting himself go altogether. He was more and more frequently drunk. And, if it had not been for the same servant Grigory, who by that time had aged considerably too, and used to look after him sometimes almost like a tutor, Fyodor Pavlovich might have got into terrible scrapes. Alyosha's arrival seemed to affect even his moral side, as though something had awakened in this prematurely old man which had long been dead in his soul. Do you know, he used often to say, looking at Alyosha, that you are like her, the crazy woman, that was what he used to call his dead wife, Alyosha's mother. Grigory it was who pointed out the, crazy woman's, grave to Alyosha. He took him to our town cemetery and showed him in a remote corner a cast iron tombstone, cheap but decently kept, on which were inscribed the name and age of the deceased and the date of her death, and below a four-lined verse, such as are commonly used on old-fashioned middle-class tombs. To Alyosha's amazement this tomb turned out to be Grigory's doing. He had put it up on the poor, crazy woman's grave at his own expense, after Fyodor Pavlovich, whom he had often pestered about the grave, had gone to Odessa, abandoning the grave and all his memories. Alyosha showed no particular emotion at the sight of his mother's grave. He only listened to Grigory's minute and solemn account of the erection of the tomb, he stood with bowed head and walked away without uttering a word. It was perhaps a year before he visited the cemetery again. But this little episode was not without an influence upon Fyodor Pavlovich, and a very original one. He suddenly took a thousand rubles to our monastery to pay for requiems for the soul of his wife, but not for the second, Alyosha's mother, the, crazy woman, but for the first, Adelaida Ivanovna, who used to thrash him. In the evening of the same day he got drunk and abused the monks to Alyosha. He himself was far from being religious, he had probably never put a penny candle before the image of a saint. Strange impulses of sudden feeling and sudden thought are common in such types. I have mentioned already that he looked bloated. His countenance at this time bore traces of something that testified unmistakably to the life he had led. Besides the long fleshy bags under his little, always insolent, suspicious, and ironical eyes, Besides the multitude of deep wrinkles in his little fat face, the Adam's apple hung below his sharp chin like a great, fleshy goiter, which gave him a peculiar, repulsive, sensual appearance, add to that a long rapacious mouth with full lips, between which could be seen little stumps of black decayed teeth. He slobbered every time he began to speak. He was fond indeed of making fun of his own face, though, I believe, he was well satisfied with it. He used particularly to point to his nose, which was not very large, 
but very delicate and conspicuously aquiline. A regular Roman nose, he used to say, with my goiter I've quite the countenance of an ancient Roman patrician of the decadent period. He seemed proud of it. Not long after visiting his mother's grave Alyosha suddenly announced that he wanted to enter the monastery, and that the monks were willing to receive him as a novice. He explained that this was his strong desire, and that he was solemnly asking his consent as his father. The old man knew that the elder Zosima, who was living in the monastery hermitage, had made a special impression upon his gentle boy. That is the most honest monk among them, of course, he observed, after listening in thoughtful silence to Alyosha, and seeming scarcely surprised at his request. Hum. So that's where you want to be, my gentle boy. He was half drunk, and suddenly he grinned his slow half drunken grin, which was not without a certain cunning and tipsy slyness. Hum. I had a presentiment that you would end in something like this. Would you believe it? You were making straight for it. Well, to be sure you have your own two thousand. That's a dowry for you. And I'll never desert you, my angel. And I'll pay what's wanted for you there, if they ask for it. But, of course, if they don't ask, why should we worry them? What do you say? You know, you spend money like a canary, two grains a week. Hum. Do you know that near one monastery there's a place outside the town where every baby knows there are none but the monks' wives living, as they are called? Thirty women, I believe. I have been there myself. You know, it's interesting in its own way, of course, as a variety. The worst of it is it's awfully Russian. There are no French women there. Of course they could get them fast enough, they have plenty of money. If they get to hear of it they'll come along. Well, there's nothing of that sort here, no monks' wives, and two hundred monks. They're honest. They keep the fasts. I admit it. Hum. So you want to be a monk? And do you know I'm sorry to lose you, Alyosha, would you believe it, I've really grown fond of you? Well, it's a good opportunity. You'll pray for us sinners, we have sinned too much here. I've always been thinking who would pray for me, and whether there's anyone in the world to do it. My dear boy, I'm awfully stupid about that. You wouldn't believe it. Awfully. You see, however stupid I am about it, I keep thinking, I keep thinking, from time to time, of course, not all the while. It's impossible, I think, for the devils to forget to drag me down to hell with their hooks when I die. Then I wonder, hooks? Where would they get them? What of? Iron hooks? Where do they forge them? Have they a foundry there of some sort? The monks in the monastery probably believe that there's a ceiling in hell, for instance. Now I'm ready to believe in hell, but without a ceiling. It makes it more refined, more enlightened, more Lutheran that is. And, after all, what does it matter whether it has a ceiling or hasn't? But, do you know, there's a damnable question involved in it? If there's no ceiling there can be no hooks, and if there are no hooks it all breaks down, which is unlikely again, for then there would be none to drag me down to hell, and if they don't drag me down what justice is there in the world? I L Fodrate less inventor, those hooks, on purpose for me alone, for, if you only knew, Alyosha, what a blackguard I am. But there are no hooks there, said Alyosha, looking gently and seriously at his father. Yes, yes, only the shadows of hooks, I know, I know. That's how a Frenchman described hell, J. V. U. l'ombre d'un cocker que avec l'ombre d'une brosse fratate l'ombre d'une carrosse. How do you know there are no hooks, darling? When you've lived with the monks you'll sing a different tune. But go and get at the truth there, and then come and tell me. Anyway it's easier going to the other world if one knows what there is there. Besides, it will be more seemly for you with the monks than here with me, with a drunken old man and young harlots, though you're like an angel, nothing touches you. And I dare say nothing will touch you there. That's why I let you go, because I hope for that. You've got all your wits about you. You will burn and you will burn out, you will be healed and come back again. And I will wait for you. 
I feel that you're the only creature in the world who has not condemned me. My dear boy, I feel it, you know. I can't help feeling it. And he even began blubbering. He was sentimental. He was wicked and sentimental. Chapter 5 Elders Some of my readers may imagine that my young man was a sickly, ecstatic, poorly developed creature, a pale, consumptive dreamer. On the contrary, Alyosha was at this time a well-grown, red-cheeked, clear-eyed lad of nineteen, radiant with health. He was very handsome, too, graceful, moderately tall, with hair of a dark brown, with a regular, rather long, oval-shaped face, and wide-set dark grey, shining eyes, he was very thoughtful, and apparently very serene. I shall be told, perhaps, that red cheeks are not incompatible with fanaticism and mysticism, but I fancy that Alyosha was more of a realist than any one. Oh! No doubt, in the monastery he fully believed in miracles, but, to my thinking, miracles are never a stumbling block to the realist. It is not miracles that dispose realists to belief. The genuine realist, if he is an unbeliever, will always find strength and ability to disbelieve in the miraculous, and if he is confronted with a miracle as an irrefutable fact he would rather disbelieve his own senses than admit the fact. Even if he admits it, he admits it as a fact of nature till then unrecognized by him. Faith does not, in the realist, spring from the miracle but the miracle from faith. If the realist once believes, then he is bound by his very realism to admit the miraculous also. The Apostle Thomas said that he would not believe till he saw, but when he did see he said, My Lord and my God. Was it the miracle forced him to believe? Most likely not, but he believed solely because he desired to believe and possibly he fully believed in his secret heart even when he said, I do not believe till I see. I shall be told, perhaps, that Alyosha was stupid, undeveloped, had not finished his studies, and so on. That he did not finish his studies is true, but to say that he was stupid or dull would be a great injustice. I'll simply repeat what I have said above. He entered upon this path only because, at that time, it alone struck his imagination and presented itself to him as offering an ideal means of escape for his soul from darkness to light. Add to that that he was to some extent a youth of our last epoch, that is, honest in nature, desiring the truth, seeking for it and believing in it, and seeking to serve it at once with all the strength of his soul, seeking for immediate action, and ready to sacrifice everything, life itself, for it. Though these young men unhappily fail to understand that the sacrifice of life is, in many cases, the easiest of all sacrifices, and that to sacrifice, for instance, five or six years of their seething youth to hard and tedious study, if only to multiply tenfold their powers of serving the truth and the cause they have set before them as their goal, such a sacrifice is utterly beyond the strength of many of them. The path Alyosha chose was a path going in the opposite direction, but he chose it with the same thirst for swift achievement. As soon as he reflected seriously he was convinced of the existence of God and immortality, and at once he instinctively said to himself, I want to live for immortality, and I will accept no compromise. In the same way, if he had decided that God and immortality did not exist, he would at once have become an atheist and a socialist. For socialism is not merely the labor question, it is before all things the atheistic question, the question of the form taken by atheism today, the question of the Tower of Babel built without God, not to mount to heaven from earth but to set up heaven on earth. Alyosha would have found it strange and impossible to go on living as before. It is written, Give all that thou hast to the poor and follow me, if thou wouldst be perfect. Alyosha said to himself, I can't give two rubles instead of all, and only go to mass instead of following him. Perhaps his memories of childhood brought back our monastery, to which his mother may have taken him to mass. Perhaps the slanting sunlight and the holy image to which his poor, crazy mother had held him up still acted upon his imagination. Brooding on these things he may have come to us perhaps only to see whether here he could sacrifice all or only two rubles, and in the monastery he met this elder. I must digress to explain what an elder is in Russian monasteries, and I am sorry that I do not feel very competent to do so. I will try, however, to give a superficial account of it in a few words. 
Authorities on the subject assert that the institution of elders is of recent date, not more than a hundred years old in our monasteries, though in the Orthodox East, especially in Sinai and Athos, it has existed over a thousand years. It is maintained that it existed in ancient times in Russia also, but through the calamities which overtook Russia, the Tartars, civil war, the interruption of relations with the East after the destruction of Constantinople, this institution fell into oblivion. It was revived among us towards the end of last century by one of the great ascetics, as they called him, Pacey Velichkovsky, and his disciples. But to this day it exists in few monasteries only, and has sometimes been almost persecuted as an innovation in Russia. It flourished especially in the celebrated Kozelsky Optin Monastery. When and how it was introduced into our monastery I cannot say. There had already been three such elders and Zosima was the last of them. But he was almost dying of weakness and disease, and they had no one to take his place. The question for our monastery was an important one, for it had not been distinguished by anything in particular till then, they had neither relics of saints, nor wonder-working icons, nor glorious traditions, nor historical exploits. It had flourished and been glorious all over Russia through its elders, to see and hear whom pilgrims had flocked for thousands of miles from all parts. What was such an elder? An elder was one who took your soul, your will, into his soul and his will. When you choose an elder, you renounce your own will and yield it to him in complete submission, complete self-abnegation. This novitiate, this terrible school of abnegation, is undertaken voluntarily, in the hope of self-conquest, of self-mastery, in order, after a life of obedience, to attain perfect freedom, that is, from self, to escape the lot of those who have lived their whole life without finding their true selves in themselves. This institution of elders is not founded on theory, but was established in the East from the practice of a thousand years. The obligations due to an elder are not the ordinary obedience which has always existed in our Russian monasteries. The obligation involves confession to the elder by all who have submitted themselves to him, and to the indissoluble bond between him and them. The story is told, for instance, that in the early days of Christianity one such novice, failing to fulfill some command laid upon him by his elder, left his monastery in Syria and went to Egypt. There, after great exploits, he was found worthy at last to suffer torture and a martyr's death for the faith. When the church, regarding him as a saint, was burying him, suddenly, at the deacon's exhortation, depart all ye unbaptized, the coffin containing the martyr's body left its place and was cast forth from the church, and this took place three times. And only at last they learnt that this holy man had broken his vow of obedience and left his elder, and, therefore, could not be forgiven without the elder's absolution in spite of his great deeds. Only after this could the funeral take place. This, of course, is only an old legend. But here is a recent instance. A monk was suddenly commanded by his elder to quit Athos, which he loved as a sacred place and a haven of refuge, and to go first to Jerusalem to do homage to the holy places and then to go to the north to Siberia, there is the place for thee and not here. The monk, overwhelmed with sorrow, went to the ecumenical patriarch at Constantinople and besought him to release him from his obedience. But the patriarch replied that not only was he unable to release him, but there was not and could not be on earth a power which could release him except the elder who had himself laid that duty upon him. In this way the elders are endowed in certain cases with unbounded and inexplicable authority. That is why in many of our monasteries the institution was at first resisted almost to persecution. Meantime the elders immediately began to be highly esteemed among the people. Masses of the ignorant people as well as men of distinction flocked, for instance, to the elders of our monastery to confess their doubts, their sins, and their sufferings, and ask for counsel and admonition. Seeing this, the opponents of the elders declared that the sacrament of confession was being arbitrarily and frivolously degraded, though the continual opening of the heart to the elder by the monk or the layman had nothing of the character of the sacrament. In the end, however, the institution of elders has been retained and is becoming established in Russian monasteries. It is true, perhaps, 
that this instrument which had stood the test of a thousand years for the moral regeneration of a man from slavery to freedom and to moral perfectibility may be a two-edged weapon and it may lead some not to humility and complete self-control but to the most satanic pride, that is, to bondage and not to freedom. The elder Zosima was sixty-five. He came of a family of landowners, had been in the army in early youth, and served in the Caucasus as an officer. He had, no doubt, impressed Alyosha by some peculiar quality of his soul. Alyosha lived in the cell of the elder, who was very fond of him and let him wait upon him. It must be noted that Alyosha was bound by no obligation and could go where he pleased and be absent for whole days. Though he wore the monastic dress it was voluntarily, not to be different from others. No doubt he liked to do so. Possibly his youthful imagination was deeply stirred by the power and fame of his elder. It was said that so many people had for years past come to confess their sins to Father Zosima and to entreat him for words of advice and healing, that he had acquired the keenest intuition and could tell from an unknown face what a newcomer wanted, and what was the suffering on his conscience. He sometimes astounded and almost alarmed his visitors by his knowledge of their secrets before they had spoken a word. Alyosha noticed that many, almost all, went into the elder for the first time with apprehension and uneasiness, but came out with bright and happy faces. Alyosha was particularly struck by the fact that Father Zosima was not at all stern. On the contrary, he was always almost gay. The monks used to say that he was more drawn to those who were more sinful, and the greater the sinner the more he loved him. There were, no doubt, up to the end of his life, among the monks some who hated and envied him, but they were few in number and they were silent, though among them were some of great dignity in the monastery, one, for instance, of the older monks distinguished for his strict keeping of fasts and vows of silence. But the majority were on Father Zosima's side and very many of them loved him with all their hearts, warmly and sincerely. Some were almost fanatically devoted to him, and declared, though not quite aloud, that he was a saint, that there could be no doubt of it, and, seeing that his end was near, they anticipated miracles and great glory to the monastery in the immediate future from his relics. Alyosha had unquestioning faith in the miraculous power of the elder, just as he had unquestioning faith in the story of the coffin that flew out of the church. He saw many who came with sick children or relatives and besought the elder to lay hands on them and to pray over them, return shortly after, some the next day, and, falling in tears at the elder's feet, thanked him for healing their sick. Whether they had really been healed or were simply better in the natural course of the disease was a question which did not exist for Alyosha, for he fully believed in the spiritual power of his teacher and rejoiced in his fame, in his glory, as though it were his own triumph. His heart throbbed, and he beamed, as it were, all over when the elder came out to the gates of the hermitage into the waiting crowd of pilgrims of the humbler class who had flocked from all parts of Russia on purpose to see the elder and obtain his blessing. They fell down before him, wept, kissed his feet, kissed the earth on which he stood, and wailed, while the women held up their children to him and brought him the sick, possessed with devils. The elder spoke to them, read a brief prayer over them, blessed them, and dismissed them. Of late he had become so weak through attacks of illness that he was sometimes unable to leave his cell, and the pilgrims waited for him to come out for several days. Alyosha did not wonder why they loved him so, why they fell down before him and wept with emotion merely at seeing his face. Oh! He understood that for the humble soul of the Russian peasant, worn out by grief and toil, and still more by the everlasting injustice and everlasting sin, his own and the world's, it was the greatest need and comfort to find someone or something holy to fall down before and worship. Among us there is sin, injustice, and temptation, but yet, somewhere on earth there is someone holy and exalted. He has the truth, he knows the truth, so it is not dead upon the earth, so it will come one day to us, too, and rule over all the earth according to the promise. Alyosha knew that this was just how the people felt and even reasoned. He understood it, but that the elder Zosima was this saint and custodian of God's truth, of that he had no more doubt than the weeping peasants and the sick women who held out their children to the elder. The conviction that after his death the elder would bring extraordinary glory to the monastery was even stronger in Alyosha than in any one there, and, of late, a kind of deep flame of inner ecstasy burnt more and more strongly in his heart. 
he was not at all troubled at this elder's standing as a solitary example before him, no matter. He is holy. He carries in his heart the secret of renewal for all, that power which will, at last, establish truth on the earth, and all men will be holy and love one another, and there will be no more rich nor poor, no exalted nor humbled, but all will be as the children of God, and the true kingdom of Christ will come. That was the dream in Alyosha's heart. The arrival of his two brothers, whom he had not known till then, seemed to make a great impression on Alyosha. He more quickly made friends with his half-brother Dmitri, though he arrived later, than with his own brother Ivan. He was extremely interested in his brother Ivan, but when the latter had been two months in the town, though they had met fairly often, they were still not intimate. Alyosha was naturally silent, and he seemed to be expecting something, ashamed about something, while his brother Ivan, though Alyosha noticed at first that he looked long and curiously at him, seemed soon to have left off thinking of him. Alyosha noticed it with some embarrassment. He ascribed his brother's indifference at first to the disparity of their age and education. But he also wondered whether the absence of curiosity and sympathy in Ivan might be due to some other cause entirely unknown to him. He kept fancying that Ivan was absorbed in something, something inward and important, that he was striving toward some goal, perhaps very hard to attain, and that that was why he had no thought for him. Alyosha wondered, too, whether there was not some contempt on the part of the learned atheist for him, a foolish novice. He knew for certain that his brother was an atheist. He could not take offense at this contempt, if it existed, yet, with an uneasy embarrassment which he did not himself understand, he waited for his brother to come nearer to him. Dmitri used to speak of Ivan with the deepest respect and with a peculiar earnestness. From him Alyosha learnt all the details of the important affair which had of late formed such a close and remarkable bond between the two elder brothers. Dmitri's enthusiastic references to Ivan were the more striking in Alyosha's eyes since Dmitri was, compared with Ivan, almost uneducated, and the two brothers were such a contrast in personality and character that it would be difficult to find two men more unlike. It was at this time that the meeting, or, rather gathering of the members of this inharmonious family took place in the cell of the elder who had such an extraordinary influence on Alyosha. The pretext for this gathering was a false one. It was at this time that the discord between Dmitri and his father seemed at its acutest stage and their relations had become insufferably strained. Fyodor Pavlovich seems to have been the first to suggest, apparently in joke, that they should all meet in Father Zosima's cell, and that, without appealing to his direct intervention, they might more decently come to an understanding under the conciliating influence of the elder's presence. Dmitri, who had never seen the elder, naturally supposed that his father was trying to intimidate him, but, as he secretly blamed himself for his outbursts of temper with his father on several recent occasions, he accepted the challenge. It must be noted that he was not, like Ivan, staying with his father, but living apart at the other end of the town. It happened that Pyotr Alexandrovich Myasov, who was staying in the district at the time, caught eagerly at the idea. A liberal of the forties and fifties, a free thinker, an atheist, he may have been led on by boredom or the hope of frivolous diversion. He was suddenly seized with the desire to see the monastery and the holy man. As his lawsuit with the monastery still dragged on, he made it the pretext for seeing the superior, in order to attempt to settle it amicably. A visitor coming with such laudable intentions might be received with more attention and consideration than if he came from simple curiosity. Influences from within the monastery were brought to bear on the elder, who of late had scarcely left his cell, and had been forced by illness to deny even his ordinary visitors. In the end he consented to see them, and the day was fixed. Who has made me a judge over them, was all he said, smilingly, to Alyosha. Alyosha was much perturbed when he heard of the proposed visit. Of all the wrangling, quarrelsome party, Dmitri was the only one who could regard the interview seriously. All the others would come from frivolous motives, perhaps insulting to the elder. Alyosha was well aware of that. Ivan and Myasov would come from curiosity, perhaps of the coarsest kind, while his father might be contemplating some piece of buffoonery. Though he said nothing, Alyosha thoroughly understood his father. The boy, I repeat, was far from being so simple as everyone thought him. 
he awaited the day with a heavy heart. No doubt he was always pondering in his mind how the family discord could be ended. But his chief anxiety concerned the elder. He trembled for him, for his glory, and dreaded any affront to him, especially the refined, courteous irony of Myasov and the supercilious half-utterances of the highly educated Ivan. He even wanted to venture on warning the elder, telling him something about them, but, on second thoughts, said nothing. He only sent word the day before, through a friend, to his brother Dmitri, that he loved him and expected him to keep his promise. Dmitri wondered, for he could not remember what he had promised, but he answered by letter that he would do his utmost not to let himself be provoked by vileness, but that, although he had a deep respect for the elder and for his brother Ivan, he was convinced that the meeting was either a trap for him or an unworthy farce. Nevertheless I would rather bite out my tongue than be lacking in respect to the sainted man whom you reverence so highly, he wrote in conclusion. Alyosha was not greatly cheered by the letter. Book 2. An Unfortunate Gathering. Chapter 1. They Arrive at the Monastery. It was a warm, bright day at the end of August. The interview with the elder had been fixed for half-past eleven, immediately after late mass. Our visitors did not take part in the service, but arrived just as it was over. First an elegant open carriage, drawn by two valuable horses, drove up with Myasov and a distant relative of his, a young man of twenty, called Pyotr Fomich Kalganov. This young man was preparing to enter the university. Myasov, with whom he was staying for the time, was trying to persuade him to go abroad to the University of Zurich or Jena. The young man was still undecided. He was thoughtful and absent-minded. He was nice-looking, strongly built, and rather tall. There was a strange fixity in his gaze at times. Like all very absent-minded people he would sometimes stare at a person without seeing him. He was silent and rather awkward, but sometimes, when he was alone with any one, he became talkative and effusive, and would laugh at anything or nothing. But his animation vanished as quickly as it appeared. He was always well and even elaborately dressed, he had already some independent fortune and expectations of much more. He was a friend of Alyosha's. In an ancient, jolting, but roomy, hired carriage, with a pair of old pinkish-gray horses, a long way behind Myasov's carriage, came Fyodor Pavlovich, with his son Ivan. Dmitri was late, though he had been informed of the time the evening before. The visitors left their carriage at the hotel, outside the precincts, and went to the gates of the monastery on foot. Except Fyodor Pavlovich, none of the party had ever seen the monastery, and Myasov had probably not even been to church for thirty years. He looked about him with curiosity, together with assumed ease. But, except the church and the domestic buildings, though these two were ordinary enough, he found nothing of interest in the interior of the monastery. The last of the worshippers were coming out of the church, bareheaded and crossing themselves. Among the humbler people were a few of higher rank, two or three ladies and a very old general. They were all staying at the hotel. Our visitors were at once surrounded by beggars, but none of them gave them anything, except young Kalganov, who took a ten-kopeck piece out of his purse, and, nervous and embarrassed, God knows why, hurriedly gave it to an old woman, saying, divide it equally. None of his companions made any remark upon it, so that he had no reason to be embarrassed, but, perceiving this, he was even more overcome. It was strange that their arrival did not seem expected, and that they were not received with special honor, though one of them had recently made a donation of a thousand rubles, while another was a very wealthy and highly cultured landowner, upon whom all in the monastery were in a sense dependent, as a decision of the lawsuit might at any moment put their fishing rights in his hands. Yet no official personage met them. Myasov looked absent-mindedly at the tombstones round the church, and was on the point of saying that the dead buried here must have paid a pretty penny for the right of lying in this holy place, but refrained. His liberal irony was rapidly changing almost into anger. Who the devil is there to ask in this imbecile place? We must find out, for time is passing, he observed suddenly, as though speaking to himself. All at once there came up a bald-headed, elderly man with ingratiating little eyes, wearing a full, summer overcoat. Lifting his hat, he introduced himself with a honeyed lisp as Maximov, a landowner of Tula. 
He at once entered into our visitor's difficulty. Father Zosima lives in the hermitage, apart, 400 paces from the monastery, the other side of the copse. I know it's the other side of the copse, observed Fyodor Pavlovich, but we don't remember the way. It is a long time since we've been here. This way, by this gate, and straight across the copse, the copse. Come with me, won't you? I'll show you. I have to go. I am going myself. This way, this way. They came out of the gate and turned towards the copse. Maximov, a man of sixty, ran rather than walked, turning sideways to stare at them all, with an incredible degree of nervous curiosity. His eyes looked starting out of his head. You see, we have come to the elder upon business of our own, observed Myasov severely. That personage has granted us an audience, so to speak, and so, though we thank you for showing us the way, we cannot ask you to accompany us. I've been there. I've been already, un chevalier parfait, and Maximov snapped his fingers in the air. Who is a chevalier? asked Myasov. The elder, the splendid elder, the elder. The honor and glory of the monastery, Zosima. Such an elder. But his incoherent talk was cut short by a very pale, wan looking monk of medium height, wearing a monk's cap, who overtook them. Fyodor Pavlovich and Myasov stopped. The monk, with an extremely courteous, profound bow, announced The Father Superior invites all of you gentlemen to dine with him after your visit to the Hermitage. At one o'clock, not later. And you also, he added, addressing Maximov. That I certainly will, without fail, cried Fyodor Pavlovich, hugely delighted at the invitation. And, believe me, we've all given our word to behave properly here. And you, Pyotr Alexandrovich, will you go, too? Yes, of course. What have I come for but to study all the customs here? The only obstacle to me is your company. Yes, Dmitri Fyodorovich is non existent as yet. It would be a capital thing if he didn't turn up. Do you suppose I like all this business, and in your company, too? So we will come to dinner. Thank the Father Superior, he said to the monk. No, it is my duty now to conduct you to the elder, answered the monk. If so I'll go straight to the Father Superior, to the Father Superior, babbled Maximov. The Father Superior is engaged just now. But as you please, the monk hesitated. Impertinent old man. Myasov observed aloud, while Maximov ran back to the monastery. He's like von Sohn, Fyodor Pavlovich said suddenly. Is that all you can think of? In what way is he like von Sohn? Have you ever seen von Sohn? I've seen his portrait. It's not the features, but something indefinable. He's a second von Sohn. I can always tell from the physiognomy. Ah, I dare say you are a connoisseur in that. But, look here, Fyodor Pavlovich, you said just now that we had given our word to behave properly. Remember it. I advise you to control yourself. But, if you begin to play the fool I don't intend to be associated with you here. You see what a man he is, he turned to the monk, I'm afraid to go among decent people with him. A fine smile, not without a certain slyness, came on to the pale, bloodless lips of the monk, but he made no reply, and was evidently silent from a sense of his own dignity. Myasov frowned more than ever. Oh, devil take them all. An outer show elaborated through centuries, and nothing but charlatanism and nonsense underneath, flashed through Myasov's mind. Here's the hermitage. We've arrived, cried Fyodor Pavlovich. The gates are shut. And he repeatedly made the sign of the cross to the saints painted above and on the sides of the gates. When you go to Rome you must do as the Romans do. Here in this hermitage there are twenty-five saints being saved. They look at one another, and eat cabbages. And not one woman goes in at this gate. That's what is remarkable. And that really is so. But I did hear that the elder receives ladies, he remarked suddenly to the monk. Women of the people are here too now, lying in the portico they're waiting. But for ladies of higher rank two rooms have been built adjoining the portico, but outside the precincts, you can see the windows, 
and the elder goes out to them by an inner passage when he is well enough. They are always outside the precincts. There is a Harkov lady, Madame Holikov, waiting there now with her sick daughter. Probably he has promised to come out to her, though of late he has been so weak that he has hardly shown himself even to the people. So then there are loopholes, after all, to creep out of the hermitage to the ladies. Don't suppose, Holy Father, that I mean any harm. But do you know that at Athos not only the visits of women are not allowed, but no creature of the female sex, no hens, nor turkey hens, nor cows. Fyodor Pavlovich, I warn you I shall go back and leave you here. They'll turn you out when I'm gone. But I'm not interfering with you, Pyotr Alexandrovich. Look, he cried suddenly, stepping within the precincts, what a veil of roses they live in. Though there were no roses now, there were numbers of rare and beautiful autumn flowers growing wherever there was space for them, and evidently tended by a skillful hand, there were flower beds round the church, and between the tombs, and the one-storied wooden house where the elder lived was also surrounded with flowers. And was it like this in the time of the last elder, Barsanify? He didn't care for such elegance. They say he used to jump up and thrash even ladies with a stick, observed Fyodor Pavlovich, as he went up the steps. The elder Varsonify did sometimes seem rather strange, but a great deal that's told is foolishness. He never thrashed anyone, answered the monk. Now, gentlemen, if you will wait a minute I will announce you. Fyodor Pavlovich, for the last time, your compact, do you hear? Behave properly or I will pay you out. Myasov had time to mutter again. I can't think why you are so agitated, Fyodor Pavlovich observed sarcastically. Are you uneasy about your sins? They say he can tell by one's eyes what one has come about. And what a lot you think of their opinion. You, a Parisian, and so advanced. I'm surprised at you. But Myasov had no time to reply to this sarcasm. They were asked to come in. He walked in, somewhat irritated. Now, I know myself, I am annoyed, I shall lose my temper and begin to quarrel, and lower myself and my ideas, he reflected. Chapter 2 The Old Buffoon They entered the room almost at the same moment that the elder came in from his bedroom. There were already in the cell, awaiting the elder, two monks of the hermitage, one the father librarian, and the other father Pacey, a very learned man, so they said, in delicate health, though not old. There was also a tall young man, who looked about two and twenty, standing in the corner throughout the interview. He had a broad, fresh face, and clever, observant, narrow brown eyes, and was wearing ordinary dress. He was a divinity student, living under the protection of the monastery. His expression was one of unquestioning, but self-respecting, reverence. Being in a subordinate and dependent position, and so not on an equality with the guests, he did not greet them with a bow. Father Zosima was accompanied by a novice, and by Alyosha. The two monks rose and greeted him with a very deep bow, touching the ground with their fingers, then kissed his hand. Blessing them, the elder replied with as deep a reverence to them, and asked their blessing. The whole ceremony was performed very seriously and with an appearance of feeling, not like an everyday rite. But Myasov fancied that it was all done with intentional impressiveness. He stood in front of the other visitors. He ought, he had reflected upon it the evening before, from simple politeness, since it was the custom here, to have gone up to receive the elder's blessing, even if he did not kiss his hand. But when he saw all this bowing and kissing on the part of the monks he instantly changed his mind. With dignified gravity he made a rather deep, conventional bow, and moved away to a chair. Fyodor Pavlovich did the same, mimicking Myasov like an ape. Ivan bowed with great dignity and courtesy, but he too kept his hands at his sides, while Kalganov was so confused that he did not bow at all. The elder let fall the hand raised to bless them, and bowing to them again, asked them all to sit down. The blood rushed to Alyosha's cheeks. He was ashamed. His forebodings were coming true. Father Zosima sat down on a very old-fashioned mahogany sofa, covered with leather, and made his visitors sit down in a row along the opposite wall on four mahogany chairs, covered with shabby black leather. 
The monk sat, one at the door and the other at the window. The divinity student, the novice, and Alyosha remained standing. The cell was not very large and had a faded look. It contained nothing but the most necessary furniture, of course and poor quality. There were two pots of flowers in the window, and a number of holy pictures in the corner. Before one huge ancient icon of the Virgin a lamp was burning. Near it were two other holy pictures in shining settings, and, next them, carved cherubims, china eggs, a Catholic cross of ivory, with a Mata Dolorosa embracing it, and several foreign engravings from the great Italian artists of past centuries. Next to these costly and artistic engravings were several of the roughest Russian prints of saints and martyrs, such as are sold for a few farthings at all the fairs. On the other walls were portraits of Russian bishops, past and present. Myasov took a cursory glance at all these conventional surroundings and bent an intent look upon the elder. He had a high opinion of his own insight, a weakness excusable in him as he was fifty, an age at which a clever man of the world of established position can hardly help taking himself rather seriously. At the first moment he did not like Zosima. There was, indeed, something in the elder's face which many people besides Myasov might not have liked. He was a short, bent, little man, with very weak legs, and though he was only sixty-five, he looked at least ten years older. His face was very thin and covered with a network of fine wrinkles, particularly numerous about his eyes, which were small, light-colored, quick, and shining like two bright points. He had a sprinkling of gray hair about his temples. His pointed beard was small and scanty, and his lips, which smiled frequently, were as thin as two threads. His nose was not long, but sharp, like a bird's beak. To all appearances a malicious soul, full of petty pride, thought Myasov. He felt altogether dissatisfied with his position. A cheap little clock on the wall struck twelve hurriedly, and served to begin the conversation. Precisely to our time, cried Fyodor Pavlovich, but no sign of my son, Dmitri. I apologize for him, sacred elder. Alyosha shuddered all over at, sacred elder. I am always punctual myself, minute for minute, remembering that punctuality is the courtesy of kings. But you are not a king, anyway, Myasov muttered, losing his self-restraint at once. Yes, that's true. I'm not a king, and, would you believe it, Pyotr Alexandrovich, I was aware of that myself. But, there. I always say the wrong thing. Your reverence, he cried, with sudden pathos, you behold before you a buffoon in earnest. I introduce myself as such. It's an old habit, alas. And if I sometimes talk nonsense out of place it's with an object, with the object of amusing people and making myself agreeable. One must be agreeable, mustn't one? I was seven years ago in a little town where I had business, and I made friends with some merchants there. We went to the captain of police because we had to see him about something, and to ask him to dine with us. He was a tall, fat, fair, sulky man, the most dangerous type in such cases. It's their liver. I went straight up to him, and with the ease of a man of the world, you know, Mr. Ispravnik, said I, B. R. Napravnik. What do you mean by Napravnik, said he. I saw, at the first half second, that it had missed fire. He stood there so glum. I wanted to make a joke, said I, for the general diversion, as Mr. Napravnik is our well-known Russian orchestra conductor and what we need for the harmony of our undertaking is someone of that sort. And I explained my comparison very reasonably, didn't I? Excuse me, said he, I am an Ispravnik, and I do not allow puns to be made on my calling. He turned and walked away. I followed him, shouting, yes, yes, you are an Ispravnik, not an Apravnik. No, he said, since you called me an Apravnik I am one. And would you believe it, it ruined our business. And I'm always like that, always like that. Always injuring myself with my politeness. Once, many years ago, I said to an influential person, your wife is a ticklish lady, in an honorable sense, of the moral qualities, so to speak. But he asked me, why, have you tickled her? I thought I'd be polite, so I couldn't help saying, yes, 
and he gave me a fine tickling on the spot. Only that happened long ago, so I'm not ashamed to tell the story. I'm always injuring myself like that. You're doing it now, muttered Mayasov, with disgust. Father Zosima scrutinized them both in silence. Am I? Would you believe it, I was aware of that, too, Pyotr Alexandrovich, and let me tell you, indeed, I foresaw I should as soon as I began to speak. And do you know I foresaw, too, that you'd be the first to remark on it? The minute I see my joke isn't coming off, your reverence, both my cheeks feel as though they were drawn down to the lower jaw and there is almost a spasm in them. That's been so since I was young, when I had to make jokes for my living in noblemen's families. I am an inveterate buffoon, and have been from birth up, your reverence, it's as though it were a craze in me. I dare say it's a devil within me. But only a little one. A more serious one would have chosen another lodging. But not your soul, Pyotr Alexandrovich, you're not a lodging worth having either. But I do believe, I believe in God, though I have had doubts of late. But now I sit and await words of wisdom. I'm like the philosopher, Diderot, your reverence. Did you ever hear, Most Holy Father, how Diderot went to see the Metropolitan Platon, in the time of the Empress Catherine? He went in and said straight out, There is no God. To which the great bishop lifted up his finger and answered, The fool hath said in his heart there is no God. And he fell down at his feet on the spot. I believe, he cried, and will be christened. And so he was. Princess Dashkov was his godmother, and Potyomkin his godfather. Fyodor Pavlovich, this is unbearable. You know you're telling lies and that that stupid anecdote isn't true. Why are you playing the fool? cried Myasov in a shaking voice. I suspected all my life that it wasn't true, Fyodor Pavlovich cried with conviction. But I'll tell you the whole truth, gentlemen. Great Elder. Forgive me, the last thing about Diderot's christening I made up just now. I never thought of it before. I made it up to add piquancy. I play the fool, Pyotr Alexandrovich, to make myself agreeable. Though I really don't know myself, sometimes, what I do it for. And as for Diderot, I heard as far as the fool hath said in his heart twenty times from the gentry about here when I was young. I heard your aunt, Pyotr Alexandrovich, tell the story. They all believe to this day that the infidel Diderot came to dispute about God with the Metropolitan Platon. Myasov got up, forgetting himself in his impatience. He was furious, and conscious of being ridiculous. What was taking place in the cell was really incredible. For forty or fifty years past, from the times of former elders, no visitors had entered that cell without feelings of the profoundest veneration. Almost everyone admitted to the cell felt that a great favor was being shown him. Many remained kneeling during the whole visit. Of those visitors, many had been men of high rank and learning, some even free thinkers, attracted by curiosity, but all without exception had shown the profoundest reverence and delicacy, for here there was no question of money, but only, on the one side love and kindness, and on the other penitence and eager desire to decide some spiritual problem or crisis. So that such buffoonery amazed and bewildered the spectators, or at least some of them. The monks, with unchanged countenances, waited, with earnest attention, to hear what the elder would say, but seemed on the point of standing up, like Myasov. Alyosha stood, with hanging head, on the verge of tears. What seemed to him strangest of all was that his brother Ivan, on whom alone he had rested his hopes, and who alone had such influence on his father that he could have stopped him, sat now quite unmoved, with downcast eyes, apparently waiting with interest to see how it would end, as though he had nothing to do with it. Alyosha did not dare to look at Rakitin, the divinity student, whom he knew almost intimately. He alone in the monastery knew Rakitin's thoughts. Forgive me, began Myasov, addressing Father Zosima, for perhaps I seem to be taking part in this shameful foolery. I made a mistake in believing that even a man like Fyodor Pavlovich would understand what was due on a visit to so honored a personage. I did not suppose I should have to apologize simply for having come with him. Pyotr Alexandrovich could say no more, and was about to leave the room, overwhelmed with confusion. Don't distress yourself, I beg. 
The elder got on to his feeble legs, and taking Pyotr Alexandrovich by both hands, made him sit down again. I beg you not to disturb yourself. I particularly beg you to be my guest. And with a bow he went back and sat down again on his little sofa. Great elder, speak. Do I annoy you by my vivacity? Fyodor Pavlovich cried suddenly, clutching the arms of his chair in both hands, as though ready to leap up from it if the answer were unfavorable. I earnestly beg you, too, not to disturb yourself and not to be uneasy, the elder said impressively. Do not trouble. Make yourself quite at home. And, above all, do not be so ashamed of yourself, for that is at the root of it all. Quite at home. To be my natural self. Oh, that is much too much, but I accept it with grateful joy. Do you know, blessed father, you'd better not invite me to be my natural self. Don't risk it. I will not go so far as that myself. I warn you for your own sake. Well, the rest is still plunged in the mists of uncertainty, though there are people who'd be pleased to describe me for you. I mean that for you, Pyotr Alexandrovich. But as for you, holy being, let me tell you, I am brimming over with ecstasy. He got up, and throwing up his hands, declaimed, Blessed be the womb that bare thee, and the paps that gave thee suck, the paps especially. When you said just now, don't be so ashamed of yourself, for that is at the root of it all, you pierced right through me by that remark, and read me to the core. Indeed, I always feel when I meet people that I am lower than all, and that they all take me for a buffoon. So I say, let me really play the buffoon. I am not afraid of your opinion, for you are every one of you worse than I am. That is why I am a buffoon. It is from shame, great elder, from shame, it's simply oversensitiveness that makes me rowdy. If I had only been sure that everyone would accept me as the kindest and wisest of men, oh, Lord, what a good man I should have been then. Teacher, he fell suddenly on his knees, what must I do to gain eternal life? It was difficult even now to decide whether he was joking or really moved. Father Zosima, lifting his eyes, looked at him, and said with a smile. You have known for a long time what you must do. You have sense enough, don't give way to drunkenness and incontinence of speech, don't give way to sensual lust, and, above all, to the love of money. And close your taverns. If you can't close all, at least two or three. And, above all, don't lie. You mean about Diderot? No, not about Diderot. Above all, don't lie to yourself. The man who lies to himself and listens to his own lie comes to such a pass that he cannot distinguish the truth within him, or around him, and so loses all respect for himself and for others. And having no respect he ceases to love, and in order to occupy and distract himself without love he gives way to passions and coarse pleasures, and sinks to bestiality in his vices, all from continual lying to other men and to himself. The man who lies to himself can be more easily offended than any one. You know it is sometimes very pleasant to take offense, isn't it? A man may know that nobody has insulted him, but that he has invented the insult for himself, has lied and exaggerated to make it picturesque, has caught at a word and made a mountain out of a molehill, he knows that himself, yet he will be the first to take offense, and will revel in his resentment till he feels great pleasure in it, and so pass to genuine vindictiveness. But get up, sit down, I beg you. All this, too, is deceitful posturing. Blessed man. Give me your hand to kiss. Fyodor Pavlovich skipped up, and imprinted a rapid kiss on the elder's thin hand. It is, it is pleasant to take offense. You said that so well, as I never heard it before. Yes, I have been all my life taking offense, to please myself, taking offense on aesthetic grounds, for it is not so much pleasant as distinguished sometimes to be insulted, that you had forgotten, great elder, it is distinguished. I shall make a note of that. But I have been lying, lying positively my whole life long, every day and hour of it. Of a truth, I am a lie, and the father of lies. Though I believe I am not the father of lies. I am getting mixed in my texts. Say, the son of lies, and that will be enough. Only, my angel. 
I may sometimes talk about Diderot. Diderot will do no harm, though sometimes a word will do harm. Great Elder, by the way, I was forgetting, though I had been meaning for the last two years to come here on purpose to ask and to find out something. Only do tell Pyotr Alexandrovich not to interrupt me. Here is my question, is it true, Great Father, that the story is told somewhere in the lives of the saints of a holy saint martyred for his faith who, when his head was cut off at last, stood up, picked up his head, and, courteously kissing it, walked a long way, carrying it in his hands. Is that true or not, honored father? No, it is untrue, said the elder. There is nothing of the kind in all the lives of the saints. What saint do you say the story is told of, asked the father librarian. I do not know what saint. I do not know, and can't tell. I was deceived. I was told the story. I had heard it, and do you know who told it? Pyotr Alexandrovich Myasov here, who was so angry just now about Diderot. He it was who told the story. I have never told it you, I never speak to you at all. It is true you did not tell me, but you told it when I was present. It was three years ago. I mentioned it because by that ridiculous story you shook my faith, Pyotr Alexandrovich. You knew nothing of it, but I went home with my faith shaken, and I have been getting more and more shaken ever since. Yes, Pyotr Alexandrovich, you were the cause of a great fall. That was not a Diderot. Fyodor Pavlovich got excited and pathetic, though it was perfectly clear to everyone by now that he was playing a part again. Yet Myasov was stung by his words. What nonsense, and it is all nonsense, he muttered. I may really have told it, some time or other, but not to you. I was told it myself. I heard it in Paris from a Frenchman. He told me it was read at our Mass from the Lives of the Saints, he was a very learned man who had made a special study of Russian statistics and had lived a long time in Russia. I have not read the Lives of the Saints myself, and I am not going to read them, all sorts of things are said at dinner, we were dining then. Yes, you were dining then, and so I lost my faith, said Fyodor Pavlovich, mimicking him. What do I care for your faith? Myasov was on the point of shouting, but he suddenly checked himself, and said with contempt, You defile everything you touch. The elder suddenly rose from his seat. Excuse me, gentlemen, for leaving you a few minutes, he said, addressing all his guests. I have visitors awaiting me who arrive before you. But don't you tell lies all the same, he added, turning to Fyodor Pavlovich with a good humored face. He went out of the cell. Alyosha and the novice flew to escort him down the steps. Alyosha was breathless, he was glad to get away, but he was glad, too, that the elder was good humored and not offended. Father Zosima was going towards the portico to bless the people waiting for him there. But Fyodor Pavlovich persisted in stopping him at the door of the cell. Blessed man, he cried, with feeling. Allow me to kiss your hand once more. Yes, with you I could still talk, I could still get on. Do you think I always lie and play the fool like this? Believe me, I have been acting like this all the time on purpose to try you. I have been testing you all the time to see whether I could get on with you. Is there room for my humility beside your pride? I am ready to give you a testimonial that one can get on with you. But now, I'll be quiet, I will keep quiet all the time. I'll sit in a chair and hold my tongue. Now it is for you to speak, Pyotr Alexandrovich. You are the principal person left now, for ten minutes. Chapter 3 Peasant Women Who Have Faith Near the wooden portico below, built onto the outer wall of the precinct, there was a crowd of about twenty peasant women. They had been told that the elder was at last coming out, and they had gathered together in anticipation. Two ladies, Madame Holikov and her daughter, had also come out into the portico to wait for the elder, but in a separate part of it set aside for women of rank. Madame Holikov was a wealthy lady, still young and attractive, and always dressed with taste. She was rather pale, and had lively black eyes. She was not more than thirty-three, and had been five years a widow. Her daughter, a girl of fourteen, was partially paralyzed. 
The poor child had not been able to walk for the last six months, and was wheeled about in a long reclining chair. She had a charming little face, rather thin from illness, but full of gaiety. There was a gleam of mischief in her big dark eyes with their long lashes. Her mother had been intending to take her abroad ever since the spring, but they had been detained all the summer by business connected with their estate. They had been staying a week in our town, where they had come more for purposes of business than devotion, but had visited Father Zosima once already, three days before. Though they knew that the elder scarcely saw any one, they had now suddenly turned up again, and urgently entreated the happiness of looking once again on the great healer. The mother was sitting on a chair by the side of her daughter's invalid carriage, and two paces from her stood an old monk, not one of our monastery, but a visitor from an obscure religious house in the far north. He too sought the elder's blessing, but Father Zosima, on entering the portico, went first straight to the peasants who were crowded at the foot of the three steps that led up into the portico. Father Zosima stood on the top step, put on his stole, and began blessing the women who thronged about him. One crazy woman was led up to him. As soon as she caught sight of the elder she began shrieking and writhing as though in the pains of childbirth. Laying the stole on her forehead, he read a short prayer over her, and she was at once soothed and quieted. I do not know how it may be now, but in my childhood I often happened to see and hear these possessed women in the villages and monasteries. They used to be brought to Mass, they would squeal and bark like a dog so that they were heard all over the church. But when the sacrament was carried in and they were led up to it, at once the possession ceased, and the sick women were always soothed for a time. I was greatly impressed and amazed at this as a child, but then I heard from country neighbors and from my town teachers that the whole illness was simulated to avoid work, and that it could always be cured by suitable severity, various anecdotes were told to confirm this. But later on I learned with astonishment from medical specialists that there is no pretense about it, that it is a terrible illness to which women are subject, specially prevalent among us in Russia, and that it is due to the hard lot of the peasant women. It is a disease, I was told, arising from exhausting toil too soon after hard, abnormal and unassisted labor in childbirth, and from the hopeless misery, from beatings, and so on, which some women were not able to endure like others. The strange and instant healing of the frantic and struggling woman as soon as she was led up to the holy sacrament, which had been explained to me as due to malingering in the trickery of the clericals, arose probably in the most natural manner. Both the women who supported her and the invalid herself fully believed as a truth beyond question that the evil spirit in possession of her could not hold out if the sick woman were brought to the sacrament and made to bow down before it. And so, with a nervous and psychically deranged woman, a sort of convulsion of the whole organism always took place, and was bound to take place, at the moment of bowing down to the sacrament, aroused by the expectation of the miracle of healing and the implicit belief that it would come to pass, and it did come to pass, though only for a moment. It was exactly the same now as soon as the elder touched the sick woman with the stole. Many of the women in the crowd were moved to tears of ecstasy by the effect of the moment, some strove to kiss the hem of his garment, others cried out in sing-song voices. He blessed them all and talked with some of them. The possessed woman he knew already. She came from a village only six versts from the monastery, and had been brought to him before. But here is one from afar. He pointed to a woman by no means old but very thin and wasted, with a face not merely sunburned but almost blackened by exposure. She was kneeling and gazing with a fixed stare at the elder, there was something almost frenzied in her eyes. From afar off, father, from afar off. From two hundred miles from here. From afar off, father, from afar off, the woman began in a sing-song voice as though she were chanting a dirge, swaying her head from side to side with her cheek resting in her hand. There is silent and long-suffering sorrow to be met with among the peasantry. It withdraws into itself and is still. But there is a grief that breaks out, and from that minute it bursts into tears and finds vent in wailing. This is particularly common with women. But it is no lighter a grief than the silent. Lamentations comfort only by lacerating the heart still more. Such grief does not desire consolation. It feeds on the sense of its hopelessness. Lamentations spring only from the constant craving to reopen the wound. 
You are of the tradesman class, said Father Zosima, looking curiously at her. Town folk we are, Father, town folk. Yet we are peasants though we live in the town. I have come to see you, O oh Father. We heard of you, Father, we heard of you. I have buried my little son, and I have come on a pilgrimage. I have been in three monasteries, but they told me, Go, Nastasia, go to them, that is to you. I have come, I was yesterday at the service, and today I have come to you. What are you weeping for? It's my little son I'm grieving for, father. He was three years old, three years all but three months. For my little boy, father, I'm in anguish, for my little boy. He was the last one left. We had four, my Nikita and I, and now we've no children, our dear ones have all gone. I buried the first three without grieving over much, and now I have buried the last I can't forget him. He seems always standing before me. He never leaves me. He has withered my heart. I look at his little clothes, his little shirt, his little boots, and I wail. I lay out all that is left of him, all his little things. I look at them and wail. I say to Nikita, my husband, let me go on a pilgrimage, master. He is a driver. We're not poor people, father, not poor, he drives our own horse. It's all our own, the horse and the carriage. And what good is it all to us now? My Nikita has begun drinking while I am away. He's sure to. It used to be so before. As soon as I turn my back he gives way to it, but now I don't think about him. It's three months since I left home. I've forgotten him. I've forgotten everything. I don't want to remember. And what would our life be now together? I've done with him, I've done. I've done with them all. I don't care to look upon my house and my goods. I don't care to see anything at all. Listen, mother, said the elder. Once in olden times a holy saint saw in the temple a mother like you weeping for her little one, her only one, whom God had taken. Knowest thou not, said the saint to her, how bold these little ones are before the throne of God. Verily there are none bolder than they in the kingdom of heaven. Thou didst give us life, O Lord, they say, and scarcely had we looked upon it when thou didst take it back again. And so boldly they ask and ask again that God gives them at once the rank of angels. Therefore, said the saint, Thou, too, O mother, rejoice and weep not, for thy little son is with the Lord in the fellowship of the angels. That's what the saint said to the weeping mother of old. He was a great saint and he could not have spoken falsely. Therefore you too, mother, know that your little one is surely before the throne of God, is rejoicing and happy, and praying to God for you, and therefore weep not, but rejoice. The woman listened to him, looking down with her cheek in her hand. She sighed deeply. My Nikita tried to comfort me with the same words as you. Foolish one, he said, why weep? Our son is no doubt singing with the angels before God. He says that to me, but he weeps himself. I see that he cries like me. I know, Nikita, said I, where could he be if not with the Lord God? Only, here with us now he is not as he used to sit beside us before. And if only I could look upon him one little time, if only I could peep at him one little time, without going up to him, without speaking, if I could be hidden in a corner and only see him for one little minute, hear him playing in the yard, calling in his little voice, Mammy, where are you? If only I could hear him pattering with his little feet about the room just once, only once, for so often, so often I remember how he used to run to me and shout and laugh, if only I could hear his little feet I should know him. But he's gone, father, he's gone, and I shall never hear him again. Here's his little sash, but him I shall never see or hear now. She drew out of her bosom her boy's little embroidered sash, and as soon as she looked at it she began shaking with sobs, hiding her eyes with her fingers through which the tears flowed in a sudden stream. It is Rachel of old, said the elder, weeping for her children, and will not be comforted because they are not. Such is the lot set on earth for you mothers. Be not comforted. Consolation is not what you need. Weep and be not consoled, but weep. 
Only every time that you weep be sure to remember that your little son is one of the angels of God, that he looks down from there at you and sees you, and rejoices at your tears, and points at them to the Lord God, and a long while yet will you keep that great mother's grief. But it will turn in the end into quiet joy, and your bitter tears will be only tears of tender sorrow that purifies the heart and delivers it from sin. And I shall pray for the peace of your child's soul. What was his name? Alexei, Father. A sweet name. After Alexei, the man of God. Yes, Father. What a saint he was. I will remember him, Mother, and your grief in my prayers, and I will pray for your husband's health. It is a sin for you to leave him. Your little one will see from heaven that you have forsaken his father, and will weep over you. Why do you trouble his happiness? He is living, for the soul lives forever, and though he is not in the house he is near you, unseen. How can he go into the house when you say that the house is hateful to you? To whom is he to go if he find you not together, his father and mother? He comes to you in dreams now, and you grieve. But then he will send you gentle dreams. Go to your husband, mother, go this very day. I will go, father, at your word. I will go. You've gone straight to my heart. My Nikita, my Nikita, you are waiting for me, the woman began in a sing-song voice, but the elder had already turned away to a very old woman, dressed like a dweller in the town, not like a pilgrim. Her eyes showed that she had come with an object, and in order to say something. She said she was the widow of a non-commissioned officer, and lived close by in the town. Her son Vasenka was in the commissariat service, and had gone to Irkutsk in Siberia. He had written twice from there, but now a year had passed since he had written. She did inquire about him, but she did not know the proper place to inquire. Only the other day Stepanida Ilyanishna, she's a rich merchant's wife, said to me, you go, Prohorovna, and put your son's name down for prayer in the church, and pray for the peace of his soul as though he were dead. His soul will be troubled, she said, and he will write you a letter. And Stepanida Ilyanishna told me it was a certain thing which had been many times tried. Only I am in doubt. Oh, you light of ours! Is it true or false, and would it be right? Don't think of it. It's shameful to ask the question. How is it possible to pray for the peace of a living soul? And his own mother too. It's a great sin, akin to sorcery. Only for your ignorance it is forgiven you. Better pray to the Queen of Heaven, our swift defense and help, for his good health, and that she may forgive you for your error. And another thing I will tell you, Prohorovna. Either he will soon come back to you, your son, or he will be sure to send a letter. Go, and henceforward be in peace. Your son is alive, I tell you. Dear Father, God reward you, our benefactor, who prays for all of us and for our sins. But the elder had already noticed in the crowd two glowing eyes fixed upon him. An exhausted, consumptive looking, though young peasant woman was gazing at him in silence. Her eyes besought him, but she seemed afraid to approach. What is it, my child? Absolve my soul, father, she articulated softly, and slowly sank on her knees and bowed down at his feet. I have sinned, father. I am afraid of my sin. The elder sat down on the lower step. The woman crept closer to him, still on her knees. I am a widow these three years, she began in a half-whisper, with a sort of shudder. I had a hard life with my husband. He was an old man. He used to beat me cruelly. He lay ill, I thought looking at him, if you were to get well, if you were to get up again, what then? And then the thought came to me. Stay, said the elder, and he put his ear close to her lips. The woman went on in a low whisper, so that it was almost impossible to catch anything. She had soon done. Three years ago, asked the elder. Three years. At first I didn't think about it, but now I've begun to be ill, and the thought never leaves me. Have you come from far? Over three hundred miles away. Have you told it in confession? I have confessed it. Twice I have confessed it. Have you been admitted to communion? Yes. 
I am afraid. I am afraid to die. Fear nothing and never be afraid, and don't fret. If only your penitence fail not, God will forgive all. There is no sin, and there can be no sin on all the earth, which the Lord will not forgive to the truly repentant. Man cannot commit a sin so great as to exhaust the infinite love of God. Can there be a sin which could exceed the love of God? Think only of repentance, continual repentance, but dismiss fear altogether. Believe that God loves you as you cannot conceive, that He loves you with your sin, in your sin. It has been said of old that over one repentant sinner there is more joy in heaven than over ten righteous men. Go, and fear not. Be not bitter against men. Be not angry if you are wronged. Forgive the dead man in your heart what wrong he did you. Be reconciled with him in truth. If you are penitent, you love. And if you love you are of God. All things are atoned for, all things are saved by love. If I, a sinner, even as you are, am tender with you and have pity on you, how much more will God? Love is such a priceless treasure that you can redeem the whole world by it, and expiate not only your own sins but the sins of others. He signed her three times with the cross, took from his own neck a little icon and put it upon her. She bowed down to the earth without speaking. He got up and looked cheerfully at a healthy peasant woman with a tiny baby in her arms. From Vishigori, dear father. Five miles you have dragged yourself with the baby. What do you want? I've come to look at you. I have been to you before, or have you forgotten? You've no great memory if you've forgotten me. They told us you were ill. Thinks I, I'll go and see him for myself. Now I see you, and you're not ill. You'll live another twenty years. God bless you. There are plenty to pray for you, how should you be ill? I thank you for all, daughter. By the way, I have a thing to ask, not a great one. Here are sixty kopecks. Give them, dear father, to someone poorer than me. I thought as I came along, better give through him. He'll know whom to give to. Thanks, my dear, thanks. You are a good woman. I love you. I will do so certainly. Is that your little girl? My little girl, father, Lizavita. May the Lord bless you both, you and your babe Lizavita. You have gladdened my heart, mother. Farewell, dear children, farewell, dear ones. He blessed them all and bowed low to them. Chapter 4 A Lady of Little Faith a visitor looking on the scene of his conversation with the peasants and his blessing them shed silent tears and wiped them away with her handkerchief. She was a sentimental society lady of genuinely good disposition in many respects. When the elder went up to her at last she met him enthusiastically. Ah, what I have been feeling, looking on at this touching scene, she could not go on for emotion. Oh, I understand the people's love for you. I love the people myself. I want to love them. And who could help loving them, our splendid Russian people, so simple in their greatness. How is your daughter's health? You wanted to talk to me again? Oh, I have been urgently begging for it, I have prayed for it. I was ready to fall on my knees and kneel for three days at your windows until you let me in. We have come, great healer, to express our ardent gratitude. You have healed my lees, healed her completely, merely by praying over her last Thursday and laying your hands upon her. We have hastened here to kiss those hands, to pour out our feelings and our homage. What do you mean by healed? But she is still lying down in her chair. But her night fevers have entirely ceased ever since Thursday, said the lady with nervous haste. And that's not all. Her legs are stronger. This morning she got up well, she had slept all night. Look at her rosy cheeks, her bright eyes. She used to be always crying, but now she laughs and is gay and happy. This morning she insisted on my letting her stand up, and she stood up for a whole minute without any support. She wagers that in a fortnight she'll be dancing a quadrille. I've called in Dr. Herzenstube. He shrugged his shoulders and said, I am amazed, I can make nothing of it. 
And would you have us not come here to disturb you, not fly here to thank you? Lise, thank him, thank him. Lise's pretty little laughing face became suddenly serious. She rose in her chair as far as she could and, looking at the elder, clasped her hands before him, but could not restrain herself and broke into laughter. It's at him, she said, pointing to Alyosha, with childish vexation at herself for not being able to repress her mirth. If anyone had looked at Alyosha standing a step behind the elder, he would have caught a quick flush crimsoning his cheeks in an instant. His eyes shone and he looked down. She has a message for you, Alexei Fyodorovich. How are you? The mother went on, holding out her exquisitely gloved hand to Alyosha. The elder turned round and all at once looked attentively at Alyosha. The latter went nearer to Lee's and, smiling in a strangely awkward way, held out his hand to her too. Lee's assumed an important air. Katerina Ivanovna has sent you this through me. She handed him a little note. She particularly begs you to go and see her as soon as possible, that you will not fail her, but will be sure to come. She asks me to go and see her. Me? What for? Alyosha muttered in great astonishment. His face at once looked anxious. Oh, it's all to do with Dmitri Fyodorovich and, what has happened lately, the mother explained hurriedly. Katerina Ivanovna has made up her mind, but she must see you about it. Why, of course, I can't say. But she wants to see you at once. And you will go to her, of course. It is a Christian duty. I have only seen her once, Alyosha protested with the same perplexity. Oh, she is such a lofty, incomparable creature. If only for her suffering. Think what she has gone through, what she is enduring now. Think what awaits her. It's all terrible, terrible. Very well, I will come, Alyosha decided, after rapidly scanning the brief, enigmatic note which consisted of an urgent entreaty that he would come, without any sort of explanation. Oh, how sweet and generous that would be of you, cried Lise with sudden animation. I told Mama you'd be sure not to go. I said you were saving your soul. How splendid you are. I've always thought you were splendid. How glad I am to tell you so. Lise, said her mother impressively, though she smiled after she had said it. You have quite forgotten us, Alexei Fyodorovich, she said, you never come to see us. Yet Lise has told me twice that she is never happy except with you. Alyosha raised his downcast eyes and again flushed, and again smiled without knowing why. But the elder was no longer watching him. He had begun talking to a monk who, as mentioned before, had been awaiting his entrance by Lise's chair. He was evidently a monk of the humblest, that is of the peasant, class, of a narrow outlook, but a true believer, and, in his own way, a stubborn one. He announced that he had come from the far north, from Obdorsk, from St. Sylvester, and was a member of a poor monastery, consisting of only ten monks. The elder gave him his blessing and invited him to come to his cell whenever he liked. How can you presume to do such deeds, the monk asked suddenly, pointing solemnly and significantly at Lee's. He was referring to her, healing. It's too early, of course, to speak of that. Relief is not complete cure, and may proceed from different causes. But if there has been any healing, it is by no power but God's will. It's all from God. Visit me, Father, he added to the monk. It's not often I can see visitors. I am ill, and I know that my days are numbered. Oh, no, no. God will not take you from us. You will live a long, long time yet, cried the lady. And in what way are you ill? You look so well, so gay and happy. I am extraordinarily better today. But I know that it's only for a moment. I understand my disease now thoroughly. If I seem so happy to you, you could never say anything that would please me so much. For men are made for happiness, and anyone who is completely happy has a right to say to himself, I am doing God's will on earth. All the righteous, all the saints, all the holy martyrs were happy. Oh, how you speak! What bold and lofty words, cried the lady. You seem to pierce with your words. And yet, 
happiness, happiness, where is it? Who can say of himself that he is happy? Oh, since you have been so good as to let us see you once more today, let me tell you what I could not utter last time, what I dared not say, all I am suffering and have been for so long. I am suffering. Forgive me. I am suffering. And in a rush of fervent feeling she clasped her hands before him. From what specially? I suffer, from lack of faith. Lack of faith in God. Oh, no, no. I dare not even think of that. But the future life, it is such an enigma. And no one, no one can solve it. Listen. You are a healer, you are deeply versed in the human soul, and of course I dare not expect you to believe me entirely, but I assure you on my word of honor that I am not speaking lightly now. The thought of the life beyond the grave distracts me to anguish, to terror. And I don't know to whom to appeal, and have not dared to all my life. And now I am so bold as to ask you. Oh, God. What will you think of me now? She clasped her hands. Don't distress yourself about my opinion of you, said the elder. I quite believe in the sincerity of your suffering. Oh, how thankful I am to you. You see, I shut my eyes and ask myself if everyone has faith, where did it come from? And then they do say that it all comes from terror at the menacing phenomena of nature, and that none of it's real. And I say to myself, what if I've been believing all my life, and when I come to die there's nothing but the burdocks growing on my grave, as I read in some author. It's awful. How, how can I get back my faith? But I only believed when I was a little child, mechanically, without thinking of anything. How, how is one to prove it? I have come now to lay my soul before you and to ask you about it. If I let this chance slip, no one all my life will answer me. How can I prove it? How can I convince myself? Oh, how unhappy I am. I stand and look about me and see that scarcely anyone else cares, no one troubles his head about it, and I'm the only one who can't stand it. It's deadly, deadly. No doubt. But there's no proving it, though you can be convinced of it. How? By the experience of active love. Strive to love your neighbor actively and indefatigably. In as far as you advance in love you will grow surer of the reality of God and of the immortality of your soul. If you attain to perfect self-forgetfulness in the love of your neighbor, then you will believe without doubt, and no doubt can possibly enter your soul. This has been tried. This is certain. In active love? There's another question, and such a question. You see, I so love humanity that, would you believe it, I often dream of forsaking all that I have, leaving Lees, and becoming a sister of mercy. I close my eyes and think and dream, and at that moment I feel full of strength to overcome all obstacles. No wounds, no festering sores could at that moment frighten me. I would bind them up and wash them with my own hands. I would nurse the afflicted. I would be ready to kiss such wounds. It is much, and well that your mind is full of such dreams and not others. Sometime, unawares, you may do a good deed in reality. Yes. But could I endure such a life for long, the lady went on fervently, almost frantically. That's the chief question, that's my most agonizing question. I shut my eyes and ask myself, would you persevere long on that path? And if the patient whose wounds you are washing did not meet you with gratitude, but worried you with his whims, without valuing or remarking your charitable services, began abusing you and rudely commanding you, and complaining to the superior authorities of you, which often happens when people are in great suffering, what then? Would you persevere in your love, or not? And do you know, I came with horror to the conclusion that, if anything could dissipate my love to humanity, it would be ingratitude. In short, I am a hired servant, I expect my payment at once, that is, praise, and the repayment of love with love. Otherwise I am incapable of loving any one. She was in a very paroxysm of self-castigation, and, concluding, she looked with defiant resolution at the elder. It's just the same story as a doctor once told me, observed the elder. 
He was a man getting on in years, and undoubtedly clever. He spoke as frankly as you, though in jest, in bitter jest. I love humanity, he said, but I wonder at myself. The more I love humanity in general, the less I love man in particular. In my dreams, he said, I have often come to making enthusiastic schemes for the service of humanity, and perhaps I might actually have faced crucifixion if it had been suddenly necessary, and yet I am incapable of living in the same room with anyone for two days together, as I know by experience. As soon as anyone is near me, his personality disturbs my self-complacency and restricts my freedom. In twenty-four hours I begin to hate the best of men, one because he's too long over his dinner, another because he has a cold and keeps on blowing his nose. I become hostile to people the moment they come close to me, but it has always happened that the more I detest men individually the more ardent becomes my love for humanity. But what's to be done? What can one do in such a case? Must one despair? No. It is enough that you are distressed at it. Do what you can, and it will be reckoned unto you. Much is done already in you since you can so deeply and sincerely know yourself. If you have been talking to me so sincerely, simply to gain approbation for your frankness, as you did for me just now, then of course you will not attain to anything in the achievement of real love, it will all get no further than dreams, and your whole life will slip away like a phantom. In that case you will naturally cease to think of the future life too, and will of yourself grow calmer after a fashion in the end. You have crushed me. Only now, as you speak, I understand that I was really only seeking your approbation for my sincerity when I told you I could not endure ingratitude. You have revealed me to myself. You have seen through me and explained me to myself. Are you speaking the truth? Well, now, after such a confession, I believe that you are sincere and good at heart. If you do not attain happiness, always remember that you are on the right road, and try not to leave it. Above all, avoid falsehood, every kind of falsehood, especially falseness to yourself. Watch over your own deceitfulness and look into it every hour, every minute. Avoid being scornful, both to others and to yourself. What seems to you bad within you will grow purer from the very fact of your observing it in yourself. Avoid fear, too, though fear is only the consequence of every sort of falsehood. Never be frightened at your own faint-heartedness in attaining love. Don't be frightened over much even at your evil actions. I am sorry I can say nothing more consoling to you, for love in action is a harsh and dreadful thing compared with love in dreams. Love in dreams is greedy for immediate action, rapidly performed and in the sight of all. Men will even give their lives if only the ordeal does not last long but is soon over, with all looking on and applauding as though on the stage. But active love is labor and fortitude, and for some people too, perhaps, a complete science. But I predict that just when you see with horror that in spite of all your efforts you are getting farther from your goal instead of nearer to it, at that very moment I predict that you will reach it and behold clearly the miraculous power of the Lord who has been all the time loving and mysteriously guiding you. Forgive me for not being able to stay longer with you. They are waiting for me. Goodbye. The lady was weeping. Lees, Lees. Bless her, bless her, she cried, starting up suddenly. She does not deserve to be loved. I have seen her naughtiness all along, the elder said jestingly. Why have you been laughing at Alexei? Lees had in fact been occupied in mocking at him all the time. She had noticed before that Alyosha was shy and tried not to look at her, and she found this extremely amusing. She waited intently to catch his eye. Alyosha, unable to endure her persistent stare, was irresistibly and suddenly drawn to glance at her, and at once she smiled triumphantly in his face. Alyosha was even more disconcerted and vexed. At last he turned away from her altogether and hid behind the elder's back. After a few minutes, drawn by the same irresistible force, he turned again to see whether he was being looked at or not, and found Lise almost hanging out of her chair to peep sideways at him, eagerly waiting for him to look. Catching his eye, she laughed so that the elder could not help saying, Why do you make fun of him like that, naughty girl? Lee suddenly and quite unexpectedly blushed. 
Her eyes flashed and her face became quite serious. She began speaking quickly and nervously in a warm and resentful voice. Why has he forgotten everything, then? He used to carry me about when I was little. We used to play together. He used to come to teach me to read, do you know? Two years ago, when he went away, he said that he would never forget me, that we were friends forever, forever, forever. And now he's afraid of me all at once. Am I going to eat him? Why doesn't he want to come near me? Why doesn't he talk? Why won't he come and see us? It's not that you won't let him. We know that he goes everywhere. It's not good manners for me to invite him. He ought to have thought of it first, if he hasn't forgotten me. No, now he's saving his soul. Why have you put that long gown on him? If he runs he'll fall. And suddenly she hid her face in her hand and went off into irresistible, prolonged, nervous, inaudible laughter. The elder listened to her with a smile, and blessed her tenderly. As she kissed his hand she suddenly pressed it to her eyes and began crying, Don't be angry with me. I'm silly and good for nothing, and perhaps Alyosha's right, quite right, in not wanting to come and see such a ridiculous girl. I will certainly send him, said the elder. Chapter 5 So be it so be it. The elder's absence from his cell had lasted for about twenty-five minutes. It was more than half past twelve, but Dmitri, on whose account they had all met there, had still not appeared. But he seemed almost to be forgotten, and when the elder entered the cell again, he found his guests engaged in eager conversation. Ivan and the two monks took the leading share in it. Myasov, too, was trying to take a part, and apparently very eagerly, in the conversation. But he was unsuccessful in this also. He was evidently in the background, and his remarks were treated with neglect, which increased his irritability. He had had intellectual encounters with Ivan before and he could not endure a certain carelessness Ivan showed him. Hitherto at least I have stood in the front ranks of all that is progressive in Europe, and here the new generation positively ignores us, he thought. Fyodor Pavlovich, who had given his word to sit still and be quiet, had actually been quiet for some time, but he watched his neighbor Myasov with an ironical little smile, obviously enjoying his discomfiture. He had been waiting for some time to pay off old scores, and now he could not let the opportunity slip. Bending over his shoulder he began teasing him again in a whisper. Why didn't you go away just now, after the, courteously kissing? Why did you consent to remain in such unseemly company? It was because you felt insulted and aggrieved, and you remained to vindicate yourself by showing off your intelligence. Now you won't go till you've displayed your intellect to them. You again. On the contrary, I'm just going. You'll be the last, the last of all to go. Fyodor Pavlovich delivered him another thrust, almost at the moment of Father Zosima's return. The discussion died down for a moment, but the elder, seating himself in his former place, looked at them all as though cordially inviting them to go on. Alyosha, who knew every expression of his face, saw that he was fearfully exhausted and making a great effort. Of late he had been liable to fainting fits from exhaustion. His face had the pallor that was common before such attacks, and his lips were white. But he evidently did not want to break up the party. He seemed to have some special object of his own in keeping them. What object? Alyosha watched him intently. We are discussing this gentleman's most interesting article, said Father Iasif, the librarian, addressing the elder, and indicating Ivan. He brings forward much that is new, but I think the argument cuts both ways. It is an article written in answer to a book by an ecclesiastical authority on the question of the ecclesiastical court, and the scope of its jurisdiction. I'm sorry I have not read your article, but I've heard of it, said the elder, looking keenly and intently at Ivan. He takes up a most interesting position, continued the father librarian. As far as church jurisdiction is concerned he is apparently quite opposed to the separation of church from state. That's interesting. But in what sense? Father Zosima asked Ivan. The latter, at last, answered him, not condescendingly, as Alyosha had feared, but with modesty and reserve, with evident goodwill and apparently without the slightest arrière-pensée. 
I start from the position that this confusion of elements, that is, of the essential principles of church and state, will, of course, go on forever, in spite of the fact that it is impossible for them to mingle, and that the confusion of these elements cannot lead to any consistent or even normal results, for there is falsity at the very foundation of it. Compromise between the church and state in such questions as, for instance, jurisdiction, is, to my thinking, impossible in any real sense. My clerical opponent maintains that the church holds a precise and defined position in the state. I maintain, on the contrary, that the church ought to include the whole state, and not simply to occupy a corner in it, and, if this is, for some reason, impossible at present, then it ought, in reality, to be set up as the direct and chief aim of the future development of Christian society. Perfectly true, Father Pacey, the silent and learned monk, assented with fervor and decision. The purest ultramontanism, cried Myasov impatiently, crossing and recrossing his legs. Oh, well, we have no mountains, cried Father Iasif, and turning to the elder he continued, observe the answer he makes to the following fundamental and essential propositions of his opponent, who is, you must note, an ecclesiastic. First, that, no social organization can or ought to arrogate to itself power to dispose of the civic and political rights of its members. Secondly, that, criminal and civil jurisdiction ought not to belong to the church, and is inconsistent with its nature, both as a divine institution and as an organization of men for religious objects, and, finally, in the third place, the church is a kingdom not of this world. A most unworthy play upon words for an ecclesiastic. Father Pacey could not refrain from breaking in again. I have read the book which you have answered, he added, addressing Ivan, and was astounded at the words, the church is a kingdom and not of this world. If it is not of this world, then it cannot exist on earth at all. In the gospel, the words, not of this world, are not used in that sense. To play with such words is indefensible. Our Lord Jesus Christ came to set up the church upon earth. The kingdom of heaven, of course, is not of this world, but in heaven but it is only entered through the church which has been founded and established upon earth. And so a frivolous play upon words in such a connection is unpardonable and improper. The church is, in truth, a kingdom and ordained to rule, and in the end must undoubtedly become the kingdom ruling over all the earth. For that we have the divine promise. He ceased speaking suddenly, as though checking himself. After listening attentively and respectfully Ivan went on, addressing the elder with perfect composure and as before with ready cordiality. The whole point of my article lies in the fact that during the first three centuries Christianity only existed on earth in the church and was nothing but the church. When the pagan Roman Empire desired to become Christian, it inevitably happened that, by becoming Christian, it included the church but remained a pagan state in very many of its departments. In reality this was bound to happen. But Rome as a state retained too much of the pagan civilization and culture, as, for example, in the very objects and fundamental principles of the state. The Christian church entering into the state could, of course, surrender no part of its fundamental principles, the rock on which it stands, and could pursue no other aims than those which have been ordained and revealed by God himself, and among them that of drawing the whole world and therefore the ancient pagan state itself, into the church. In that way, that is, with a view to the future, it is not the church that should seek a definite position in the state, like every social organization, or as, an organization of men for religious purposes, as my opponent calls the church, but, on the contrary, every earthly state should be, in the end, completely transformed into the church and should become nothing else but a church rejecting every purpose incongruous with the aims of the church. All this will not degrade it in any way or take from its honor and glory as a great state, nor from the glory of its rulers, but only turns it from a false, still pagan, and mistaken path to the true and rightful path, which alone leads to the eternal goal. This is why the author of the book on the foundations of church jurisdiction would have judged correctly if, in seeking and laying down those foundations, he had looked upon them as a temporary compromise inevitable in our sinful and imperfect days. But as soon as the author ventures to declare that the foundations which he predicates now, part of which Father Iasif just enumerated, are the permanent, essential, 
and eternal foundations, he is going directly against the church and its sacred and eternal vocation. That is the gist of my article. That is, in brief, Father Pacey began again, laying stress on each word, according to certain theories only too clearly formulated in the 19th century, the church ought to be transformed into the state, as though this would be an advance from a lower to a higher form, so as to disappear into it, making way for science, for the spirit of the age, and civilization. And if the church resists and is unwilling, some corner will be set apart for her in the state, and even that under control, and this will be so everywhere in all modern European countries. But Russian hopes and conceptions demand not that the church should pass as from a lower into a higher type into the state, but, on the contrary, that the state should end by being worthy to become only the church and nothing else. So be it. So be it. Well, I confess you've reassured me somewhat, Myasov said smiling, again crossing his legs. So far as I understand, then, the realization of such an ideal is infinitely remote, at the second coming of Christ. That's as you please. It's a beautiful utopian dream of the abolition of war, diplomacy, banks, and so on, something after the fashion of socialism, indeed. But I imagine that it was all meant seriously, and that the church might be now going to try criminals, and sentence them to beating, prison, and even death. But if there were none but the ecclesiastical court, the church would not even now sentence a criminal to prison or to death. Crime and the way of regarding it would inevitably change, not all at once of course, but fairly soon, Ivan replied calmly, without flinching. Are you serious? Myasov glanced keenly at him. If everything became the church, the church would exclude all the criminal and disobedient, and would not cut off their heads, Ivan went on. I ask you, what would become of the excluded? He would be cut off then not only from men, as now, but from Christ. By his crime he would have transgressed not only against men but against the church of Christ. This is so even now, of course, strictly speaking, but it is not clearly enunciated, and very, very often the criminal of today compromises with his conscience, I steal, he says, but I don't go against the church. I'm not an enemy of Christ. That's what the criminal of today is continually saying to himself, but when the church takes the place of the state it will be difficult for him, in opposition to the church all over the world, to say, all men are mistaken, all in error, all mankind are the false church. I, a thief and murderer, am the only true Christian church. It will be very difficult to say this to himself, it requires a rare combination of unusual circumstances. Now, on the other side, take the church's own view of crime, is it not bound to renounce the present almost pagan attitude, and to change from a mechanical cutting off of its tainted member for the preservation of society, as at present, into completely and honestly adopting the idea of the regeneration of the man, of his reformation and salvation? What do you mean? I fail to understand again, Myasov interrupted. Some sort of dream again. Something shapeless and even incomprehensible. What is excommunication? What sort of exclusion? I suspect you are simply amusing yourself, Ivan Fyodorovich. Yes, but you know, in reality it is so now, said the elder suddenly, and all turned to him at once. If it were not for the Church of Christ there would be nothing to restrain the criminal from evil doing, no real chastisement for it afterwards, none, that is, but the mechanical punishment spoken of just now, which in the majority of cases only embitters the heart, and not the real punishment, the only effectual one, the only deterrent and softening one, which lies in the recognition of sin by conscience. How is that, may one inquire, asked Myasov, with lively curiosity. Why, began the elder, all these sentences to exile with hard labor, and formerly with flogging also, reform no one, and what's more, deter hardly a single criminal, and the number of crimes does not diminish but is continually on the increase. You must admit that. Consequently the security of society is not preserved, for, although the obnoxious member is mechanically cut off and sent far away out of sight, another criminal always comes to take his place at once, and often two of them. If anything does preserve society, even in our time, and does regenerate and transform the criminal, it is only the law of Christ speaking in his conscience. 
It is only by recognizing his wrongdoing as a son of a Christian society, that is, of the Church, that he recognizes his sin against society, that is, against the Church. So that it is only against the Church, and not against the State, that the criminal of today can recognize that he has sinned. If society, as a Church, had jurisdiction, then it would know when to bring back from exclusion and to reunite to itself. Now the Church having no real jurisdiction, but only the power of moral condemnation, withdraws of her own accord from punishing the criminal actively. She does not excommunicate him but simply persists in motherly exhortation of him. What is more, the Church even tries to preserve all Christian communion with the criminal. She admits him to Church services, to the Holy Sacrament, gives him alms, and treats him more as a captive than as a convict. And what would become of the criminal, O Lord, if even the Christian society, that is, the Church, were to reject him even as the civil law rejects him and cuts him off? What would become of him if the Church punished him with her excommunication as the direct consequence of the secular law? There could be no more terrible despair, at least for a Russian criminal, for Russian criminals still have faith. Though, who knows, perhaps then a fearful thing would happen, perhaps the despairing heart of the criminal would lose its faith and then what would become of him? But the Church, like a tender, loving mother, holds aloof from active punishment herself, as the sinner is too severely punished already by the civil law, and there must be at least someone to have pity on him. The Church holds aloof, above all, because its judgment is the only one that contains the truth, and therefore cannot practically and morally be united to any other judgment even as a temporary compromise. She can enter into no compact about that. The foreign criminal, they say, rarely repents, for the very doctrines of today confirm him in the idea that his crime is not a crime, but only a reaction against an unjustly oppressive force. Society cuts him off completely by a force that triumphs over him mechanically and, so at least they say of themselves in Europe, accompanies this exclusion with hatred, forgetfulness, and the most profound indifference as to the ultimate fate of the erring brother. In this way, it all takes place without the compassionate intervention of the Church, for in many cases there are no churches there at all, for though ecclesiastics and splendid church buildings remain, the churches themselves have long ago striven to pass from church into state and to disappear in it completely. So it seems at least in Lutheran countries. As for Rome, it was proclaimed a state instead of a church a thousand years ago. And so the criminal is no longer conscious of being a member of the church and sinks into despair. If he returns to society, often it is with such hatred that society itself instinctively cuts him off. You can judge for yourself how it must end. In many cases it would seem to be the same with us, but the difference is that besides the established law courts we have the church too, which always keeps up relations with the criminal as a dear and still precious son. And besides that, there is still preserved, though only in thought, the judgment of the Church, which though no longer existing in practice is still living as a dream for the future, and is, no doubt, instinctively recognized by the criminal in his soul. What was said here just now is true too, that is, that if the jurisdiction of the Church were introduced in practice in its full force, that is, if the whole of the society were changed into the Church, not only the judgment of the Church would have influence on the reformation of the criminal such as it never has now, but possibly also the crimes themselves would be incredibly diminished. And there can be no doubt that the Church would look upon the criminal and the crime of the future in many cases quite differently and would succeed in restoring the excluded, in restraining those who plan evil, and in regenerating the fallen. It is true, said Father Zosima, with a smile, the Christian society now is not ready and is only resting on some seven righteous men, but as they are never lacking, it will continue still unshaken in expectation of its complete transformation from a society almost heathen in character into a single universal and all-powerful church. So be it, so be it. Even though at the end of the ages, for it is ordained to come to pass. And there is no need to be troubled about times and seasons, for the secret of the times and seasons is in the wisdom of God, in His foresight, and His love. And what in human reckoning seems still afar off, may by the divine ordinance be close at hand, on the eve of its appearance. And so be it, so be it. So be it, so be it. Father Pacey repeated austerely and reverently. 
Strange, extremely strange. Mayasov pronounced, not so much with heat as with latent indignation. What strikes you as so strange? Father Ayasov inquired cautiously. Why, it's beyond anything, cried Mayasov, suddenly breaking out, the state is eliminated and the church is raised to the position of the state. It's not simply ultramontanism, it's archultramontanism. It's beyond the dreams of Pope Gregory VII. You are completely misunderstanding it, said Father Pacey sternly. Understand, the church is not to be transformed into the state. That is Rome and its dream. That is the third temptation of the devil. On the contrary, the state is transformed into the church, will ascend and become a church over the whole world, which is the complete opposite of ultramontanism and Rome, and your interpretation, and is only the glorious destiny ordained for the Orthodox Church. This star will arise in the East. Mayasov was significantly silent. His whole figure expressed extraordinary personal dignity. A supercilious and condescending smile played on his lips. Alyosha watched it all with a throbbing heart. The whole conversation stirred him profoundly. He glanced casually at Rakitin, who was standing immovable in his place by the door listening and watching intently though with downcast eyes. But from the color in his cheeks Alyosha guessed that Rakitin was probably no less excited, and he knew what caused his excitement. Allow me to tell you one little anecdote, gentlemen, Mayasov said impressively, with a peculiarly majestic air. Some years ago, soon after the coup d'état of December, I happened to be calling in Paris on an extremely influential personage in the government, and I met a very interesting man in his house. This individual was not precisely a detective but was a sort of superintendent of a whole regiment of political detectives, a rather powerful position in its own way. I was prompted by curiosity to seize the opportunity of conversation with him. And as he had not come as a visitor but as a subordinate official bringing a special report, and as he saw the reception given me by his chief, he deigned to speak with some openness, to a certain extent only, of course. He was rather courteous than open, as Frenchmen know how to be courteous, especially to a foreigner. But I thoroughly understood him. The subject was the socialist revolutionaries who were at that time persecuted. I will quote only one most curious remark dropped by this person. We are not particularly afraid, said he, of all these socialists, anarchists, infidels, and revolutionists, we keep watch on them and know all their goings on. But there are a few peculiar men among them who believe in God and are Christians, but at the same time are socialists. These are the people we are most afraid of. They are dreadful people. The socialist who is a Christian is more to be dreaded than a socialist who is an atheist. The word struck me at the time, and now they have suddenly come back to me here, gentlemen. You apply them to us, and look upon us as socialists. Father Pacey asked directly, without beating about the bush. But before Pyotr Alexandrovich could think what to answer, the door opened, and the guest so long expected, Dmitri Fyodorovich, came in. They had, in fact, given up expecting him, and his sudden appearance caused some surprise for a moment. Chapter 6. Why is such a man alive? Dmitri Fyodorovich, a young man of eight and twenty, of medium height and agreeable countenance, looked older than his years. He was muscular, and showed signs of considerable physical strength. Yet there was something not healthy in his face. It was rather thin, his cheeks were hollow, and there was an unhealthy sallowness in their color. His rather large, prominent, dark eyes had an expression of firm determination, and yet there was a vague look in them, too. Even when he was excited and talking irritably, his eyes somehow did not follow his mood, but betrayed something else, sometimes quite incongruous with what was passing. It's hard to tell what he's thinking, those who talk to him sometimes declared. People who saw something pensive and sullen in his eyes were startled by his sudden laugh, which bore witness to mirthful and light-hearted thoughts at the very time when his eyes were so gloomy. A certain strained look in his face was easy to understand at this moment. Everyone knew, or had heard of, the extremely restless and dissipated life which he had been leading of late, as well as of the violent anger to which he had been roused in his quarrels with his father. There were several stories current in the town about it. 
It is true that he was irascible by nature, of an unstable and unbalanced mind, as our Justice of the Peace, Kachalnikov, happily described him. He was stylishly and irreproachably dressed in a carefully buttoned frock coat. He wore black gloves and carried a top hat. Having only lately left the army, he still had mustaches and no beard. His dark brown hair was cropped short and combed forward on his temples. He had the long, determined stride of a military man. He stood still for a moment on the threshold, and glancing at the whole party went straight up to the elder, guessing him to be their host. He made him a low bow, and asked his blessing. Father Zosima, rising in his chair, blessed him. Dmitri kissed his hand respectfully, and with intense feeling, almost anger, he said. Be so generous as to forgive me for having kept you waiting so long, but Smerdyakov, the valet sent me by my father, in reply to my inquiries, told me twice over that the appointment was for one. Now I suddenly learn. Don't disturb yourself, interposed the elder. No matter. You are a little late. It's of no consequence. I'm extremely obliged to you, and expected no less from your goodness. Saying this, Dmitri bowed once more. Then, turning suddenly towards his father, made him, too, a similarly low and respectful bow. He had evidently considered it beforehand, and made this bow in all seriousness, thinking it his duty to show his respect and good intentions. Although Fyodor Pavlovich was taken unawares, he was equal to the occasion. In response to Dmitri's bow he jumped up from his chair and made his son a bow as low in return. His face was suddenly solemn and impressive, which gave him a positively malignant look. Dmitri bowed generally to all present, and without a word walked to the window with his long, resolute stride, sat down on the only empty chair, near Father Pacey, and, bending forward, prepared to listen to the conversation he had interrupted. Dmitri's entrance had taken no more than two minutes, and the conversation was resumed. But this time Myasov thought it unnecessary to reply to Father Pacey's persistent and almost irritable question. Allow me to withdraw from this discussion, he observed with a certain well-bred nonchalance. It's a subtle question, too. Here Ivan Fyodorovich is smiling at us. He must have something interesting to say about that also. Ask him. Nothing special, except one little remark, Ivan replied at once. European liberals in general, and even our liberal dilettanti, often mix up the final results of socialism with those of Christianity. This wild notion is, of course, a characteristic feature. But it's not only liberals and dilettanti who mix up socialism and Christianity, but, in many cases, it appears, the police, the foreign police, of course, do the same. Your Paris anecdote is rather to the point, Pyotr Alexandrovich. I ask your permission to drop this subject altogether, Myasov repeated. I will tell you instead, gentlemen, another interesting and rather characteristic anecdote of Ivan Fyodorovich himself. Only five days ago, in a gathering here, principally of ladies, he solemnly declared in argument that there was nothing in the whole world to make men love their neighbors. That there was no law of nature that man should love mankind, and that, if there had been any love on earth hitherto, it was not owing to a natural law, but simply because men have believed in immortality. Ivan Fyodorovich added in parenthesis that the whole natural law lies in that faith, and that if you were to destroy in mankind the belief in immortality, not only love but every living force maintaining the life of the world would at once be dried up. Moreover, nothing then would be immoral, everything would be lawful, even cannibalism. That's not all. He ended by asserting that for every individual, like ourselves, who does not believe in God or immortality, the moral law of nature must immediately be changed into the exact contrary of the former religious law, and that egoism, even to crime, must become not only lawful but even recognized as the inevitable, the most rational, even honorable outcome of his position. From this paradox, gentlemen, you can judge of the rest of our eccentric and paradoxical friend Ivan Fyodorovich's theories. Excuse me, Dmitri cried suddenly, if I've heard aright, crime must not only be permitted but even recognized as the inevitable and the most rational outcome of his position for every infidel. Is that so or not? Quite so, 
said Father Pacey, I'll remember it. Having uttered these words Dimitri ceased speaking as suddenly as he had begun. Everyone looked at him with curiosity. Is that really your conviction as to the consequences of the disappearance of the faith in immortality? The elder asked Ivan suddenly. Yes. That was my contention. There is no virtue if there is no immortality. You are blessed in believing that, or else most unhappy. Why unhappy? Ivan asked smiling. Because, in all probability you don't believe yourself in the immortality of your soul, nor in what you have written yourself in your article on church jurisdiction. Perhaps you are right. But I wasn't altogether joking, Ivan suddenly and strangely confessed, flushing quickly. You were not altogether joking. That's true. The question is still fretting your heart, and not answered. But the martyr likes sometimes to divert himself with his despair, as it were driven to it by despair itself. Meanwhile, in your despair, you, too, divert yourself with magazine articles, and discussions in society, though you don't believe your own arguments, and with an aching heart mock at them inwardly. That question you have not answered, and it is your great grief, for it clamors for an answer. But can it be answered by me? Answered in the affirmative? Ivan went on asking strangely, still looking at the elder with the same inexplicable smile. If it can't be decided in the affirmative, it will never be decided in the negative. You know that that is the peculiarity of your heart, and all its suffering is due to it. But thank the Creator who has given you a lofty heart capable of such suffering, of thinking and seeking higher things, for our dwelling is in the heavens. God grant that your heart will attain the answer on earth, and may God bless your path. The elder raised his hand and would have made the sign of the cross over Ivan from where he stood. But the latter rose from his seat, went up to him, received his blessing, and kissing his hand went back to his place in silence. His face looked firm and earnest. This action and all the preceding conversation, which was so surprising from Ivan, impressed everyone by its strangeness and a certain solemnity, so that all were silent for a moment, and there was a look almost of apprehension in Alyosha's face. But Mayasov suddenly shrugged his shoulders. And at the same moment Fyodor Pavlovich jumped up from his seat. Most pious and holy elder, he cried, pointing to Ivan, that is my son, flesh of my flesh, the dearest of my flesh. He is my most dutiful Karl Moore, so to speak, while this son who has just come in, Dmitri, against whom I am seeking justice from you, is the undutiful Franz Moore, they are both out of Schiller's robbers, and so I am the reigning Count von Moore. Judge and save us. We need not only your prayers but your prophecies. Speak without buffoonery, and don't begin by insulting the members of your family, answered the elder, in a faint, exhausted voice. He was obviously getting more and more fatigued, and his strength was failing. An unseemly farce which I foresaw when I came here, cried Dmitri indignantly. He too leapt up. Forgive it, reverend father, he added, addressing the elder. I am not a cultivated man, and I don't even know how to address you properly, but you have been deceived and you have been too good-natured in letting us meet here. All my father wants is a scandal. Why he wants it only he can tell. He always has some motive. But I believe I know why. They all blame me, all of them, cried Fyodor Pavlovich in his turn. Pyotr Alexandrovich here blames me too. You have been blaming me, Pyotr Alexandrovich, you have, he turned suddenly to Myasov, although the latter was not dreaming of interrupting him. They all accuse me of having hidden the children's money in my boots, and cheated them, but isn't there a court of law? There they will reckon out for you, Dmitri Fyodorovich, from your notes, your letters, and your agreements, how much money you had, how much you have spent, and how much you have left. Why does Pyotr Alexandrovich refuse to pass judgment? Dmitri is not a stranger to him. Because they are all against me, while Dmitri Fyodorovich is in debt to me, and not a little, but some thousands of which I have documentary proof. The whole town is echoing with his debaucheries. And where he was stationed before, he several times spent a thousand or two for the seduction of some respectable girl, we know all about that, Dmitri Fyodorovich, in its most secret details. I'll prove it. 
Would you believe it, Holy Father, he has captivated the heart of the most honorable of young ladies of good family and fortune, daughter of a gallant colonel, formerly his superior officer, who had received many honors and had the Anna Order on his breast. He compromised the girl by his promise of marriage, now she is an orphan and here, she is betrothed to him, yet before her very eyes he is dancing attendance on a certain enchantress. And although this enchantress has lived in, so to speak, civil marriage with a respectable man, yet she is of an independent character, an unapproachable fortress for everybody, just like a legal wife, for she is virtuous, yes, holy fathers, she is virtuous. Dmitri Fyodorovich wants to open this fortress with a golden key, and that's why he is insolent to me now, trying to get money from me, though he has wasted thousands on this enchantress already. He's continually borrowing money for the purpose. From whom do you think? Shall I say, Mitya? Be silent, cried Dmitri, wait till I'm gone. Don't dare in my presence to asperse the good name of an honorable girl. That you should utter a word about her is an outrage, and I won't permit it. He was breathless. Mitya! Mitya! cried Fyodor Pavlovich hysterically, squeezing out a tear. And is your father's blessing nothing to you? If I curse you, what then? Shameless hypocrite! exclaimed Dmitri furiously. He says that to his father. His father! What would he be with others? Gentlemen, only fancy, there's a poor but honorable man living here, burdened with a numerous family, a captain who got into trouble and was discharged from the army, but not publicly, not by court-martial, with no slur on his honor. And three weeks ago, Dmitri seized him by the beard in a tavern, dragged him out into the street and beat him publicly, and all because he is an agent in a little business of mine. It's all a lie. Outwardly it's the truth, but inwardly a lie. Dmitri was trembling with rage. Father, I don't justify my action. Yes, I confess it publicly, I behaved like a brute to that captain, and I regret it now, and I'm disgusted with myself for my brutal rage. But this captain, this agent of yours, went to that lady whom you call an enchantress, and suggested to her from you, that she should take IOUs of mine which were in your possession, and should sue me for the money so as to get me into prison by means of them, if I persisted in claiming an account from you of my property. Now you reproach me for having a weakness for that lady when you yourself incited her to captivate me. She told me so to my face. She told me the story and laughed at you. You wanted to put me in prison because you are jealous of me with her, because you'd begun to force your attentions upon her, and I know all about that, too, she laughed at you for that as well, you hear, she laughed at you as she described it. So here you have this man, this father who reproaches his profligate son. Gentlemen, forgive my anger, but I foresaw that this crafty old man would only bring you together to create a scandal. I had come to forgive him if he held out his hand, to forgive him, and ask forgiveness. But as he has just this minute insulted not only me, but an honorable young lady, for whom I feel such reverence that I dare not take her name in vain, I have made up my mind to show up his game, though he is my father. He could not go on. His eyes were glittering and he breathed with difficulty. But everyone in the cell was stirred. All except Father Zosima got up from their seats uneasily. The monks looked austere but waited for guidance from the elder. He sat still, pale, not from excitement but from the weakness of disease. An imploring smile lighted up his face, from time to time he raised his hand, as though to check the storm, and, of course, a gesture from him would have been enough to end the scene, but he seemed to be waiting for something and watched them intently as though trying to make out something which was not perfectly clear to him. At last Myasov felt completely humiliated and disgraced. We are all to blame for this scandalous scene, he said hotly. But I did not foresee it when I came, though I knew with whom I had to deal. This must be stopped at once. Believe me, your reverence, I had no precise knowledge of the details that have just come to light, I was unwilling to believe them, and I learned for the first time. A father is jealous of his son's relations with a woman of loose behavior and intrigues with the creature to get his son into prison. This is the company in which I have been forced to be present. I was deceived. I declare to you all that I was as much deceived as any one. 
Dmitry Fyodorovich, yelled Fyodor Pavlovich suddenly, in an unnatural voice, if you were not my son I would challenge you this instant to a duel, with pistols, at three paces, across a handkerchief, he ended, stamping with both feet. With old liars who have been acting all their lives there are moments when they enter so completely into their part that they tremble or shed tears of emotion in earnest, although at that very moment, or a second later, they are able to whisper to themselves, you know you are lying, you shameless old sinner. You're acting now, in spite of your holy wrath. Dmitri frowned painfully, and looked with unutterable contempt at his father. I thought. I thought, he said, in a soft and, as it were, controlled voice, that I was coming to my native place with the angel of my heart, my betrothed, to cherish his old age, and I find nothing but a depraved profligate, a despicable clown. A duel, yelled the old wretch again, breathless and spluttering at each syllable. And you, Pyotr Alexandrovich Myasov, let me tell you that there has never been in all your family a loftier, and more honest, you hear, more honest woman than this creature, as you have dared to call her. And you, Dmitri Fyodorovich, have abandoned your betrothed for that creature, so you must yourself have thought that your betrothed couldn't hold a candle to her. That's the woman called a creature. Shameful, broke from Father Iasif. Shameful and disgraceful. Kalganov, flushing crimson, cried in a boyish voice, trembling with emotion. He had been silent till that moment. Why is such a man alive? Dmitri, beside himself with rage, growled in a hollow voice, hunching up his shoulders till he looked almost deformed. Tell me, can he be allowed to go on defiling the earth? He looked round at everyone and pointed at the old man. He spoke evenly and deliberately. Listen, listen, monks, to the parricide, cried Fyodor Pavlovich, rushing up to Father Iasif. That's the answer to your shameful. What is shameful? That creature, that woman of loose behavior, is perhaps holier than you are yourselves, you monks who are seeking salvation. She fell perhaps in her youth, ruined by her environment. But she loved much, and Christ himself forgave the woman, who loved much. It was not for such love Christ forgave her, broke impatiently from the gentle father Iasif. Yes, it was for such, monks, it was. You save your souls here, eating cabbage, and think you are the righteous. You eat a gudgeon a day, and you think you bribe God with gudgeon. This is unendurable, was heard on all sides in the cell, but this unseemly scene was cut short in a most unexpected way. Father Zosima rose suddenly from his seat. Almost distracted with anxiety for the elder and everyone else, Alyosha succeeded, however, in supporting him by the arm. Father Zosima moved towards Dmitri and reaching him sank on his knees before him. Alyosha thought that he had fallen from weakness, but this was not so. The elder distinctly and deliberately bowed down at Dmitri's feet till his forehead touched the floor. Alyosha was so astounded that he failed to assist him when he got up again. There was a faint smile on his lips. Goodbye. Forgive me, all of you, he said, bowing on all sides to his guests. Dmitri stood for a few moments in amazement. Bowing down to him, what did it mean? Suddenly he cried aloud, Oh, God, hid his face in his hands, and rushed out of the room. All the guests flocked out after him, in their confusion not saying goodbye, or bowing to their host. Only the monks went up to him again for a blessing. What did it mean, falling at his feet like that? Was it symbolic or what, said Fyodor Pavlovich, suddenly quieted and trying to reopen conversation without venturing to address anybody in particular. They were all passing out of the precincts of the hermitage at the moment. I can't answer for a madhouse and for madmen, Mayasov answered at once ill-humouredly, but I will spare myself your company, Fyodor Pavlovich, and, trust me, forever. Where's that monk? That monk, that is, the monk who had invited them to dine with the superior, did not keep them waiting. He met them as soon as they came down the steps from the elder's cell, as though he had been waiting for them all the time. Reverend Father, kindly do me a favor. Convey my deepest respect to the Father Superior, apologize for me, personally, 
Myasov, to his reverence, telling him that I deeply regret that owing to unforeseen circumstances I am unable to have the honor of being present at his table, greatly as I should desire to do so, Myasov said irritably to the monk. And that unforeseen circumstance, of course, is myself, Fyodor Pavlovich cut in immediately. Do you hear, father, this gentleman doesn't want to remain in my company or else he'd come at once. And you shall go, Pyotr Alexandrovich, pray go to the father superior and good appetite to you. I will decline, and not you. Home, home, I'll eat at home, I don't feel equal to it here, Pyotr Alexandrovich, my amiable relative. I am not your relative and never have been, you contemptible man. I said it on purpose to madden you, because you always disclaim the relationship, though you really are a relation in spite of your shuffling. I'll prove it by the church calendar. As for you, Ivan, stay if you like. I'll send the horses for you later. Propriety requires you to go to the father superior, Pyotr Alexandrovich, to apologize for the disturbance we've been making. Is it true that you are going home? Aren't you lying? Pyotr Alexandrovich. How could I dare after what's happened? Forgive me, gentlemen, I was carried away. And upset besides. And, indeed, I am ashamed. Gentlemen, one man has the heart of Alexander of Macedon and another the heart of the little dog Fido. Mine is that of the little dog Fido. I am ashamed. After such an escapade how can I go to dinner, to gobble up the monastery's sauces? I am ashamed. I can't. You must excuse me. The devil only knows, what if he deceives us, thought Myasov, still hesitating, and watching the retreating buffoon with distrustful eyes. The latter turned round, and noticing that Myasov was watching him, waved him a kiss. Well, are you coming to the superior? Myasov asked Ivan abruptly. Why not? I was especially invited yesterday. Unfortunately I feel myself compelled to go to this confounded dinner, said Myasov with the same irritability, regardless of the fact that the monk was listening. We ought, at least, to apologize for the disturbance, and explain that it was not our doing. What do you think? Yes, we must explain that it wasn't our doing. Besides, father won't be there, observed Ivan. Well, I should hope not. Confound this dinner. They all walked on, however. The monk listened in silence. On the road through the copse he made one observation however, that the father superior had been waiting a long time, and that they were more than half an hour late. He received no answer. Myasov looked with hatred at Ivan. Here he is, going to the dinner as though nothing had happened, he thought. A brazen face, and the conscience of a Karamazov. Chapter 7 a young man bent on a career. Alyosha helped Father Zosima to his bedroom and seated him on his bed. It was a little room furnished with the bare necessities. There was a narrow iron bedstead, with a strip of felt for a mattress. In the corner, under the icons, was a reading desk with a cross and the gospel lying on it. The elder sank exhausted on the bed. His eyes glittered and he breathed hard. He looked intently at Alyosha, as though considering something. Go, my dear boy, go. Porphyry is enough for me. Make haste, you are needed there, go and wait at the father superior's table. Let me stay here, Alyosha entreated. You are more needed there. There is no peace there. You will wait, and be of service. If evil spirits rise up, repeat a prayer. And remember, my son, the elder liked to call him that, this is not the place for you in the future. When it is God's will to call me, leave the monastery. Go away for good. Alyosha started. What is it? This is not your place for the time. I bless you for great service in the world. Yours will be a long pilgrimage. And you will have to take a wife, too. You will have to bear all before you come back. There will be much to do. But I don't doubt of you, and so I send you forth. Christ is with you. Do not abandon him and he will not abandon you. You will see great sorrow, and in that sorrow you will be happy. This is my last message to you, 
in sorrow seek happiness. Work, work unceasingly. Remember my words, for although I shall talk with you again, not only my days but my hours are numbered. Alyosha's face again betrayed strong emotion. The corners of his mouth quivered. What is it again? Father Zosima asked, smiling gently. The worldly may follow the dead with tears, but here we rejoice over the Father who is departing. We rejoice and pray for him. Leave me, I must pray. Go, and make haste. Be near your brothers. And not near one only, but near both. Father Zosima raised his hand to bless him. Alyosha could make no protest, though he had a great longing to remain. He longed, moreover, to ask the significance of his bowing to Dmitri, the question was on the tip of his tongue, but he dared not ask it. He knew that the elder would have explained it unasked if he had thought fit. But evidently it was not his will. That action had made a terrible impression on Alyosha, he believed blindly in its mysterious significance. Mysterious, and perhaps awful. As he hastened out of the hermitage precincts to reach the monastery in time to serve at the Father Superior's dinner, he felt a sudden pang at his heart, and stopped short. He seemed to hear again Father Zosima's words, foretelling his approaching end. What he had foretold so exactly must infallibly come to pass. Alyosha believed that implicitly. But how could he be left without him? How could he live without seeing and hearing him? Where should he go? He had told him not to weep, and to leave the monastery. Good God! It was long since Alyosha had known such anguish. He hurried through the copse that divided the monastery from the hermitage, and unable to bear the burden of his thoughts, he gazed at the ancient pines beside the path. He had not far to go, about five hundred paces. He expected to meet no one at that hour, but at the first turn of the path he noticed Rakitin. He was waiting for someone. Are you waiting for me? asked Alyosha, overtaking him. Yes, grinned Rakitin. You are hurrying to the Father Superior, I know, he has a banquet. There's not been such a banquet since the Superior entertained the Bishop and General Pahatov, do you remember? I shan't be there, but you go and hand the sauces. Tell me one thing, Alexei, what does that vision mean? That's what I want to ask you. What vision? That bowing to your brother, Dmitri. And didn't he tap the ground with his forehead, too? You speak of Father Zosima? Yes, of Father Zosima. Tapped the ground? Ah, an irreverent expression. Well, what of it? Anyway, what does that vision mean? I don't know what it means, Misha. I knew he wouldn't explain it to you. There's nothing wonderful about it, of course, only the usual holy mummery. But there was an object in the performance. All the pious people in the town will talk about it and spread the story through the province, wondering what it meant. To my thinking the old man really has a keen nose, he sniffed a crime. Your house stinks of it. What crime? Rakuten evidently had something he was eager to speak of. It'll be in your family, this crime. Between your brothers and your rich old father. So Father Zosima flopped down to be ready for what may turn up. If something happens later on, it'll be, ah, the holy man foresaw it, prophesied it, though it's a poor sort of prophecy, flopping like that. Ah, but it was symbolic, they'll say, an allegory, and the devil knows what all. It'll be remembered to his glory, he predicted the crime and marked the criminal. That's always the way with these crazy fanatics, they cross themselves at the tavern and throw stones at the temple. Like your elder, he takes a stick to a just man and falls at the feet of a murderer. What crime? What murderer? What do you mean? Alyosha stopped dead. Rakitin stopped, too. What murderer? As though you didn't know. I'll bet you've thought of it before. That's interesting, too, by the way. Listen, Alyosha, you always speak the truth, though you're always between two stools. Have you thought of it or not? Answer. I have, answered Alyosha in a low voice. Even Rakitin was taken aback. What? Have you really, 
he cried, I. I've not exactly thought it, muttered Alyosha, but directly you began speaking so strangely, I fancied I had thought of it myself. You see. And how well you expressed it. Looking at your father and your brother Mitya today you thought of a crime. Then I'm not mistaken. But wait, wait a minute, Alyosha broke in uneasily. What has led you to see all this? Why does it interest you? That's the first question. Two questions, disconnected, but natural. I'll deal with them separately. What led me to see it? I shouldn't have seen it, if I hadn't suddenly understood your brother Dmitri, seen right into the very heart of him all at once. I caught the whole man from one trait. These very honest but passionate people have a line which mustn't be crossed. If it were, he'd run at your father with a knife. But your father's a drunken and abandoned old sinner, who can never draw the line, if they both let themselves go, they'll both come to grief. No, Misha, no. If that's all, you've reassured me. It won't come to that. But why are you trembling? Let me tell you, he may be honest, our Mitya, he is stupid, but honest, but he's, a sensualist. That's the very definition and inner essence of him. It's your father has handed him on his low sensuality. Do you know, I simply wonder at you, Alyosha, how you can have kept your purity. You're a Karamazov too, you know. In your family sensuality is carried to a disease. But now, these three sensualists are watching one another, with their knives in their belts. The three of them are knocking their heads together, and you may be the fourth. You are mistaken about that woman. Dmitri, despises her, said Alyosha, with a sort of shudder. Grushenka. No, brother, he doesn't despise her. Since he has openly abandoned his betrothed for her, he doesn't despise her. There's something here, my dear boy, that you don't understand yet. A man will fall in love with some beauty, with a woman's body, or even with a part of a woman's body, a sensualist can understand that, and he'll abandon his own children for her, sell his father and mother, and his country, Russia, too. If he's honest, he'll steal, if he's humane, he'll murder, if he's faithful, he'll deceive. Pushkin, the poet of women's feet, son of their feet in his verse. Others don't sing their praises, but they can't look at their feet without a thrill, and it's not only their feet. Contempt's no help here, brother, even if he did despise Grushenka. He does, but he can't tear himself away. I understand that, Alyosha jerked out suddenly, really? Well, I dare say you do understand, since you blurted out at the first word, said Rakitin, malignantly. That escaped you unawares, and the confession's the more precious. So it's a familiar subject, you've thought about it already, about sensuality, I mean. Oh, you virgin soul. You're a quiet one, Alyosha, you're a saint, I know, but the devil only knows what you've thought about, and what you know already. You are pure, but you've been down into the depths. I've been watching you a long time. You're a Karamaz of yourself, you're a thorough Karamazov, no doubt birth and selection have something to answer for. You're a sensualist from your father, a crazy saint from your mother. Why do you tremble? Is it true, then? Do you know, Grushenka has been begging me to bring you along. I'll pull off his cassock, she says. You can't think how she keeps begging me to bring you. I wondered why she took such an interest in you. Do you know, she's an extraordinary woman, too. Thank her and say I'm not coming, said Alyosha, with a strained smile. Finish what you were saying, Misha. I'll tell you my idea after. There's nothing to finish. It's all clear. It's the same old tune, brother. If even you are a sensualist at heart, what of your brother, Ivan? He's a Karamazov, too. What is at the root of all you Karamazovs is that you're all sensual, grasping and crazy. Your brother Ivan writes theological articles in joke, for some idiotic, unknown motive of his own, though he's an atheist, and he admits it's a fraud himself, that's your brother Ivan. He's trying to get Mitya's betrothed for himself, and I fancy he'll succeed, too. And what's more, 
it's with Mitya's consent. For Mitya will surrender his betrothed to him to be rid of her, and escape to Grushenka. And he's ready to do that in spite of all his nobility and disinterestedness. Observe that. Those are the most fatal people. Who the devil can make you out? He recognizes his vileness and goes on with it. Let me tell you, too, the old man, your father, is standing in Mitya's way now. He has suddenly gone crazy over Grushenka. His mouth waters at the sight of her. It's simply on her account he made that scene in the cell just now, simply because Myasov called her an abandoned creature. He's worse than a tomcat in love. At first she was only employed by him in connection with his taverns and in some other shady business, but now he has suddenly realized all she is and has gone wild about her. He keeps pestering her with his offers, not honorable ones, of course. And they'll come into collision, the precious father and son, on that path. But Grushenka favors neither of them, she's still playing with them, and teasing them both, considering which she can get most out of. For though she could filch a lot of money from the papa he wouldn't marry her, and maybe he'll turn stingy in the end, and keep his purse shut. That's where Mitya's value comes in, he has no money, but he's ready to marry her. Yes, ready to marry her. To abandon his betrothed, a rare beauty, Katerina Ivanovna, who's rich, and the daughter of a colonel, and to marry Grushenka, who has been the mistress of a dissolute old merchant, Samsonov, a coarse, uneducated, provincial mayor. Some murderous conflict may well come to pass from all this, and that's what your brother Ivan is waiting for. It would suit him down to the ground. He'll carry off Katerina Ivanovna, for whom he is languishing, and pocket her dowry of sixty thousand. That's very alluring to start with, for a man of no consequence and a beggar. And, take note, he won't be wronging Mitya, but doing him the greatest service. For I know as a fact that Mitya only last week, when he was with some gypsy girls drunk in a tavern, cried out aloud that he was unworthy of his betrothed, Katya, but that his brother Ivan, he was the man who deserved her. And Katerina Ivanovna will not in the end refuse such a fascinating man as Ivan. She's hesitating between the two of them already. And how has that Ivan won you all, so that you all worship him? He is laughing at you, and enjoying himself at your expense. How do you know? How can you speak so confidently? Alyosha asked sharply, frowning. Why do you ask, and are frightened at my answer? It shows that you know I'm speaking the truth. You don't like Ivan. Ivan wouldn't be tempted by money. Really? And the beauty of Katerina Ivanovna? It's not only the money, though a fortune of sixty thousand is an attraction. Ivan is above that. He wouldn't make up to anyone for thousands. It is not money, it's not comfort Ivan is seeking. Perhaps it's suffering he is seeking. What wild dream now? Oh, you! aristocrats. Ah, Misha, he has a stormy spirit. His mind is in bondage. He is haunted by a great, unsolved doubt. He is one of those who don't want millions, but an answer to their questions. That's plagiarism, Alyosha. You're quoting your elders' phrases. Ah, Ivan has set you a problem, cried Rakitin, with undisguised malice. His face changed, and his lips twitched. And the problem's a stupid one. It is no good guessing it. Rack your brains, you'll understand it. His article is absurd and ridiculous. And did you hear his stupid theory just now, if there's no immortality of the soul, then there's no virtue, and everything is lawful. And by the way, do you remember how your brother Mitya cried out, I will remember. An attractive theory for scoundrels, I'm being abusive, that's stupid. Not for scoundrels, but for pedantic poseurs, haunted by profound, unsolved doubts. He's showing off, and what it all comes to is, on the one hand we cannot but admit and on the other it must be confessed. His whole theory is a fraud. Humanity will find in itself the power to live for virtue even without believing in immortality. It will find it in love for freedom, for equality, for fraternity. Rakitin could hardly restrain himself in his heat, but, suddenly, as though remembering something, he stopped short. 
Well, that's enough, he said, with a still more crooked smile. Why are you laughing? Do you think I'm a vulgar fool? No, I never dreamed of thinking you a vulgar fool. You are clever but, never mind, I was silly to smile. I understand you're getting hot about it, Misha. I guess from your warmth that you are not indifferent to Katerina Ivanovna yourself, I've suspected that for a long time, brother, that's why you don't like my brother Ivan. Are you jealous of him? And jealous of her money, too? Won't you add that? I'll say nothing about money. I am not going to insult you. I believe it, since you say so, but confound you, and your brother Ivan with you. Don't you understand that one might very well dislike him, apart from Katerina Ivanovna? And why the devil should I like him? He condescends to abuse me, you know. Why haven't I a right to abuse him? I never heard of his saying anything about you, good or bad. He doesn't speak of you at all. But I heard that the day before yesterday at Katerina Ivanovna's he was abusing me for all he was worth, you see what an interest he takes in your humble servant. And which is the jealous one after that, brother, I can't say. He was so good as to express the opinion that, if I don't go in for the career of an Archimandrite in the immediate future and don't become a monk, I shall be sure to go to Petersburg and get on to some solid magazine as a reviewer, that I shall write for the next ten years, and in the end become the owner of the magazine, and bring it out on the liberal and atheistic side, with a socialistic tinge, with a tiny gloss of socialism, but keeping a sharp look out all the time, that is, keeping in. With both sides and hoodwinking the fools, according to your brother's account, the tinge of socialism won't hinder me from laying by the proceeds and investing them under the guidance of some Jew, till at the end of my career I build a great house in Petersburg and move my publishing offices to it, and let out the upper stories to lodgers. He has even chosen the place for it, near the new stone bridge across the Neva, which they say is to be built in Petersburg. Ah, Misha, that's just what will really happen, every word of it, cried Alyosha, unable to restrain a good-humoured smile. You are pleased to be sarcastic, too, Alexei Fyodorovich. No, no, I'm joking, forgive me. I've something quite different in my mind. But, excuse me, who can have told you all this? You can't have been at Katerina Ivanovna's yourself when he was talking about you. I wasn't there, but Dmitri Fyodorovich was, and I heard him tell it with my own ears, if you want to know, he didn't tell me, but I overheard him, unintentionally, of course, for I was sitting in Grushenka's bedroom and I couldn't go away because Dmitri Fyodorovich was in the next room. Oh, yes, I'd forgotten she was a relation of yours. A relation. That Grushenka a relation of mine, cried Rakitin, turning crimson. Are you mad? You're out of your mind. Why, isn't she a relation of yours? I heard so. Where can you have heard it? You Karamazovs brag of being an ancient, noble family, though your father used to run about playing the buffoon at other men's tables, and was only admitted to the kitchen as a favor. I may be only a priest's son, and dirt in the eyes of noblemen like you, but don't insult me so lightly and wantonly. I have a sense of honor, too, Alexei Fyodorovich, I couldn't be a relation of Grushenka, a common harlot. I beg you to understand that. Rakitin was intensely irritated. Forgive me, for goodness sake, I had no idea, besides, how can you call her a harlot? Is she, that sort of woman? Alyosha flushed suddenly. I tell you again, I heard that she was a relation of yours. You often go to see her, and you told me yourself you're not her lover. I never dreamed that you of all people had such contempt for her. Does she really deserve it? I may have reasons of my own for visiting her. That's not your business. But as for relationship, your brother, or even your father, is more likely to make her yours than mine. Well, here we are. You'd better go to the kitchen. Hello. What's wrong, what is it? Are we late? They can't have finished dinner so soon. Have the Karamazovs been making trouble again? No doubt they have. Here's your father and your brother Ivan after him. They've broken out from the father superiors. And look, 
Father Isidore is shouting out something after them from the steps. And your father's shouting and waving his arms. I expect he's swearing. Bah, and there goes Myasov driving away in his carriage. You see, he's going. And there's old Maximov running, there must have been a row. There can't have been any dinner. Surely they've not been beating the father superior. Or have they, perhaps, been beaten? It would serve them right. There was reason for Rakitin's exclamations. There had been a scandalous, an unprecedented scene. It had all come from the impulse of a moment. Chapter 8 The Scandalous Scene Myasov, as a man of breeding and delicacy, could not but feel some inward qualms, when he reached the father superiors with Ivan, he felt ashamed of having lost his temper. He felt that he ought to have disdained that despicable wretch, Fyodor Pavlovich, too much to have been upset by him in Father Zosima's cell, and so to have forgotten himself. The monks were not to blame, in any case, he reflected, on the steps. And if they're decent people here, and the Father Superior, I understand, is a nobleman, why not be friendly and courteous with them? I won't argue, I'll fall in with everything, I'll win them by politeness, and, and, show them that I've nothing to do with that Aesop, that buffoon, that Pierrot, and have merely been taken in over this affair, just as they have. He determined to drop his litigation with the monastery, and relinquish his claims to the woodcutting and fishery rights at once. He was the more ready to do this because the rights had become much less valuable, and he had indeed the vaguest idea where the wood and river in question were. These excellent intentions were strengthened when he entered the Father Superior's dining room, though, strictly speaking, it was not a dining room, for the Father Superior had only two rooms altogether, they were, however, much larger and more comfortable than Father Zosima's. But there was no great luxury about the furnishing of these rooms either. The furniture was of mahogany, covered with leather, in the old-fashioned style of 1820, the floor was not even stained, but everything was shining with cleanliness, and there were many choice flowers in the windows, the most sumptuous thing in the room at the moment was, of course, the beautifully decorated table. The cloth was clean, the service shone, there were three kinds of well-baked bread, two bottles of wine, two of excellent mead, and a large glass jug of kvass, both the latter made in the monastery, and famous in the neighborhood. There was no vodka. Rakitin related afterwards that there were five dishes, fish soup made of sterlets, served with little fish patties, then boiled fish served in a special way, then salmon cutlets, ice pudding and compote, and finally, blanc mange. Rakitin found out about all these good things, for he could not resist peeping into the kitchen, where he already had a footing. He had a footing everywhere, and got information about everything. He was of an uneasy and envious temper. He was well aware of his own considerable abilities, and nervously exaggerated them in his self-conceit. He knew he would play a prominent part of some sort, but Alyosha, who was attached to him, was distressed to see that his friend Rakitin was dishonorable, and quite unconscious of being so himself, considering, on the contrary, that because he would not steal money left on the table he was a man of the highest integrity. Neither Alyosha nor anyone else could have influenced him in that. Rakitin, of course, was a person of too little consequence to be invited to the dinner, to which Father Iasif, Father Pacey, and one other monk were the only inmates of the monastery invited. They were already waiting when Myasov, Kalganov, and Ivan arrived. The other guest, Maximov, stood a little aside, waiting also. The father superior stepped into the middle of the room to receive his guests. He was a tall, thin, but still vigorous old man, with black hair streaked with grey, and a long, grave, ascetic face. He bowed to his guests in silence. But this time they approached to receive his blessing. Myasov even tried to kiss his hand, but the father superior drew it back in time to avoid the salute. But Ivan and Kalganov went through the ceremony in the most simple-hearted and complete manner, kissing his hand as peasants do. We must apologize most humbly, your reverence, began Myasov, simpering affably, and speaking in a dignified and respectful tone. Pardon us for having come alone without the gentleman you invited, Fyodor Pavlovich. He felt obliged to decline the honor of your hospitality, and not without reason. 
In the Reverend Father Zosima's cell he was carried away by the unhappy dissension with his son, and let fall words which were quite out of keeping, in fact, quite unseemly, as, he glanced at the monks, your reverence is, no doubt, already aware. And therefore, recognizing that he had been to blame, he felt sincere regret and shame, and begged me, and his son Ivan Fyodorovich, to convey to you his apologies and regrets. In brief, he hopes and desires to make amends later. He asks your blessing, and begs you to forget what has taken place. As he uttered the last word of his tirade, Mayasov completely recovered his self-complacency, and all traces of his former irritation disappeared. He fully and sincerely loved humanity again. The Father Superior listened to him with dignity, and, with a slight bend of the head, replied. I sincerely deplore his absence. Perhaps at our table he might have learned to like us, and we him. Pray be seated, gentlemen. He stood before the holy image, and began to say grace, aloud. All bent their heads reverently, and Maximov clasped his hands before him, with peculiar fervor. It was at this moment that Fyodor Pavlovich played his last prank. It must be noted that he really had meant to go home, and really had felt the impossibility of going to dine with the Father Superior as though nothing had happened, after his disgraceful behavior in the elder's cell. Not that he was so very much ashamed of himself, quite the contrary perhaps. But still he felt it would be unseemly to go to dinner. Yet his creaking carriage had hardly been brought to the steps of the hotel, and he had hardly got into it, when he suddenly stopped short. He remembered his own words at the elders, I always feel when I meet people that I am lower than all, and that they all take me for a buffoon, so I say let me play the buffoon, for you are, every one of you, stupider and lower than I. He longed to revenge himself on every one for his own unseemliness. He suddenly recalled how he had once in the past been asked, why do you hate so and so, so much? And he had answered them, with his shameless impudence, I'll tell you. He has done me no harm. But I played him a dirty trick, and ever since I have hated him. Remembering that now, he smiled quietly and malignantly, hesitating for a moment. His eyes gleamed, and his lips positively quivered. Well, since I have begun, I may as well go on, he decided. His predominant sensation at that moment might be expressed in the following words, well, there is no rehabilitating myself now. So let me shame them for all I am worth. I will show them I don't care what they think, that's all. He told the coachman to wait, while with rapid steps he returned to the monastery and straight to the father superiors. He had no clear idea what he would do, but he knew that he could not control himself, and that a touch might drive him to the utmost limits of obscenity, but only to obscenity, to nothing criminal, nothing for which he could be legally punished. In the last resort, he could always restrain himself, and had marveled indeed at himself, on that score, sometimes. He appeared in the Father Superior's dining room, at the moment when the prayer was over, and all were moving to the table. Standing in the doorway, he scanned the company, and laughing his prolonged, impudent, malicious chuckle, looked them all boldly in the face. They thought I had gone, and here I am again, he cried to the whole room. For one moment every one stared at him without a word, and at once every one felt that something revolting, grotesque, positively scandalous, was about to happen. Mayasov passed immediately from the most benevolent frame of mind to the most savage. All the feelings that had subsided and died down in his heart revived instantly. No. This I cannot endure, he cried. I absolutely cannot. And. I certainly cannot. The blood rushed to his head. He positively stammered, but he was beyond thinking of style, and he seized his hat. What is it he cannot, cried Fyodor Pavlovich, that he absolutely cannot and certainly cannot. Your reverence, am I to come in or not? Will you receive me as your guest? You are welcome with all my heart, answered the superior. Gentlemen, he added, I venture to beg you most earnestly to lay aside your dissensions, and to be united in love and family harmony, with prayer to the Lord at our humble table. No, no, it is impossible, cried Mayasov, beside himself. Well, if it is impossible for Pyotr Alexandrovich, 
it is impossible for me, and I won't stop. That is why I came. I will keep with Pyotr Alexandrovich everywhere now. If you will go away, Pyotr Alexandrovich, I will go away too, if you remain, I will remain. You stun him by what you said about family harmony, Father Superior, he does not admit he is my relation. That's right, isn't it, Vaughn Sohn? Here's Vaughn Sohn. How are you, Vaughn Sohn? Do you mean me, muttered Maximov, puzzled. Of course I mean you, cried Fyodor Pavlovich. Who else? The Father Superior could not be Vaughn Sohn. But I am not Vaughn Sohn either. I am Maximov. No, you are Vaughn Sohn. Your Reverence, do you know who Vaughn Sohn was? It was a famous murder case. He was killed in a house of harlotry, I believe that is what such places are called among you, he was killed and robbed, and in spite of his venerable age, he was nailed up in a box and sent from Petersburg to Moscow in the luggage van, and while they were nailing him up, the harlot sang songs and played the harp, that is to say, the piano. So this is that very Vaughn Sohn. He has risen from the dead, hasn't he, Vaughn Sohn? What is happening? What's this? Voices were heard in the group of monks. Let us go, cried Myasov, addressing Kalganov. No, excuse me, Fyodor Pavlovich broke in shrilly, taking another step into the room. Allow me to finish. There in the cell you blamed me for behaving disrespectfully just because I spoke of eating gudgeon, Pyotr Alexandrovich. Myasov, my relation, prefers to have plus de noblesse que de sincerite in his words, but I prefer in mine plus de sincerite que de noblesse, and, damn the noblesse. That's right, isn't it, Vaughn Sohn? Allow me, Father Superior, though I am a buffoon and play the buffoon, yet I am the soul of honor, and I want to speak my mind. Yes, I am the soul of honor, while in Pyotr Alexandrovich there is wounded vanity and nothing else. I came here perhaps to have a look and speak my mind. My son, Alexei, is here, being saved. I am his father, I care for his welfare, and it is my duty to care. While I've been playing the fool, I have been listening and having a look on the sly, and now I want to give you the last act of the performance. You know how things are with us. As a thing falls, so it lies. As a thing once has fallen, so it must lie forever. Not a bit of it. I want to get up again. Holy Father, I am indignant with you. Confession is a great sacrament, before which I am ready to bow down reverently, but there in the cell, they all kneel down and confess aloud. Can it be right to confess aloud? It was ordained by the Holy Fathers to confess in secret, then only your confession will be a mystery, and so it was of old. But how can I explain to him before everyone that I did this and that, well, you understand what, sometimes it would not be proper to talk about it, so it is really a scandal. No, fathers, one might be carried along with you to the flagellants, I dare say, at the first opportunity one shall write to the synod, and I shall take my son, Alexei, home. We must note here that Fyodor Pavlovich knew where to look for the weak spot. There had been at one time malicious rumors which had even reached the archbishop, not only regarding our monastery, but in others where the institution of elders existed, that too much respect was paid to the elders, even to the detriment of the authority of the superior, that the elders abused the sacrament of confession and so on and so on, absurd charges which had died away of themselves everywhere. But the spirit of folly, which had caught up Fyodor Pavlovich, and was bearing him on the current of his own nerves into lower and lower depths of ignominy, prompted him with this old slander. Fyodor Pavlovich did not understand a word of it, and he could not even put it sensibly, for on this occasion no one had been kneeling and confessing aloud in the elder's cell, so that he could not have seen anything of the kind. He was only speaking from confused memory of old slanders, but as soon as he had uttered his foolish tirade, he felt he had been talking absurd nonsense, and at once longed to prove to his audience, and above all to himself, that he had not been talking nonsense. And, though he knew perfectly well that with each word he would be adding more and more absurdity, he could not restrain himself, and plunged forward blindly. How disgraceful, cried Pyotr Alexandrovich. Pardon me, said the Father Superior. It was said of old, 
many have begun to speak against me and have uttered evil sayings about me. And hearing it I have said to myself, It is the correction of the Lord and He has sent it to heal my vain soul. And so we humbly thank you, honored guest, and he made Fyodor Pavlovich a low bow, tut, 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 sanctimoniousness and stock phrases. Old phrases and old gestures. The old lies and formal prostrations. We know all about them. A kiss on the lips and a dagger in the heart, as in Schiller's robbers. I don't like falsehood, fathers, I want the truth. But the truth is not to be found in eating gudgeon and that I proclaim aloud. Father monks, why do you fast? Why do you expect reward in heaven for that? Why, for reward like that I will come and fast too? No, saintly monk, you try being virtuous in the world, do good to society, without shutting yourself up in a monastery at other people's expense, and without expecting a reward up aloft for it, you'll find that a bit harder. I can talk sense, too, Father Superior. What have they got here? He went up to the table. Old port wine, mead brewed by the Elisiev brothers. Fie, fie, fathers. That is something beyond gudgeon. Look at the bottles the fathers have brought out, he he he. And who has provided it all? The Russian peasant, the laborer, brings here the farthing earned by his horny hand, wringing it from his family in the tax gatherer. You bleed the people, you know, holy fathers. This is too disgraceful, said Father Iasif. Father Pacey kept obstinately silent. Myasov rushed from the room, and Kalganov after him. Well, Father, I will follow Pyotr Alexandrovich. I am not coming to see you again. You may beg me on your knees, I shan't come. I send you a thousand rubles, so you have begun to keep your eye on me. He he he. No, I'll say no more. I am taking my revenge for my youth, for all the humiliation I endured. He thunked the table with his fist in a paroxysm of simulated feeling. This monastery has played a great part in my life. It has cost me many bitter tears. You used to set my wife, the crazy one, against me. You cursed me with bell and book, you spread stories about me all over the place. Enough, fathers. This is the age of liberalism, the age of steamers and railways. Neither a thousand, nor a hundred rubles, no, nor a hundred farthings will you get out of me. It must be noted again that our monastery never had played any great part in his life, and he never had shed a bitter tear owing to it. But he was so carried away by his simulated emotion, that he was for one moment almost believing it himself. He was so touched he was almost weeping. But at that very instant, he felt that it was time to draw back. The Father Superior bowed his head at his malicious lie, and again spoke impressively. It is written again, Bear circumspectly and gladly dishonor that cometh upon thee by no act of thine own, be not confounded and hate not him who hath dishonored thee. And so will we. Tut, tut, tut. Bethinking thyself and the rest of the rigmarole. Bethink yourselves, fathers, I will go. But I will take my son, Alexei, away from here forever, on my parental authority. Ivan Fyodorovich, my most dutiful son, permit me to order you to follow me. Vaughn Sohn, what have you to stay for? Come and see me now in the town. It is fun there. It is only one short verst, instead of Lenten oil, I will give you sucking pig and kasha. We will have dinner with some brandy and liqueur to it. I've cloudberry wine. Hey, Vaughn Sohn, don't lose your chance. He went out, shouting and gesticulating. It was at that moment Rakitin saw him and pointed him out to Alyosha. Alexei, his father shouted, from far off, catching sight of him. You come home to me today, for good, and bring your pillow and mattress, and leave no trace behind. Alyosha stood rooted to the spot, watching the scene in silence. Meanwhile, Fyodor Pavlovich had got into the carriage, and Ivan was about to follow him in grim silence without even turning to say goodbye to Alyosha. But at this point another almost incredible scene of grotesque buffoonery gave the finishing touch to the episode. Maximov suddenly appeared by the side of the carriage. He ran up, 
panting, afraid of being too late. Rakitin and Alyosha saw him running. He was in such a hurry that in his impatience he put his foot on the step on which Ivan's left foot was still resting, and clutching the carriage he kept trying to jump in. I am going with you, he kept shouting, laughing a thin mirthful laugh with a look of reckless glee in his face. Take me, too. There, cried Fyodor Pavlovich, delighted. Did I not say he was Von Son? It is Von Son himself, risen from the dead. Why, how did you tear yourself away? What did you Von Son there? And how could you get away from the dinner? You must be a brazen-faced fellow. I am that myself, but I am surprised at you, brother. Jump in, jump in. Let him pass, Ivan. It will be fun. He can lie somewhere at our feet. Will you lie at our feet, Von Son? Or perch on the box with the coachman? Skip on to the box, Von Son. But Ivan, who had by now taken his seat, without a word gave Maximov a violent punch in the breast and sent him flying. It was quite by chance he did not fall. Drive on. Ivan shouted angrily to the coachman. Why, what are you doing, what are you about? Why did you do that? Fyodor Pavlovich protested, but the carriage had already driven away. Ivan made no reply. Well, you are a fellow, Fyodor Pavlovich said again. After a pause of two minutes, looking askance at his son, why, it was you got up all this monastery business. You urged it, you approved of it. Why are you angry now? You've talked rot enough. You might rest a bit now, Ivan snapped sullenly. Fyodor Pavlovich was silent again for two minutes. A drop of brandy would be nice now, he observed sententiously, but Ivan made no response. You shall have some, too, when we get home. Ivan was still silent. Fyodor Pavlovich waited another two minutes. But I shall take Alyosha away from the monastery, though you will dislike it so much, most honored Karl von Moor. Ivan shrugged his shoulders contemptuously, and turning away stared at the road. And they did not speak again all the way home. Book 3 The Sensualists Chapter 1 In the Servants' Quarters The Karamazov's house was far from being in the center of the town, but it was not quite outside it. It was a pleasant-looking old house of two stories, painted gray, with a red iron roof. It was roomy and snug, and might still last many years. There were all sorts of unexpected little cupboards and closets and staircases. There were rats in it, but Fyodor Pavlovich did not altogether dislike them. One doesn't feel so solitary when one's left alone in the evening, he used to say. It was his habit to send the servants away to the lodge for the night and to lock himself up alone. The lodge was a roomy and solid building in the yard. Fyodor Pavlovich used to have the cooking done there, although there was a kitchen in the house, he did not like the smell of cooking, and, winter and summer alike, the dishes were carried in across the courtyard. The house was built for a large family, there was room for five times as many, with their servants. But at the time of our story there was no one living in the house but Fyodor Pavlovich and his son Ivan. And in the lodge there were only three servants, old Grigory, and his old wife Marfa, and a young man called Smerdyakov. Of these three we must say a few words. Of old Grigory we have said something already. He was firm and determined and went blindly and obstinately for his object, if once he had been brought by any reasons, and they were often very illogical ones, to believe that it was immutably right. He was honest and incorruptible. His wife, Marfa Ignatyevna, had obeyed her husband's will implicitly all her life, yet she had pestered him terribly after the emancipation of the serfs. She was set on leaving Fyodor Pavlovich and opening a little shop in Moscow with their small savings. But Grigory decided then, once for all, that, the woman's talking nonsense, for every woman is dishonest, and that they ought not to leave their old master, whatever he might be, for, that was now their duty. Do you understand what duty is? he asked Marfa Ignatyevna. I understand what duty means, Grigory Vasilyevich, but why it's our duty to stay here I never shall understand, Marfa answered firmly. Well, don't understand then. But so it shall be. And you hold your tongue. 
And so it was. They did not go away, and Fyodor Pavlovich promised them a small sum for wages, and paid it regularly. Grigory knew, too, that he had an indisputable influence over his master. It was true, and he was aware of it. Fyodor Pavlovich was an obstinate and cunning buffoon, yet, though his will was strong enough, in some of the affairs of life, as he expressed it, he found himself, to his surprise, extremely feeble in facing certain other emergencies. He knew his weaknesses and was afraid of them. There are positions in which one has to keep a sharp lookout. And that's not easy without a trustworthy man, and Grigory was a most trustworthy man. Many times in the course of his life Fyodor Pavlovich had only just escaped a sound thrashing through Grigory's intervention, and on each occasion the old servant gave him a good lecture. But it wasn't only thrashings that Fyodor Pavlovich was afraid of. There were graver occasions, and very subtle and complicated ones, when Fyodor Pavlovich could not have explained the extraordinary craving for some one faithful and devoted, which sometimes unaccountably came upon him all in a moment. It was almost a morbid condition. Corrupt and often cruel in his lust, like some noxious insect, Fyodor Pavlovich was sometimes, in moments of drunkenness, overcome by superstitious terror and a moral convulsion which took an almost physical form. My soul simply quaking in my throat at those times, he used to say. At such moments he liked to feel that there was near at hand, in the lodge if not in the room, a strong, faithful man, virtuous and unlike himself, who had seen all his debauchery and knew all his secrets, but was ready in his devotion to overlook all that, not to oppose him, above all, not to reproach him or threaten him with anything, either in this world or in the next, and, in case of need, to defend him, from whom? From somebody unknown, but terrible and dangerous. What he needed was to feel that there was another man, an old and tried friend, that he might call him in his sick moments merely to look at his face, or, perhaps, exchange some quite irrelevant words with him. And if the old servant were not angry, he felt comforted, and if he were angry, he was more dejected. It happened even, very rarely however, that Fyodor Pavlovich went at night to the lodge to wake Grigory and fetch him for a moment. When the old man came, Fyodor Pavlovich would begin talking about the most trivial matters, and would soon let him go again, sometimes even with a jest. And after he had gone, Fyodor Pavlovich would get into bed with a curse and sleep the sleep of the just. Something of the same sort had happened to Fyodor Pavlovich on Alyosha's arrival. Alyosha pierced his heart by living with him, seeing everything and blaming nothing. Moreover, Alyosha brought with him something his father had never known before, a complete absence of contempt for him and an invariable kindness, a perfectly natural unaffected devotion to the old man who deserved it so little. All this was a complete surprise to the old profligate, who had dropped all family ties. It was a new and surprising experience for him, who had till then loved nothing but evil. When Alyosha had left him, he confessed to himself that he had learned something he had not till then been willing to learn. I have mentioned already that Grigory had detested Adelaida Ivanovna, the first wife of Fyodor Pavlovich and the mother of Dmitri, and that he had, on the contrary, protected Sofia Ivanovna, the poor, crazy woman, against his master and anyone who chanced to speak ill or lightly of her. His sympathy for the unhappy wife had become something sacred to him, so that even now, twenty years after, he could not bear a slighting allusion to her from any one, and would at once check the offender. Externally, Grigory was cold, dignified and taciturn, and spoke, weighing his words, without frivolity. It was impossible to tell at first sight whether he loved his meek, obedient wife, but he really did love her, and she knew it. Marfa Ignatyevna was by no means foolish, she was probably, indeed, cleverer than her husband, or, at least, more prudent than he in worldly affairs, and yet she had given in to him in everything without question or complaint ever since her marriage, and respected him for his spiritual superiority. It was remarkable how little they spoke to one another in the course of their lives, and only of the most necessary daily affairs. The grave and dignified Grigory thought over all his cares and duties alone, so that Marfa Ignatyevna had long grown used to knowing that he did not need her advice. She felt that her husband respected her silence, and took it as a sign of her good sense. 
He had never beaten her but once, and then only slightly. Once during the year after Fyodor Pavlovich's marriage with Adelaida Ivanovna, the village girls and women, at that time serfs, were called together before the house to sing and dance. They were beginning, in the green meadows, when Marfa, at that time a young woman, skipped forward and danced, the Russian dance, not in the village fashion, but as she had danced it when she was a servant in the service of the rich Myasov family, in their private theatre, where the actors were taught to dance by a dancing master from Moscow. Grigory saw how his wife danced, and, an hour later, at home in their cottage he gave her a lesson, pulling her hair a little. But there it ended, the beating was never repeated, and Marfa Ignatyevna gave up dancing. God had not blessed them with children. One child was born but it died. Grigory was fond of children, and was not ashamed of showing it. When Adelaida Ivanovna had run away, Grigory took Dmitri, then a child of three years old, combed his hair and washed him in a tub with his own hands, and looked after him for almost a year. Afterwards he had looked after Ivan and Alyosha, for which the general's widow had rewarded him with a slap in the face, but I have already related all that. The only happiness his own child had brought him had been in the anticipation of its birth. When it was born, he was overwhelmed with grief and horror. The baby had six fingers. Grigory was so crushed by this, that he was not only silent till the day of the christening, but kept away in the garden. It was spring, and he spent three days digging the kitchen garden. The third day was fixed for christening the baby, meantime Grigory had reached a conclusion. Going into the cottage where the clergy were assembled and the visitors had arrived, including Fyodor Pavlovich, who was to stand godfather, he suddenly announced that the baby ought not to be christened at all. He announced this quietly, briefly, forcing out his words, and gazing with dull intentness at the priest. Why not, asked the priest with good-humoured surprise. Because it's a dragon, muttered Grigory. A dragon? What dragon? Grigory did not speak for some time. It's a confusion of nature, he muttered vaguely, but firmly, and obviously unwilling to say more. They laughed, and of course christened the poor baby. Grigory prayed earnestly at the font, but his opinion of the newborn child remained unchanged. Yet he did not interfere in any way. As long as the sickly infant lived he scarcely looked at it, tried indeed not to notice it, and for the most part kept out of the cottage. But when, at the end of a fortnight, the baby died of thrush, he himself laid the child in its little coffin, looked at it in profound grief, and when they were filling up the shallow little grave he fell on his knees and bowed down to the earth. He did not for years afterwards mention his child, nor did Marfa speak of the baby before him, and, even if Grigory were not present, she never spoke of it above a whisper. Marfa observed that, from the day of the burial, he devoted himself to religion, and took to reading the lives of the saints, for the most part sitting alone and in silence, and always putting on his big, round, silver-rimmed spectacles. He rarely read aloud, only perhaps in Lent. He was fond of the Book of Job, and had somehow got hold of a copy of the sayings and sermons of the God-fearing Father Isaac the Syrian, which he read persistently for years together, understanding very little of it, but perhaps prizing and loving it the more for that. Of late he had begun to listen to the doctrines of the sect of flagellants settled in the neighborhood. He was evidently shaken by them, but judged it unfitting to go over to the new faith. His habit of theological reading gave him an expression of still greater gravity. He was perhaps predisposed to mysticism. And the birth of his deformed child, and its death, had, as though by special design, been accompanied by another strange and marvelous event, which, as he said later, had left a stamp upon his soul. It happened that, on the very night after the burial of his child, Marfa was awakened by the wail of a newborn baby. She was frightened and waked her husband. He listened and said he thought it was more like someone groaning, it might be a woman. He got up and dressed. It was a rather warm night in May. As he went down the steps, he distinctly heard groans coming from the garden. But the gate from the yard into the garden was locked at night, and there was no other way of entering it, for it was enclosed all round by a strong, high fence. Going back into the house, Grigory lighted a lantern, took the garden key, and taking no notice of the hysterical fears of his wife, 
who was still persuaded that she heard a child crying, and that it was her own baby crying and calling for her, went into the garden in silence. There he heard at once that the groans came from the bathhouse that stood near the garden gate, and that they were the groans of a woman. Opening the door of the bathhouse, he saw a sight which petrified him. An idiot girl, who wandered about the streets and was known to the whole town by the nickname of Lizavita Smirdiaskia, stinking Lizavita, had got into the bath house and had just given birth to a child. She lay dying with the baby beside her. She said nothing, for she had never been able to speak. But her story needs a chapter to itself. Chapter 2. Lizavita. There was one circumstance which struck Grigory particularly, and confirmed a very unpleasant and revolting suspicion. This Lizavita was a dwarfish creature, not five foot within a wee bit, as many of the pious old women said pathetically about her, after her death. Her broad, healthy, red face had a look of blank idiocy and the fixed stare in her eyes was unpleasant, in spite of their meek expression. She wandered about, summer and winter alike, barefooted, wearing nothing but a hempen smock. Her coarse, almost black hair curled like lamb's wool, and formed a sort of huge cap on her head. It was always crusted with mud, and had leaves, bits of stick, and shavings clinging to it, as she always slept on the ground and in the dirt. Her father, a homeless, sickly drunkard, called Ilya, had lost everything and lived many years as a workman with some well-to-do tradespeople. Her mother had long been dead. Spiteful and diseased, Ilya used to beat Lizavita inhumanly whenever she returned to him. But she rarely did so, for everyone in the town was ready to look after her as being an idiot, and so specially dear to God. Ilya's employers, and many others in the town, especially of the tradespeople, tried to clothe her better, and always rigged her out with high boots and sheepskin coat for the winter. But, although she allowed them to dress her up without resisting, she usually went away, preferably to the cathedral porch, and taking off all that had been given her, kerchief, sheepskin, skirt or boots, she left them there and walked away barefoot in her smock as before. It happened on one occasion that a new governor of the province, making a tour of inspection in our town, saw Lizavita, and was wounded in his tenderest susceptibilities. And though he was told she was an idiot, he pronounced that for a young woman of twenty to wander about in nothing but a smock was a breach of the proprieties, and must not occur again. But the governor went his way, and Lizavita was left as she was. At last her father died, which made her even more acceptable in the eyes of the religious persons of the town, as an orphan. In fact, everyone seemed to like her, even the boys did not tease her, and the boys of our town, especially the schoolboys, are a mischievous set. She would walk into strange houses, and no one drove her away. Everyone was kind to her and gave her something. If she were given a copper, she would take it, and at once drop it in the alms jug of the church or prison. If she were given a roll or bun in the market, she would hand it to the first child she met. Sometimes she would stop one of the richest ladies in the town and give it to her, and the lady would be pleased to take it. She herself never tasted anything but black bread and water. If she went into an expensive shop, where there were costly goods or money lying about, no one kept watch on her, for they knew that if she saw thousands of rubles overlooked by them, she would not have touched a farthing. She scarcely ever went to church. She slept either in the church porch or climbed over a hurdle, there are many hurdles instead of fences to this day in our town, into a kitchen garden. She used at least once a week to turn up at home, that is at the house of her father's former employers, and in the winter went there every night, and slept either in the passage or the cowhouse. People were amazed that she could stand such a life, but she was accustomed to it, and, although she was so tiny, she was of a robust constitution. Some of the townspeople declared that she did all this only from pride, but that is hardly credible. She could hardly speak, and only from time to time uttered an inarticulate grunt. How could she have been proud? It happened one clear, warm, moonlight night in September, many years ago, five or six drunken revelers were returning from the club at a very late hour, according to our provincial notions. They passed through the back way, which led between the back gardens of the houses, with hurdles on either side. This way leads out onto the bridge over the long, 
stinking pool which we were accustomed to call a river. Among the nettles and burdocks under the hurdle our revelers saw Lizavita asleep. They stopped to look at her, laughing, and began jesting with unbridled licentiousness. It occurred to one young gentleman to make the whimsical inquiry whether anyone could possibly look upon such an animal as a woman, and so forth. They all pronounced with lofty repugnance that it was impossible. But Fyodor Pavlovich, who was among them, sprang forward and declared that it was by no means impossible, and that, indeed, there was a certain piquancy about it, and so on. It is true that at that time he was overdoing his part as a buffoon. He liked to put himself forward and entertain the company, ostensibly on equal terms, of course, though in reality he was on a servile footing with them. It was just at the time when he had received the news of his first wife's death in Petersburg, and, with crepe upon his hat, was drinking and behaving so shamelessly that even the most reckless among us were shocked at the sight of him. The revelers, of course, laughed at this unexpected opinion, and one of them even began challenging him to act upon it. The others repelled the idea even more emphatically, although still with the utmost hilarity, and at last they went on their way. Later on, Fyodor Pavlovich swore that he had gone with them, and perhaps it was so, no one knows for certain, and no one ever knew. But five or six months later, all the town was talking, with intense and sincere indignation, of Lizaveta's condition, and trying to find out who was the miscreant who had wronged her. Then suddenly a terrible rumor was all over the town that this miscreant was no other than Fyodor Pavlovich. Who set the rumor going? Of that drunken band five had left the town and the only one still among us was an elderly and much respected civil counselor, the father of grown-up daughters, who could hardly have spread the tale, even if there had been any foundation for it. But rumor pointed straight at Fyodor Pavlovich, and persisted in pointing at him. Of course this was no great grievance to him, he would not have troubled to contradict a set of tradespeople. In those days he was proud, and did not condescend to talk except in his own circle of the officials and nobles, whom he entertained so well. At the time, Grigory stood up for his master vigorously. He provoked quarrels and altercations in defense of him and succeeded in bringing some people round to his side. It's the wench's own fault, he asserted, and the culprit was Carp, a dangerous convict, who had escaped from prison and whose name was well known to us, as he had hidden in our town. This conjecture sounded plausible, for it was remembered that Carp had been in the neighborhood just at that time in the autumn, and had robbed three people. But this affair and all the talk about it did not estrange popular sympathy from the poor idiot. She was better looked after than ever. A well-to-do merchant's widow named Kondratyev arranged to take her into her house at the end of April, meaning not to let her go out until after the confinement. They kept a constant watch over her, but in spite of their vigilance she escaped on the very last day, and made her way into Fyodor Pavlovich's garden. How, in her condition, she managed to climb over the high, strong fence remained a mystery. Some maintained that she must have been lifted over by somebody, others hinted at something more uncanny. The most likely explanation is that it happened naturally, that Lizavita, accustomed to clambering over hurdles to sleep in gardens, had somehow managed to climb this fence, in spite of her condition, and had leapt down, injuring herself. Grigory rushed to Marfa and sent her to Lizavita, while he ran to fetch an old midwife who lived close by. They saved the baby, but Lizavita died at dawn. Grigory took the baby, brought it home, and making his wife sit down, put it on her lap. A child of God, an orphan is akin to all, he said, and to us above others. Our little lost one has sent us this, who has come from the devil's son and a holy innocent. Nurse him and weep no more. So Marfa brought up the child. He was christened Pavel, to which people were not slow in adding Fyodorovich, son of Fyodor. Fyodor Pavlovich did not object to any of this, and thought it amusing, though he persisted vigorously in denying his responsibility. The townspeople were pleased at his adopting the foundling. Later on, Fyodor Pavlovich invented a surname for the child, calling him Smerdyakov, after his mother's nickname. So this Smerdyakov became Fyodor Pavlovich's second servant, and was living in the lodge with Grigory and Marfa at the time our story begins. He was employed as cook. I ought to say something of this Smerdyakov, 
but I am ashamed of keeping my reader's attention so long occupied with these common menials, and I will go back to my story, hoping to say more of Smerdyakov in the course of it. Chapter 3 The Confession of a Passionate Heart, in Verse Alyosha remained for some time irresolute after hearing the command his father shouted to him from the carriage. But in spite of his uneasiness he did not stand still. That was not his way. He went at once to the kitchen to find out what his father had been doing above. Then he set off, trusting that on the way he would find some answer to the doubt tormenting him. I hasten to add that his father's shouts, commanding him to return home with his mattress and pillow, did not frighten him in the least. He understood perfectly that those peremptory shouts were merely a flourish to produce an effect. In the same way a tradesman in our town who was celebrating his name day with a party of friends, getting angry at being refused more vodka, smashed up his own crockery and furniture and tore his own and his wife's clothes, and finally broke his windows, all for the sake of effect. Next day, of course, when he was sober, he regretted the broken cups and saucers. Alyosha knew that his father would let him go back to the monastery next day, possibly even that evening. Moreover, he was fully persuaded that his father might hurt anyone else, but would not hurt him. Alyosha was certain that no one in the whole world ever would want to hurt him, and, what is more, he knew that no one could hurt him. This was for him an axiom, assumed once for all without question, and he went his way without hesitation, relying on it. But at that moment an anxiety of a different sort disturbed him, and worried him the more because he could not formulate it. It was the fear of a woman, of Katerina Ivanovna, who had so urgently entreated him in the note handed to him by Madame Holikov to come and see her about something. This request and the necessity of going had at once aroused an uneasy feeling in his heart, and this feeling had grown more and more painful all the morning in spite of the scenes at the hermitage and at the father superiors. He was not uneasy because he did not know what she would speak of and what he must answer. And he was not afraid of her simply as a woman. Though he knew little of women, he had spent his life, from early childhood till he entered the monastery, entirely with women. He was afraid of that woman, Katerina Ivanovna. He had been afraid of her from the first time he saw her. He had only seen her two or three times, and had only chanced to say a few words to her. He thought of her as a beautiful, proud, imperious girl. It was not her beauty which troubled him, but something else. And the vagueness of his apprehension increased the apprehension itself. The girl's aims were of the noblest, he knew that. She was trying to save his brother Dmitri simply through generosity, though he had already behaved badly to her. Yet, although Alyosha recognized and did justice to all these fine and generous sentiments, a shiver began to run down his back as soon as he drew near her house. He reflected that he would not find Ivan, who was so intimate a friend, with her, for Ivan was certainly now with his father. Dmitri he was even more certain not to find there, and he had a foreboding of the reason. And so his conversation would be with her alone. He had a great longing to run and see his brother Dmitri before that fateful interview. Without showing him the letter, he could talk to him about it. But Dmitri lived a long way off, and he was sure to be away from home too. Standing still for a minute, he reached a final decision. Crossing himself with a rapid and accustomed gesture, and at once smiling, he turned resolutely in the direction of his terrible lady. He knew her house. If he went by the high street and then across the marketplace, it was a long way round. Though our town is small, it is scattered, and the houses are far apart. And meanwhile his father was expecting him, and perhaps had not yet forgotten his command. He might be unreasonable, and so he had to make haste to get there and back. So he decided to take a short cut by the back way, for he knew every inch of the ground. This meant skirting fences, climbing over hurdles, and crossing other people's backyards, where everyone he met knew him and greeted him. In this way he could reach the high street in half the time. He had to pass the garden adjoining his father's, and belonging to a little tumble-down house with four windows. The owner of this house, as Alyosha knew, was a bedridden old woman, living with her daughter, who had been a genteel maidservant in general's families in Petersburg. Now she had been at home a year, looking after her sick mother. 
She always dressed up in fine clothes, though her old mother and she had sunk into such poverty that they went every day to Fyodor Pavlovich's kitchen for soup and bread, which Marfa gave readily. Yet, though the young woman came up for soup, she had never sold any of her dresses, and one of these even had a long train, a fact which Alyosha had learned from Rakitin, who always knew everything that was going on in the town. He had forgotten it as soon as he heard it, but now, on reaching the garden, he remembered the dress with the train, raised his head, which had been bowed in thought, and came upon something quite unexpected. Over the hurdle in the garden, Dmitri, mounted on something, was leaning forward, gesticulating violently, beckoning to him, obviously afraid to utter a word for fear of being overheard. Alyosha ran up to the hurdle. It's a good thing you looked up. I was nearly shouting to you, Mitya said in a joyful, hurried whisper. Climb in here quickly. How splendid that you've come. I was just thinking of you. Alyosha was delighted too, but he did not know how to get over the hurdle. Mitya put his powerful hand under his elbow to help him jump. Tucking up his cassock, Alyosha leapt over the hurdle with the agility of a bare-legged street urchin. Well done. Now come along, said Mitya in an enthusiastic whisper. Where? whispered Alyosha, looking about him and finding himself in a deserted garden with no one near but themselves. The garden was small, but the house was at least fifty paces away. There's no one here. Why do you whisper? asked Alyosha. Why do I whisper? Deuce take it, cried Dmitri at the top of his voice. You see what silly tricks nature plays one. I am here in secret and on the watch. I'll explain later on, but, knowing it's a secret, I began whispering like a fool, when there's no need. Let us go. Over there. Till then be quiet. I want to kiss you. Glory to God in the world. Glory to God in me. I was just repeating that, sitting here, before you came. The garden was about three acres in extent, and planted with trees only along the fence at the four sides. There were apple trees, maples, limes and birch trees. The middle of the garden was an empty grass space, from which several hundredweight of hay was carried in the summer. The garden was let out for a few rubles for the summer. There were also plantations of raspberries and currants and gooseberries laid out along the sides, a kitchen garden had been planted lately near the house. Dmitri led his brother to the most secluded corner of the garden. There, in a thicket of lime trees and old bushes of black currant, elder, snowball tree, and lilac, there stood a tumble-down green summer house, blackened with age. Its walls were of lattice work, but there was still a roof which could give shelter. God knows when this summer house was built. There was a tradition that it had been put up some fifty years before by a retired colonel called von Schmidt, who owned the house at that time. It was all in decay, the floor was rotting, the planks were loose, the woodwork smelled musty. In the summer house there was a green wooden table fixed in the ground, and round it were some green benches upon which it was still possible to sit. Alyosha had at once observed his brother's exhilarated condition, and on entering the arbor he saw half a bottle of brandy and a wine glass on the table. That's brandy, Mitya laughed. I see your look, he's drinking again. Distrust the apparition, distrust the worthless, lying crowd. And lay aside thy doubts. I'm not drinking, I'm only indulging, as that pig, your racketin, says. He'll be a civil counselor one day, but he'll always talk about indulging. Sit down. I could take you in my arms, Alyosha, and press you to my bosom till I crush you, for in the whole world, in reality, in real vitae, can you take it in? I love no one but you. He uttered the last words in a sort of exaltation. No one but you and one, Jade, I have fallen in love with, to my ruin. But being in love doesn't mean loving. You may be in love with a woman and yet hate her. Remember that. I can talk about it gaily still. Sit down here by the table and I'll sit beside you and look at you, and go on talking. You shall keep quiet and I'll go on talking, for the time has come. But on reflection, you know, I'd better speak quietly, for here, here, you can never tell what ears are listening. I will explain everything, as they say, the story will be continued. 
why have I been longing for you? Why have I been thirsting for you all these days, and just now? It's five days since I've cast anchor here. Because it's only to you I can tell everything, because I must, because I need you, because tomorrow I shall fly from the clouds, because tomorrow life is ending and beginning. Have you ever felt, have you ever dreamt of falling down a precipice into a pit? That's just how I'm falling, but not in a dream, and I'm not afraid, and don't you be afraid. At least, I am afraid, but I enjoy it. It's not enjoyment though, but ecstasy. Damn it all, whatever it is. A strong spirit, a weak spirit, a womanish spirit, whatever it is. Let us praise nature, you see what sunshine, how clear the sky is, the leaves are all green, it's still summer, for a clock in the afternoon and the stillness. Where were you going? I was going to father's, but I meant to go to Katerina Ivanovna's first. To her, and to father. Ooh! What a coincidence! Why was I waiting for you? Hungering and thirsting for you in every cranny of my soul and even in my ribs? Why, to send you to father and to her, Katerina Ivanovna, so as to have done with her and with father? To send an angel. I might have sent any one, but I wanted to send an angel. And here you are on your way to see father and her. Did you really mean to send me, cried Alyosha with a distressed expression. Stay. You knew it. And I see you understand it all at once. But be quiet, be quiet for a time. Don't be sorry, and don't cry. Dmitri stood up, thought a moment, and put his finger to his forehead. She's asked you, written to you a letter or something, that's why you're going to her. You wouldn't be going except for that. Here is her note. Alyosha took it out of his pocket. Mitya looked through it quickly. And you were going the back way. Oh, gods, I thank you for sending him by the back way, and he came to me like the golden fish to the silly old fisherman in the fable. Listen, Alyosha, listen, brother. Now I mean to tell you everything, for I must tell someone. An angel in heaven I've told already, but I want to tell an angel on earth. You are an angel on earth. You will hear and judge and forgive. And that's what I need, that someone above me should forgive. Listen. If two people break away from everything on earth and fly off into the unknown, or at least one of them, and before flying off or going to ruin he comes to someone else and says, do this for me, some favor never asked before that could only be asked on one's deathbed, would that other refuse, if you were a friend or a brother? I will do it, but tell me what it is, and make haste, said Alyosha. Make haste. Hum. Don't be in a hurry, Alyosha, you hurry and worry yourself. There's no need to hurry now. Now the world has taken a new turning. Ah, Alyosha, what a pity you can't understand ecstasy. But what am I saying to him? As though you didn't understand it. What an ass I am. What am I saying? Be noble, O oh man. Who says that? Alyosha made up his mind to wait. He felt that, perhaps, indeed, his work lay here. Mitya sank into thought for a moment, with his elbow on the table and his head in his hand. Both were silent. Alyosha, said Mitya, you're the only one who won't laugh. I should like to begin, my confession, with Schiller's hymn to joy, and die Freude. I don't know German, I only know it's called that. Don't think I'm talking nonsense because I'm drunk. I'm not a bit drunk. Brandy's all very well, but I need two bottles to make me drunk. Silenus with his rosy fizz. Upon his stumbling ass. But I've not drunk a quarter of a bottle, and I'm not Silenus. I'm not Silenus, though I am strong, one, for I've made a decision once for all. Forgive me the pun, you'll have to forgive me a lot more than puns today. Don't be uneasy. I'm not spinning it out. I'm talking sense, and I'll come to the point in a minute. I won't keep you in suspense. Stay, how does it go? He raised his head, thought a minute, and began with enthusiasm. Wild and fearful in his cavern. Hid the naked troglodyte. And the homeless nomad wandered. 
laying waste the fertile plain, menacing with spear and arrow. In the woods the hunter strayed, woe to all poor wretches stranded. On those cruel and hostile shores, from the peak of high Olympus, came the mother Ceres down, seeking in those savage regions. Her lost daughter Proserpine, but the goddess found no refuge, found no kindly welcome there, and no temple bearing witness to the worship of the gods, from the fields and from the vineyards. Came no fruits to deck the feasts, only flesh of blood-stained victims, smoldered on the altar fires, and where'er the grieving goddess turns her melancholy gaze, sunk in vilest degradation, man his loathsomeness displays. Mitya broke into sobs and seized Aleosha's hand, my dear, my dear, in degradation, in degradation now, too. There's a terrible amount of suffering for man on earth, a terrible lot of trouble. Don't think I'm only a brute in an officer's uniform, wallowing in dirt and drink. I hardly think of anything but of that degraded man, if only I'm not lying. I pray God I'm not lying and showing off. I think about that man because I am that man myself, would he purge his soul from vileness and attain to light and worth. He must turn and cling forever to his ancient Mother Earth, but the difficulty is how am I to cling forever to Mother Earth? I don't kiss her. I don't cleave to her bosom. Am I to become a peasant or a shepherd? I go on and I don't know whether I'm going to shame or to light and joy. That's the trouble, for everything in the world is a riddle. And whenever I've happened to sink into the vilest degradation, and it's always been happening, I always read that poem about Ceres and man. Has it reformed me? Never. For I'm a Karamazov. For when I do leap into the pit, I go headlong with my heels up, and am pleased to be falling in that degrading attitude, and pride myself upon it. And in the very depths of that degradation I begin a hymn of praise. Let me be accursed. Let me be vile and base, only let me kiss the hem of the veil in which my God is shrouded. Though I may be following the devil, I am thy son, O Lord, and I love thee, and I feel the joy without which the world cannot stand. Joy everlasting fostereth the soul of all creation. It is her secret ferment fires. The cup of life with flame, tis at her beck the grass hath turned. Each blade towards the light. And solar systems have evolved. From chaos and dark night. Filling the realms of boundless space. Beyond the sage's sight, at bounteous nature's kindly breast. All things that breathe drink joy. And birds and beasts and creeping things. All follow where she leads, her gifts to man are friends in need. The wreath, the foaming must. To angels, vision of God's throne. To insects, sensual lust, but enough poetry. I am in tears, let me cry. It may be foolishness that everyone would laugh at. But you won't laugh. Your eyes are shining, too. Enough poetry. I want to tell you now about the insects to whom God gave sensual lust. To insects, sensual lust. I am that insect, brother, and it is said of me specially. All we Karamazovs are such insects, and, angel as you are, that insect lives in you, too, and will stir up a tempest in your blood. Tempests, because sensual lust is a tempest, worse than a tempest. Beauty is a terrible and awful thing. It is terrible because it has not been fathomed and never can be fathomed, for God sets us nothing but riddles. Here the boundaries meet and all contradictions exist side by side. I am not a cultivated man, brother, but I've thought a lot about this. It's terrible what mysteries there are. Too many riddles weigh men down on earth. We must solve them as we can, and try to keep a dry skin in the water. Beauty I can't endure the thought that a man of lofty mind and heart begins with the ideal of the Madonna and ends with the ideal of Sodom. What's still more awful is that a man with the ideal of Sodom in his soul does not renounce the ideal of the Madonna, and his heart may be on fire with that ideal, genuinely on fire, 
just as in his days of youth and innocence. Yes, man is broad, too broad, indeed. I'd have him narrower. The devil only knows what to make of it. What to the mind is shameful is beauty and nothing else to the heart. Is there beauty in Sodom? Believe me, that for the immense mass of mankind beauty is found in Sodom. Did you know that secret? The awful thing is that beauty is mysterious as well as terrible. God and the devil are fighting there and the battlefield is the heart of man. But a man always talks of his own ache. Listen, now to come to facts. Chapter 4. The Confession of a Passionate Heart, in Anecdote. I was leading a wild life then. Father said just now that I spent several thousand rubles in seducing young girls. That's a swinish invention, and there was nothing of the sort. And if there was, I didn't need money simply for that. With me money is an accessory, the overflow of my heart, the framework. Today she would be my lady, tomorrow a wench out of the streets in her place. I entertained them both. I threw away money by the handful on music, rioting, and gypsies. Sometimes I gave it to the ladies, too, for they'll take it greedily, that must be admitted, and be pleased and thankful for it. Ladies used to be fond of me, not all of them, but it happened, it happened. But I always liked side paths, little dark back alleys behind the main road, there one finds adventures and surprises, and precious metal in the dirt. I am speaking figuratively, brother. In the town I was in, there were no such back alleys in the literal sense, but morally there were. If you were like me, you'd know what that means. I loved vice, I loved the ignominy of vice. I loved cruelty, am I not a bug, am I not a noxious insect? In fact a Karamazov. Once we went, a whole lot of us, for a picnic, in seven sledges. It was dark, it was winter, and I began squeezing a girl's hand, and forced her to kiss me. She was the daughter of an official, a sweet, gentle, submissive creature. She allowed me, she allowed me much in the dark. She thought, poor thing, that I should come next day to make her an offer, I was looked upon as a good match, too. But I didn't say a word to her for five months. I used to see her in a corner at dances, we were always having dances, her eyes watching me. I saw how they glowed with fire, a fire of gentle indignation. This game only tickled that insect lust I cherished in my soul. Five months later she married an official and left the town, still angry, and still, perhaps, in love with me. Now they live happily. Observe that I told no one. I didn't boast of it. Though I'm full of low desires, and love what's low, I'm not dishonorable. You're blushing, your eyes flashed. Enough of this filth with you. And all this was nothing much, wayside blossoms all appalled a cock, though the cruel insect had already grown strong in my soul. I've a perfect album of reminiscences, brother. God bless them, the darlings. I tried to break it off without quarreling. And I never gave them away. I never bragged of one of them. But that's enough. You can't suppose I brought you here simply to talk of such nonsense. No, I'm going to tell you something more curious, and don't be surprised that I'm glad to tell you, instead of being ashamed. You say that because I blushed, Alyosha said suddenly. I wasn't blushing at what you were saying or at what you've done. I blushed because I am the same as you are. You. Come, that's going a little too far. No, it's not too far, said Alyosha warmly, obviously the idea was not a new one. The latter's the same. I'm at the bottom step, and you're above, somewhere about the thirteenth. That's how I see it. But it's all the same. Absolutely the same in kind. Anyone on the bottom step is bound to go up to the top one. Then one ought not to step on at all. Anyone who can help it had better not. But can you? I think not. Hush, Alyosha, hush, darling. I could kiss your hand, you touch me so. That rogue Grashenka has an eye for men. She told me once that she'd devour you one day. There, there, I won't. 
From this field of corruption fouled by flies, let's pass to my tragedy, also befouled by flies, that is by every sort of vileness. Although the old man told lies about my seducing innocence, there really was something of the sort in my tragedy, though it was only once, and then it did not come off. The old man who has reproached me with what never happened does not even know of this fact, I never told anyone about it. You're the first, except Ivan, of course, Ivan knows everything. He knew about it long before you. But Ivan's a tomb. Ivan's a tomb. Yes. Alyosha listened with great attention. I was lieutenant in a line regiment, but still I was under supervision, like a kind of convict. Yet I was awfully well received in the little town. I spent money right and left. I was thought to be rich, I thought so myself. But I must have pleased them in other ways as well. Although they shook their heads over me, they liked me. My colonel, who was an old man, took a sudden dislike to me. He was always down upon me, but I had powerful friends, and, moreover, all the town was on my side, so he couldn't do me much harm. I was in fault myself for refusing to treat him with proper respect. I was proud. This obstinate old fellow, who was really a very good sort, kind-hearted and hospitable, had had two wives, both dead. His first wife, who was of a humble family, left a daughter as unpretentious as herself. She was a young woman of four and twenty when I was there, and was living with her father and an aunt, her mother's sister. The aunt was simple and illiterate, the niece was simple but lively. I like to say nice things about people. I never knew a woman of more charming character than Agafya, fancy, her name was Agafya Ivanovna. And she wasn't bad-looking either, in the Russian style, tall, stout, with a full figure, and beautiful eyes, though a rather coarse face. She had not married, although she had had two suitors. She refused them, but was as cheerful as ever. I was intimate with her, not in that way, it was pure friendship. I have often been friendly with women quite innocently. I used to talk to her with shocking frankness, and she only laughed. Many women like such freedom, and she was a girl too, which made it very amusing. Another thing, one could never think of her as a young lady. She and her aunt lived in her father's house with a sort of voluntary humility, not putting themselves on an equality with other people. She was a general favorite, and of use to every one, for she was a clever dressmaker. She had a talent for it. She gave her services freely without asking for payment, but if anyone offered her payment, she didn't refuse. The colonel, of course, was a very different matter. He was one of the chief personages in the district. He kept open house, entertained the whole town, gave suppers and dances. At the time I arrived and joined the battalion, all the town was talking of the expected return of the colonel's second daughter, a great beauty, who had just left a fashionable school in the capital. This second daughter is Katerina Ivanovna, and she was the child of the second wife, who belonged to a distinguished general's family, although, as I learnt on good authority, she too brought the colonel no money. She had connections, and that was all. There may have been expectations, but they had come to nothing. Yet, when the young lady came from boarding school on a visit, the whole town revived. Our most distinguished ladies, two excellencies, and a colonel's wife, and all the rest following their lead, at once took her up and gave entertainments in her honor. She was the belle of the balls and picnics, and they got up tableaus vivants in aid of distressed governesses. I took no notice, I went on as wildly as before, and one of my exploits at the time set all the town talking. I saw her eyes taking my measure one evening at the battery commanders, but I didn't go up to her, as though I disdained her acquaintance. I did go up and speak to her at an evening party not long after. She scarcely looked at me, and compressed her lips scornfully. Wait a bit. I'll have my revenge, thought I. I behaved like an awful fool on many occasions at that time, and I was conscious of it myself. What made it worse was that I felt that Katenka was not an innocent boarding school miss, but a person of character, proud and really high principled, above all, she had education and intellect, and I had neither. You think I meant to make her an offer? No, I simply wanted to revenge myself, 
because I was such a hero and she didn't seem to feel it. Meanwhile, I spent my time in drink and riot, till the lieutenant colonel put me under arrest for three days. Just at that time father sent me 6,000 rubles in return for my sending him a deed giving up all claims upon him, settling our accounts, so to speak, and saying that I wouldn't expect anything more. I didn't understand a word of it at the time. Until I came here, Alyosha, till the last few days, indeed, perhaps even now, I haven't been able to make head or tail of my money affairs with father. But never mind that, we'll talk of it later. Just as I received the money, I got a letter from a friend telling me something that interested me immensely. The authorities, I learnt, were dissatisfied with our lieutenant colonel. He was suspected of irregularities, in fact, his enemies were preparing a surprise for him. And then the commander of the division arrived, and kicked up the devil of a shindy. Shortly afterwards he was ordered to retire. I won't tell you how it all happened. He had enemies certainly. Suddenly there was a marked coolness in the town towards him and all his family. His friends all turned their backs on him. Then I took my first step. I met Agafya Ivanovna, with whom I'd always kept up a friendship, and said, Do you know there's a deficit of 4,500 rubles of government money in your father's accounts? What do you mean? What makes you say so? The general was here not long ago, and everything was all right. Then it was, but now it isn't. She was terribly scared. Don't frighten me, she said. Who told you so? Don't be uneasy, I said, I won't tell anyone. You know I'm as silent as the tomb. I only wanted, in view of possibilities, to add, that when they demand that 4,500 rubles from your father, and he can't produce it, he'll be tried, and made to serve as a common soldier in his old age, unless you like to send me your young lady secretly. I've just had money paid me. I'll give her four thousand, if you like, and keep the secret religiously. Ah, you scoundrel. That's what she said. You wicked scoundrel. How dare you. She went away furiously indignant, while I shouted after her once more that the secret should be kept sacred. Those two simple creatures, Agafya and her aunt, I may as well say at once, behaved like perfect angels all through this business. They genuinely adored their, Katya, thought her far above them, and waited on her, hand and foot. But Agafya told her of our conversation. I found that out afterwards. She didn't keep it back, and of course that was all I wanted. Suddenly the new major arrived to take command of the battalion. The old lieutenant colonel was taken ill at once, couldn't leave his room for two days, and didn't hand over the government money. Dr. Kravchenko declared that he really was ill. But I knew for a fact, and had known for a long time, that for the last four years the money had never been in his hands except when the commander made his visits of inspection. He used to lend it to a trustworthy person, a merchant of our town called Trifonov, an old widower, with a big beard and gold-rimmed spectacles. He used to go to the fair, do a profitable business with the money, and return the whole sum to the colonel, bringing with it a present from the fair, as well as interest on the loan. But this time, I heard all about it quite by chance from Trifonov's son and heir, a driveling youth and one of the most vicious in the world, this time, I say, Trifonov brought nothing back from the fair. The lieutenant colonel flew to him. I've never received any money from you, and couldn't possibly have received any. That was all the answer he got. So now our lieutenant colonel is confined to the house, with a towel round his head, while they're all three busy putting ice on it. All at once an orderly arrives on the scene with the book and the order to hand over the battalion money immediately, within two hours. He signed the book, I saw the signature in the book afterwards, stood up, saying he would put on his uniform, ran to his bedroom, loaded his double-barreled gun with a service bullet, took the boot off his right foot, fixed the gun against his chest, and began feeling for the trigger with his foot. But Agafya, remembering what I had told her, had her suspicions. She stole up and peeped into the room just in time. She rushed in, flung herself upon him from behind, threw her arms round him, and the gun went off, hit the ceiling, but hurt no one. The others ran in, took away the gun, and held him by the arms. I heard all about this afterwards. 
I was at home, it was getting dusk, and I was just preparing to go out. I had dressed, brushed my hair, scented my handkerchief, and taken up my cap, when suddenly the door opened, and facing me in the room stood Katerina Ivanovna. It's strange how things happen sometimes. No one had seen her in the street, so that no one knew of it in the town. I lodged with two decrepit old ladies, who looked after me. They were most obliging old things, ready to do anything for me, and at my request were as silent afterwards as two cast-iron posts. Of course I grasped the position at once. She walked in and looked straight at me, her dark eyes determined, even defiant, but on her lips and round her mouth I saw uncertainty. My sister told me, she began, that you would give me 4,500 rubles if I came to you for it, myself. I have come, give me the money. She couldn't keep it up. She was breathless, frightened, her voice failed her, and the corners of her mouth and the lines round it quivered. Alyosha, are you listening, or are you asleep? Mitya, I know you will tell the whole truth, said Alyosha in agitation. I am telling it. If I tell the whole truth just as it happened I shan't spare myself. My first idea was a, Karamazov one. Once I was bitten by a centipede, brother, and laid up a fortnight with fever from it. Well, I felt a centipede biting at my heart then, a noxious insect, you understand. I looked her up and down. You've seen her. She's a beauty. But she was beautiful in another way then. At that moment she was beautiful because she was noble, and I was a scoundrel, she in all the grandeur of her generosity and sacrifice for her father, and I, a bug. And, scoundrel as I was, she was altogether at my mercy, body and soul. She was hemmed in. I tell you frankly, that thought, that venomous thought, so possessed my heart that it almost swooned with suspense. It seemed as if there could be no resisting it, as though I should act like a bug, like a venomous spider, without a spark of pity. I could scarcely breathe. Understand, I should have gone next day to ask for her hand, so that it might end honorably, so to speak, and that nobody would or could know. For though I'm a man of base desires, I'm honest. And at that very second some voice seemed to whisper in my ear, but when you come tomorrow to make your proposal, that girl won't even see you, she'll order her coachman to kick you out of the yard. Publish it through all the town, she would say, I'm not afraid of you. I looked at the young lady, my voice had not deceived me. That is how it would be, not a doubt of it. I could see from her face now that I should be turned out of the house. My spite was roused. I longed to play her the nastiest swinish cad's trick, to look at her with a sneer, and on the spot where she stood before me to stun her with a tone of voice that only a shopman could use. Four thousand. What do you mean? I was joking. You've been counting your chickens too easily, madam. Two hundred, if you like, with all my heart. But four thousand is not a sum to throw away on such frivolity. You've put yourself out to no purpose. I should have lost the game, of course. She'd have run away. But it would have been an infernal revenge. It would have been worth it all. I'd have howled with regret all the rest of my life, only to have played that trick. Would you believe it, it has never happened to me with any other woman, not one, to look at her at such a moment with hatred. But, on my oath, I looked at her for three seconds, or five perhaps, with fearful hatred, that hate which is only a hair's breadth from love, from the maddest love. I went to the window, put my forehead against the frozen pane, and I remember the ice burnt my forehead like fire. I did not keep her long, don't be afraid. I turned round, went up to the table, opened the drawer and took out a banknote for five thousand rubles, it was lying in a French dictionary. Then I showed it her in silence, folded it, handed it to her, opened the door into the passage, and, stepping back, made her a deep bow, a most respectful, a most impressive bow, believe me. She shuddered all over, gazed at me for a second, turned horribly pale, white as a sheet, in fact, and all at once, not impetuously but softly, gently, bowed down to my feet, not a boarding school curtsy, but a Russian bow, with her forehead to the floor. She jumped up and ran away. I was wearing my sword. 
I drew it and nearly stabbed myself with it on the spot, why, I don't know. It would have been frightfully stupid, of course. I suppose it was from delight, can you understand that one might kill oneself from delight? But I didn't stab myself. I only kissed my sword and put it back in the scabbard, which there was no need to have told you, by the way. And I fancy that in telling you about my inner conflict I have laid it on rather thick to glorify myself. But let it pass, and to hell with all who pry into the human heart. Well, so much for that adventure with Katerina Ivanovna. So now Ivan knows of it, and you, no one else. Dmitri got up, took a step or two in his excitement, pulled out his handkerchief and mopped his forehead, then sat down again, not in the same place as before, but on the opposite side, so that Alyosha had to turn quite round to face him. Chapter 5 The Confession of a Passionate Heart, Heals Up Now, said Alyosha, I understand the first half. You understand the first half. That half is a drama, and it was played out there. The second half is a tragedy, and it is being acted here. And I understand nothing of that second half so far, said Alyosha. And I. Do you suppose I understand it? Stop, Dmitri. There's one important question. Tell me, you were betrothed, you are betrothed still. We weren't betrothed at once, not for three months after that adventure. The next day I told myself that the incident was closed, concluded, that there would be no sequel. It seemed to me caddish to make her an offer. On her side she gave no sign of life for the six weeks that she remained in the town, except, indeed, for one action. The day after her visit the maidservant slipped round with an envelope addressed to me. I tore it open, it contained the change out of the banknote. Only 4,500 rubles was needed, but there was a discount of about 200 on changing it. She only sent me about 260. I don't remember exactly, but not a note, not a word of explanation. I searched the packet for a pencil mark, and nothing. Well, I spent the rest of the money on such an orgy that the new major was obliged to reprimand me. Well, the lieutenant colonel produced the battalion money, to the astonishment of every one, for nobody believed that he had the money untouched. He'd no sooner paid it than he fell ill, took to his bed, and, three weeks later, softening of the brain set in, and he died five days afterwards. He was buried with military honors, for he had not had time to receive his discharge. Ten days after his funeral, Katerina Ivanovna, with her aunt and sister, went to Moscow. And, behold, on the very day they went away, I hadn't seen them, didn't see them off or take leave, I received a tiny note, a sheet of thin blue paper, and on it only one line in pencil, I will write to you. Wait. K, and that was all. I'll explain the rest now, in two words. In Moscow their fortunes changed with the swiftness of lightning and the unexpectedness of an Arabian fairy tale. That general's widow, their nearest relation, suddenly lost the two nieces who were her heiresses and next of kin, both died in the same week of smallpox. The old lady, prostrated with grief, welcomed Katia as a daughter, as her one hope, clutched at her, altered her will in Katia's favor. But that concerned the future. Meanwhile she gave her, for present use, 80,000 rubles, as a marriage portion, to do what she liked with. She was an hysterical woman. I saw something of her in Moscow, later. Well, suddenly I received by post 4,500 rubles. I was speechless with surprise, as you may suppose. Three days later came the promised letter. I have it with me now. You must read it. She offers to be my wife, offers herself to me. I love you madly, she says, even if you don't love me, never mind. Be my husband. Don't be afraid. I won't hamper you in any way. I will be your chattel. I will be the carpet under your feet. I want to love you forever. I want to save you from yourself. Alyosha, I am not worthy to repeat those lines in my vulgar words and in my vulgar tone, my everlastingly vulgar tone, that I can never cure myself of. That letter stabs me even now. Do you think I don't mind, that I don't mind still? 
I wrote her an answer at once, as it was impossible for me to go to Moscow. I wrote to her with tears. One thing I shall be ashamed of forever. I referred to her being rich and having a dowry while I was only a stuck-up beggar. I mentioned money, I ought to have borne it in silence, but it slipped from my pen. Then I wrote at once to Ivan, and told him all I could about it in a letter of six pages, and sent him to her. Why do you look like that? Why are you staring at me? Yes, Ivan fell in love with her, he's in love with her still. I know that. I did a stupid thing, in the world's opinion, but perhaps that one stupid thing may be the saving of us all now. Ooh. Don't you see what a lot she thinks of Ivan, how she respects him? When she compares us, do you suppose she can love a man like me, especially after all that has happened here? But I am convinced that she does love a man like you, and not a man like him. She loves her own virtue, not me. The words broke involuntarily, and almost malignantly, from Dmitri. He laughed, but a minute later his eyes gleamed, he flushed crimson and struck the table violently with his fist. I swear, Alyosha, he cried, with intense and genuine anger at himself, you may not believe me, but as God is holy, and as Christ is God, I swear that though I smiled at her lofty sentiments just now, I know that I am a million times baser in soul than she, and that these lofty sentiments of hers are as sincere as a heavenly angel's. That's the tragedy of it, that I know that for certain. What if anyone does show off a bit? Don't I do it myself? And yet I'm sincere, I'm sincere. As for Ivan, I can understand how he must be cursing nature now, with his intellect, too. To see the preference given, to whom, to what? To a monster who, though he is betrothed and all eyes are fixed on him, can't restrain his debaucheries, and before the very eyes of his betrothed. And a man like me is preferred, while he is rejected. And why? Because a girl wants to sacrifice her life and destiny out of gratitude. It's ridiculous. I've never said a word of this to Ivan, and Ivan of course has never dropped a hint of the sort to me. But destiny will be accomplished, and the best man will hold his ground while the undeserving one will vanish into his back alley forever, his filthy back alley, his beloved back alley, where he is at home and where he will sink in filth and stench at his own free will and with enjoyment. I've been talking foolishly. I've no words left. I use them at random, but it will be as I have said. I shall drown in the back alley, and she will marry Ivan. Stop, Dmitri, Alyosha interrupted again with great anxiety. There's one thing you haven't made clear yet, you are still betrothed all the same, aren't you? How can you break off the engagement if she, your betrothed, doesn't want to? Yes, formally and solemnly betrothed. It was all done on my arrival in Moscow, with great ceremony, with icons, all in fine style. The general's wife blessed us, and, would you believe it, congratulated Katya. You've made a good choice, she said, I see right through him. And, would you believe it, she didn't like Ivan, and hardly greeted him. I had a lot of talk with Katya in Moscow. I told her about myself, sincerely, honorably. She listened to everything, there was sweet confusion. There were tender words, though there were proud words, too. She wrung out of me a mighty promise to reform. I gave my promise, and here. What? Why, I called to you and brought you out here today, this very day, remember it, to send you, this very day again, to Katerina Ivanovna, and. What? To tell her that I shall never come to see her again. Say, he sends you his compliments. But is that possible? That's just the reason I'm sending you, in my place, because it's impossible. And, how could I tell her myself? And where are you going? To the back alley. To Grushenka, then. Alyosha exclaimed mournfully, clasping his hands. Can Rakitin really have told the truth? I thought that you had just visited her, and that was all. Can a betrothed man pay such visits? Is such a thing possible and with such a betrothed, and before the eyes of all the world? Confound it, I have some honor. 
As soon as I began visiting Grushenka, I ceased to be betrothed, and to be an honest man. I understand that. Why do you look at me? You see, I went in the first place to beat her. I had heard, and I know for a fact now, that that captain, father's agent, had given Grushenka an IOU of mine for her to sue me for payment, so as to put an end to me. They wanted to scare me. I went to beat her. I had had a glimpse of her before. She doesn't strike one at first sight. I knew about her old merchant, who's lying ill now, paralyzed, but he's leaving her a decent little sum. I knew, too, that she was fond of money, that she hoarded it, and lent it at a wicked rate of interest, that she's a merciless cheat and swindler. I went to beat her, and I stayed. The storm broke, it struck me down like the plague. I'm plague-stricken still, and I know that everything is over, that there will never be anything more for me. The cycle of the ages is accomplished. That's my position. And though I'm a beggar, as fate would have it, I had three thousand just then in my pocket. I drove with Grushenka to Makro, a place twenty-five versts from here. I got gypsies there in champagne and made all the peasants there drunk on it, and all the women and girls. I sent the thousands flying. In three days' time I was stripped bare, but a hero. Do you suppose the hero had gained his end? Not a sign of it from her. I tell you that rogue, Grushenka, has a supple curve all over her body. You can see it in her little foot, even in her little toe. I saw it, and kissed it, but that was all, I swear. I'll marry you if you like, she said, you're a beggar, you know. Say that you won't beat me, and will let me do anything I choose, and perhaps I will marry you. She laughed, and she's laughing still. Dmitri leapt up with a sort of fury. He seemed all at once as though he were drunk. His eyes became suddenly bloodshot, and do you really mean to marry her? At once, if she will. And if she won't, I shall stay all the same. I'll be the porter at her gate. Alyosha, he cried. He stopped short before him, and taking him by the shoulders began shaking him violently. Do you know, you innocent boy, that this is all delirium, senseless delirium, for there's a tragedy here. Let me tell you, Alexei, that I may be a low man, with low and degraded passions, but a thief and a pickpocket Dmitri Karamazov never can be. Well, then, let me tell you that I am a thief and a pickpocket. That very morning, just before I went to beat Grushenka, Katerina Ivanovna sent for me, and in strict secrecy, why I don't know, I suppose she had some reason, asked me to go to the chief town of the province and to post three thousand rubles to Agafya Ivanovna in Moscow, so that nothing should be known of it in the town here. So I had that three thousand rubles in my pocket when I went to see Grushenka, and it was that money we spent at Makro. Afterwards I pretended I had been to the town, but did not show her the post office receipt. I said I had sent the money and would bring the receipt, and so far I haven't brought it. I've forgotten it. Now what do you think you're going to her today to say? He sends his compliments, and she'll ask you, what about the money? You might still have said to her, he's a degraded sensualist, and a low creature, with uncontrolled passions. He didn't send your money then, but wasted it, because, like a low brute, he couldn't control himself. But still you might have added, he isn't a thief though. Here is your three thousand, he sends it back. Send it yourself to Agafya Ivanovna. But he told me to say, he sends his compliments. But, as it is, she will ask, but where is the money? Mitya, you are unhappy, yes. But not as unhappy as you think. Don't worry yourself to death with despair. What, do you suppose I'd shoot myself because I can't get three thousand to pay back? That's just it. I shan't shoot myself. I haven't the strength now. Afterwards, perhaps. But now I'm going to Grushenka. I don't care what happens. And what then? I'll be her husband if she deigns to have me, and when lovers come, I'll go into the next room. I'll clean her friend's galoshes, blow up their samovar, run their errands. Katerina Ivanovna will understand it all, Alyosha said solemnly. 
she'll understand how great this trouble is and will forgive. She has a lofty mind, and no one could be more unhappy than you. She'll see that for herself. She won't forgive everything, said Dmitri, with a grin. There's something in it, brother, that no woman could forgive. Do you know what would be the best thing to do? What? Pay back the three thousand. Where can we get it from? I say, I have two thousand. Ivan will give you another thousand, that makes three. Take it and pay it back. And when would you get it, your three thousand? You're not of age, besides, and you must, you absolutely must, take my farewell to her today, with the money or without it, for I can't drag on any longer, things have come to such a pass. Tomorrow is too late. I shall send you to father. To father? Yes, to father first. Ask him for three thousand. But, Mitya, he won't give it. As though he would. I know he won't. Do you know the meaning of despair, Alexei? Yes. Listen. Legally he owes me nothing. I've had it all from him, I know that. But morally he owes me something, doesn't he? You know he started with twenty-eight thousand of my mother's money and made a hundred thousand with it. Let him give me back only three out of the twenty-eight thousand, and he'll draw my soul out of hell, and it will atone for many of his sins. For that three thousand, I give you my solemn word, I'll make an end of everything, and he shall hear nothing more of me. For the last time I give him the chance to be a father. Tell him God himself sends him this chance. Mitya, he won't give it for anything. I know he won't. I know it perfectly well. Now, especially. That's not all. I know something more. Now, only a few days ago, perhaps only yesterday he found out for the first time in earnest, underline in earnest, that Grushenka is really perhaps not joking, and really means to marry me. He knows her nature, he knows the cat. And do you suppose he's going to give me money to help to bring that about when he's crazy about her himself? And that's not all, either. I can tell you more than that. I know that for the last five days he has had three thousand drawn out of the bank, changed into notes of a hundred rubles, packed into a large envelope, sealed with five seals, and tied across with red tape. You see how well I know all about it. On the envelope is written, to my angel, Grushenka, when she will come to me. He scrawled it himself in silence and in secret, and no one knows that the money's there except the valet, Smerdyakov, whom he trusts like himself. So now he has been expecting Grushenka for the last three or four days, he hopes she'll come for the money. He has sent her word of it, and she has sent him word that perhaps she'll come. And if she does go to the old man, can I marry her after that? You understand now why I'm here in secret and what I'm on the watch for. For her. Yes, for her. Foma has a room in the house of these sluts here. Foma comes from our parts, he was a soldier in our regiment. He does jobs for them. He's watchman at night and goes grouse shooting in the daytime, and that's how he lives. I've established myself in his room. Neither he nor the women of the house know the secret, that is, that I am on the watch here. No one but Smerdyakov knows, then. No one else. He will let me know if she goes to the old man. It was he told you about the money, then? Yes. It's a dead secret. Even Ivan doesn't know about the money, or anything. The old man is sending Ivan to Chermashnya on a two or three days journey. A purchaser has turned up for the cops, he'll give eight thousand for the timber. So the old man keeps asking Ivan to help him by going to arrange it. It will take him two or three days. That's what the old man wants, so that Grushenka can come while he's away. Then he's expecting Grushenka today. No, she won't come today, there are signs. She's certain not to come, cried Mitya suddenly. Smerdyakov thinks so, too. Father's drinking now. He's sitting at table with Ivan. Go to him, Alyosha, and ask for the three thousand. Mitya, dear, what's the matter with you, cried Alyosha, 
jumping up from his place, and looking keenly at his brother's frenzied face. For one moment the thought struck him that Dmitri was mad. What is it? I'm not insane, said Dmitri, looking intently and earnestly at him. No fear. I am sending you to father, and I know what I'm saying. I believe in miracles. In miracles. In a miracle of divine providence. God knows my heart. He sees my despair. He sees the whole picture. Surely he won't let something awful happen. Alyosha, I believe in miracles. Go. I am going. Tell me, will you wait for me here? Yes. I know it will take some time. You can't go at him point blank. He's drunk now. I'll wait three hours, four, five, six, seven. Only remember you must go to Katerina Ivanovna today, if it has to be at midnight, with the money or without the money, and say, he sends his compliments to you. I want you to say that verse to her, he sends his compliments to you. Mitya. And what if Grushenka comes today, if not today, tomorrow, or the next day? Grushenka. I shall see her. I shall rush out and prevent it. And if. If there's an if, it will be murder. I couldn't endure it. Who will be murdered? The old man. I shan't kill her. Brother, what are you saying? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Perhaps I shan't kill, and perhaps I shall. I'm afraid that he will suddenly become so loathsome to me with his face at that moment. I hate his ugly throat, his nose, his eyes, his shameless snigger. I feel a physical repulsion. That's what I'm afraid of. That's what may be too much for me. I'll go, Mitya. I believe that God will order things for the best, that nothing awful may happen. And I will sit and wait for the miracle. And if it doesn't come to pass. Alyosha went thoughtfully towards his father's house. Chapter 6 Smerdyakov. He did in fact find his father still at table. Though there was a dining room in the house, the table was laid as usual in the drawing room, which was the largest room, and furnished with old-fashioned ostentation. The furniture was white and very old, upholstered in old, red, silky material. In the spaces between the windows there were mirrors in elaborate white and gilt frames, of old-fashioned carving. On the walls, covered with white paper, which was torn in many places, there hung two large portraits, one of some prince who had been governor of the district thirty years before, and the other of some bishop, also long since dead. In the corner opposite the door there were several icons, before which a lamp was lighted at nightfall, not so much for devotional purposes as to light the room. Fyodor Pavlovich used to go to bed very late, at three or four o'clock in the morning, and would wander about the room at night or sit in an armchair, thinking. This had become a habit with him. He often slept quite alone in the house, sending his servants to the lodge, but usually Smerdyakov remained, sleeping on a bench in the hall. When Alyosha came in, dinner was over, but coffee and preserves had been served. Fyodor Pavlovich liked sweet things with brandy after dinner. Ivan was also at table, sipping coffee. The servants, Grigory and Smerdyakov, were standing by. Both the gentlemen and the servants seemed in singularly good spirits. Fyodor Pavlovich was roaring with laughter. Before he entered the room, Alyosha heard the shrill laugh he knew so well, and could tell from the sound of it that his father had only reached the good-humoured stage, and was far from being completely drunk. Here he is. Here he is, yelled Fyodor Pavlovich, highly delighted at seeing Alyosha. Join us. Sit down. Coffee is a Lenten dish, but it's hot and good. I don't offer you brandy, you're keeping the fast. But would you like some? No, I'd better give you some of our famous liqueur. Smerdyakov, go to the cupboard, the second shelf on the right. Here are the keys. Look sharp. Alyosha began refusing the liqueur. Never mind. If you won't have it, we will, said Fyodor Pavlovich, beaming. But stay, have you dined? Yes, answered Alyosha, 
who had in truth only eaten a piece of bread and drunk a glass of quas in the father superior's kitchen. Though I should be pleased to have some hot coffee. Bravo, my darling. He'll have some coffee. Does it want warming? No, it's boiling. It's capital coffee, Smirdyakov's making. My Smirdyakov's an artist at coffee and at fish patties, and at fish soup, too. You must come one day and have some fish soup. Let me know beforehand. But, stay, didn't I tell you this morning to come home with your mattress and pillow and all? Have you brought your mattress? He he he. No, I haven't, said Alyosha, smiling, too. Ah, but you were frightened, you were frightened this morning, weren't you? There, my darling, I couldn't do anything to vex you. Do you know, Ivan, I can't resist the way he looks one straight in the face and laughs. It makes me laugh all over. I'm so fond of him. Alyosha, let me give you my blessing, a father's blessing. Alyosha rose, but Fyodor Pavlovich had already changed his mind. No, no, he said. I'll just make the sign of the cross over you, for now. Sit still. Now we've a treat for you, in your own line, too. It'll make you laugh. Balaam's ass has begun talking to us here, and how he talks. How he talks. Balaam's ass, it appeared, was the valet, Smerdyakov. He was a young man of about four and twenty, remarkably unsociable and taciturn. Not that he was shy or bashful. On the contrary, he was conceited and seemed to despise everybody. But we must pause to say a few words about him now. He was brought up by Grigory and Marfa, but the boy grew up with no sense of gratitude, as Grigory expressed it, he was an unfriendly boy, and seemed to look at the world mistrustfully. In his childhood he was very fond of hanging cats, and burying them with great ceremony. He used to dress up in a sheet as though it were a surplus, and sang, and waved some object over the dead cat as though it were a censer. All this he did on the sly, with the greatest secrecy. Grigory caught him once at this diversion and gave him a sound beating. He shrank into a corner and sulked there for a week. He doesn't care for you or me, the monster, Grigory used to say to Marfa, and he doesn't care for anyone. Are you a human being, he said, addressing the boy directly. You're not a human being. You grew from the mildew in the bathhouse, too, that's what you are. Smerdyakov, it appeared afterwards, could never forgive him those words. Grigory taught him to read and write, and when he was twelve years old, began teaching him the scriptures. But this teaching came to nothing. At the second or third lesson the boy suddenly grinned. What's that for? asked Grigory, looking at him threateningly from under his spectacles. Oh, nothing. God created light on the first day, and the sun, moon, and stars on the fourth day. Where did the light come from on the first day? Grigory was thunderstruck. The boy looked sarcastically at his teacher. There was something positively condescending in his expression. Grigory could not restrain himself. I'll show you where, he cried, and gave the boy a violent slap on the cheek. The boy took the slap without a word, but withdrew into his corner again for some days. A week later he had his first attack of the disease to which he was subject all the rest of his life, epilepsy. When Fyodor Pavlovich heard of it, his attitude to the boy seemed changed at once. Till then he had taken no notice of him, though he never scolded him, and always gave him a kopeck when he met him. Sometimes, when he was in good humor, he would send the boy something sweet from his table. But as soon as he heard of his illness, he showed an active interest in him, sent for a doctor, and tried remedies, but the disease turned out to be incurable. The fits occurred, on an average, once a month, but at various intervals. The fits varied too, in violence, some were light and some were very severe. Fyodor Pavlovich strictly forbade Grigory to use corporal punishment to the boy, and began allowing him to come upstairs to him. He forbade him to be taught anything whatever for a time, too. One day when the boy was about fifteen, Fyodor Pavlovich noticed him lingering by the bookcase, and reading the titles through the glass. Fyodor Pavlovich had a fair number of books, over a hundred, 
but no one ever saw him reading. He at once gave Smerdyakov the key of the bookcase. Come, read. You shall be my librarian. You'll be better sitting reading than hanging about the courtyard. Come, read this, and Fyodor Pavlovich gave him evenings in a cottage near Dekanka. He read a little but didn't like it. He did not once smile, and ended by frowning. Why? Isn't it funny? asked Fyodor Pavlovich. Smerdyakov did not speak. Answer, stupid. It's all untrue, mumbled the boy, with a grin. Then go to the devil. You have the soul of a lackey. Stay, here's Smaragdov's universal history. That's all true. Read that. But Smerdyakov did not get through ten pages of Smaragdov. He thought it dull. So the bookcase was closed again. Shortly afterwards Marfa and Grigory reported to Fyodor Pavlovich that Smerdyakov was gradually beginning to show an extraordinary fastidiousness. He would sit before his soup, take up his spoon and look into the soup, bend over it, examine it, take a spoonful and hold it to the light. What is it? A beetle? Grigory would ask. A fly, perhaps, observed Marfa. The squeamish youth never answered, but he did the same with his bread, his meat, and everything he ate. He would hold a piece on his fork to the light, scrutinize it microscopically, and only after long deliberation decide to put it in his mouth. A.C.H. What fine gentleman's airs! Grigory muttered, looking at him. When Fyodor Pavlovich heard of this development in Smerdyakov he determined to make him his cook, and sent him to Moscow to be trained. He spent some years there and came back remarkably changed in appearance. He looked extraordinarily old for his age. His face had grown wrinkled, yellow, and strangely emasculate. In character he seemed almost exactly the same as before he went away. He was just as unsociable, and showed not the slightest inclination for any companionship. In Moscow, too, as we heard afterwards, he had always been silent. Moscow itself had little interest for him, he saw very little there, and took scarcely any notice of anything. He went once to the theatre, but returned silent and displeased with it. On the other hand, he came back to us from Moscow well dressed, in a clean coat and clean linen. He brushed his clothes most scrupulously twice a day invariably, and was very fond of cleaning his smart calf boots with a special English polish, so that they shone like mirrors. He turned out a first rate cook. Fyodor Pavlovich paid him a salary, almost the whole of which Smerdyakov spent on clothes, pomade, perfumes, and such things. But he seemed to have as much contempt for the female sex as for men, he was discreet, almost unapproachable, with them. Fyodor Pavlovich began to regard him rather differently. His fits were becoming more frequent, and on the days he was ill Marfa cooked, which did not suit Fyodor Pavlovich at all. Why are your fits getting worse? asked Fyodor Pavlovich, looking askance at his new cook. Would you like to get married? Shall I find you a wife? But Smerdyakov turned pale with anger, and made no reply. Fyodor Pavlovich left him with an impatient gesture. The great thing was that he had absolute confidence in his honesty. It happened once, when Fyodor Pavlovich was drunk, that he dropped in the muddy courtyard 300 ruble notes which he had only just received. He only missed them next day, and was just hastening to search his pockets when he saw the notes lying on the table. Where had they come from? Smerdyakov had picked them up and brought them in the day before. Well, my lad, I've never met anyone like you, Fyodor Pavlovich said shortly, and gave him ten rubles. We may add that he not only believed in his honesty, but had, for some reason, a liking for him, although the young man looked as morosely at him as at every one and was always silent. He rarely spoke. If it had occurred to anyone to wonder at the time what the young man was interested in, and what was in his mind, it would have been impossible to tell by looking at him. Yet he used sometimes to stop suddenly in the house, or even in the yard or street, and would stand still for ten minutes, lost in thought. A physiognomist studying his face would have said that there was no thought in it, no reflection, but only a sort of contemplation. There is a remarkable picture by the painter Kramskoy, called, Contemplation. There is a forest in winter, 
and on a roadway through the forest, in absolute solitude, stands a peasant in a torn kaftan and bark shoes. He stands, as it were, lost in thought. Yet he is not thinking, he is, contemplating. If any one touched him he would start and look at one as though awakening and bewildered. It's true he would come to himself immediately, but if he were asked what he had been thinking about, he would remember nothing. Yet probably he has, hidden within himself, the impression which had dominated him during the period of contemplation. Those impressions are dear to him and no doubt he hoards them imperceptibly, and even unconsciously. How and why, of course, he does not know either. He may suddenly, after hoarding impressions for many years, abandon everything and go off to Jerusalem on a pilgrimage for his soul's salvation, or perhaps he will suddenly set fire to his native village, and perhaps do both. There are a good many contemplatives among the peasantry. Well, Smerdyakov was probably one of them, and he probably was greedily hoarding up his impressions, hardly knowing why. Chapter 7 The Controversy But Balaam's ass had suddenly spoken. The subject was a strange one. Grigory had gone in the morning to make purchases, and had heard from the shopkeeper Lukyanov the story of a Russian soldier which had appeared in the newspaper of that day. This soldier had been taken prisoner in some remote part of Asia, and was threatened with an immediate agonizing death if he did not renounce Christianity and follow Islam. He refused to deny his faith, and was tortured, flayed alive, and died, praising and glorifying Christ. Grigory had related the story at table. Fyodor Pavlovich always liked, over the dessert after dinner, to laugh and talk, if only with Grigory. This afternoon he was in a particularly good-humored and expansive mood. Sipping his brandy and listening to the story, he observed that they ought to make a saint of a soldier like that, and to take his skin to some monastery. That would make the people flock, and bring the money in. Grigory frowned, seeing that Fyodor Pavlovich was by no means touched, but, as usual, was beginning to scoff. At that moment Smerdyakov, who was standing by the door, smiled. Smerdyakov often waited at table towards the end of dinner, and since Ivan's arrival in our town he had done so every day. What are you grinning at? asked Fyodor Pavlovich, catching the smile instantly, and knowing that it referred to Grigory. Well, my opinion is, Smerdyakov began suddenly and unexpectedly in a loud voice, that if that laudable soldier's exploit was so very great there would have been, to my thinking, no sin in it if he had on such an emergency renounced, so to speak, the name of Christ and his own christening, to save by that same his life, for good deeds, by which, in the course of years to expiate his cowardice. How could it not be a sin? You're talking nonsense. For that you'll go straight to hell and be roasted there like mutton, put in Fyodor Pavlovich. It was at this point that Alyosha came in, and Fyodor Pavlovich, as we have seen, was highly delighted at his appearance. We're on your subject, your subject, he chuckled gleefully, making Alyosha sit down to listen. As for mutton, that's not so, and there'll be nothing there for this, and there shouldn't be either, if it's according to justice, Smerdyakov maintained stoutly. How do you mean, according to justice? Fyodor Pavlovich cried still more gaily, nudging Alyosha with his knee. He's a rascal, that's what he is, burst from Grigory. He looked Smerdyakov wrathfully in the face. As for being a rascal, wait a little, Grigory Vasilyevich, answered Smerdyakov with perfect composure. You'd better consider yourself that, once I am taken prisoner by the enemies of the Christian race, and they demand for me to curse the name of God and to renounce my holy christening, I am fully entitled to act by my own reason, since there would be no sin in it. But you've said that before. Don't waste words. Prove it, cried Fyodor Pavlovich. Soupmaker, muttered Grigory contemptuously. As for being a soupmaker, wait a bit, too, and consider for yourself, Grigory Vasilyevich, without abusing me. For as soon as I say to those enemies, no, I'm not a Christian, and I curse my true God, then at once, by God's high judgment, I become immediately and specially anathema accursed, and am cut off from the Holy Church, exactly as though I were a heathen, so that at that very instant, not only when I say it aloud, but when I think of saying it, before a quarter of a second has passed, I am cut off. Is that so or not? Grigory Vasilyevich. 
He addressed Grigory with obvious satisfaction, though he was really answering Fyodor Pavlovich's questions, and was well aware of it, and intentionally pretending that Grigory had asked the questions. Ivan, cried Fyodor Pavlovich suddenly, stoop down for me to whisper. He's got this all up for your benefit. He wants you to praise him. Praise him. Ivan listened with perfect seriousness to his father's excited whisper. Stay, Smerdyakov, be quiet a minute, cried Fyodor Pavlovich once more. Ivan, your ear again. Ivan bent down again with a perfectly grave face. I love you as I do Alyosha. Don't think I don't love you. Some brandy. Yes, Dot, but you're rather drunk yourself, thought Ivan, looking steadily at his father. He was watching Smerdyakov with great curiosity. Your anathema accursed, as it is, Grigory suddenly burst out, and how dare you argue, you rascal, after that, if. Don't scold him, Grigory, don't scold him, Fyodor Pavlovich cut him short. You should wait, Grigory Vasilyevich, if only a short time, and listen, for I haven't finished all I had to say. For at the very moment I become accursed, at that same highest moment, I become exactly like a heathen, and my christening is taken off me and becomes of no avail. Isn't that so? Make haste and finish, my boy, Fyodor Pavlovich urged him, sipping from his wine glass with relish. And if I've ceased to be a Christian, then I told no lie to the enemy when they asked whether I was a Christian or not a Christian, seeing I had already been relieved by God himself of my Christianity by reason of the thought alone, before I had time to utter a word to the enemy. And if I have already been discharged, in what manner and with what sort of justice can I be held responsible as a Christian in the other world for having denied Christ, when, through the very thought alone, before denying him I have been relieved from my christening. If I'm no longer a Christian, then I can't renounce Christ, for I've nothing then to renounce. Who will hold an unclean Tatar responsible, Grigory Vasilyevich, even in heaven, for not having been born a Christian? And who would punish him for that, considering that you can't take two skins off one ox? For God Almighty himself, even if he did make the Tatar responsible, when he dies would give him the smallest possible punishment, I imagine, since he must be punished, judging that he is not to blame if he has come into the world an unclean heathen, from heathen parents. The Lord God can't surely take a Tatar and say he was a Christian. That would mean that the Almighty would tell a real untruth. And can the Lord of heaven and earth tell a lie, even in one word? Grigory was thunderstruck and looked at the orator, his eyes nearly starting out of his head. Though he did not clearly understand what was said, he had caught something in this rigmarole, and stood, looking like a man who has just hit his head against a wall. Fyodor Pavlovich emptied his glass and went off into his shrill laugh. Alyosha! Alyosha! What do you say to that? Ah, you casuist! He must have been with the Jesuits, somewhere, Ivan. Oh, you stinking Jesuit, who taught you? But you're talking nonsense, you casuist, nonsense, nonsense, nonsense. Don't cry, Grigory, we'll reduce him to smoke and ashes in a moment. Tell me this, O oh ass, you may be right before your enemies, but you have renounced your faith all the same in your own heart, and you say yourself that in that very hour you became anathema accursed. And if once you're anathema they won't pat you on the head for it in hell. What do you say to that, my fine Jesuit? There is no doubt that I have renounced it in my own heart, but there was no special sin in that. Or if there was sin, it was the most ordinary. How's that the most ordinary? You lie, accursed one, hissed Grigory. Consider yourself, Grigory Vasilyevich, Smerdyakov went on, stayed and unruffled, conscious of his triumph, but, as it were, generous to the vanquished foe. Consider yourself, Grigory Vasilyevich, it is said in the scripture that if you have faith, even as a mustard seed, and bid a mountain move into the sea, it will move without the least delay at your bidding. Well, Grigory Vasilyevich, if I am without faith and you have so great a faith that you are continually swearing at me, you try yourself telling this mountain, not to move into the sea for that's a long way off, but even to our stinking little river which runs at the bottom of the garden. You'll see for yourself that it won't budge, but will remain just where it is however much you shout at it, and that shows, 
Grigory Vasilyevich, that you haven't faith in the proper manner, and only abuse others about it. Again, taking into consideration that no one in our day, not only you, but actually no one, from the highest person to the lowest peasant, can shove mountains into the sea, except perhaps some one man in the world, or, at most, two, and they most likely are saving their souls in secret somewhere in the Egyptian desert, so you wouldn't find them, if so it be, if all the rest have no faith, will God curse all the rest? That is, the population of the whole earth, except about two hermits in the desert, and in his well-known mercy will he not forgive one of them? And so I'm persuaded that though I may once have doubted I shall be forgiven if I shed tears of repentance. Stay, cried Fyodor Pavlovich, in a transport of delight. So you do suppose there are two who can move mountains? Ivan, make a note of it, write it down. There you have the Russian all over. You're quite right in saying it's characteristic of the people's faith, Ivan assented, with an approving smile. You agree. Then it must be so, if you agree. It's true, isn't it, Alyosha? That's the Russian faith all over, isn't it? No, Smirdyakov has not the Russian faith at all, said Alyosha firmly and gravely. I'm not talking about his faith. I mean those two in the desert, only that idea. Surely that's Russian, isn't it? Yes, that's purely Russian, said Alyosha smiling. Your words are worth a gold piece, oh ass, and I'll give it to you today. But as to the rest you talk nonsense, nonsense, nonsense. Let me tell you, stupid, that we here are all of little faith, only from carelessness, because we haven't time, things are too much for us, and, in the second place, the Lord God has given us so little time, only twenty-four hours in the day, so that one hasn't even time to get sleep enough, much less to repent of one's sins. While you have denied your faith to your enemies and you'd nothing else to think about but to show your faith. So I consider, brother, that it constitutes a sin. Constitute a sin it may, but consider yourself, Grigory Vasilyevich, that it only extenuates it, if it does constitute. If I had believed then in very truth, as I ought to have believed, then it really would have been sinful if I had not faced tortures for my faith, and had gone over to the pagan Mohammedan faith. But, of course, it wouldn't have come to torture then, because I should only have had to say at that instant to the mountain, move and crush the tormentor, and it would have moved and at the very instant have crushed him like a black beetle, and I should have walked away as though nothing had happened, praising and glorifying God. But, suppose at that very moment I had tried all that, and cried to that mountain, crush these tormentors, and it hadn't crushed them, how could I have helped doubting, pray, at such a time, and at such a dread hour of mortal terror? And apart from that, I should know already that I could not attain to the fullness of the kingdom of heaven, for since the mountain had not moved at my word, they could not think very much of my faith up aloft, and there could be no very great reward awaiting me in the world to come. So why should I let them flay the skin off me as well, and to no good purpose? For, even though they had flayed my skin half off my back, even then the mountain would not have moved at my word or at my cry. And at such a moment not only doubt might come over one but one might lose one's reason from fear, so that one would not be able to think at all. And, therefore, how should I be particularly to blame if not seeing my advantage or reward there or here, I should, at least, save my skin. And so trusting fully in the grace of the Lord I should cherish the hope that I might be altogether forgiven. Chapter 8 Over the Brandy The controversy was over. But, strange to say, Fyodor Pavlovich, who had been so gay, suddenly began frowning. He frowned and gulped brandy, and it was already a glass too much. Get along with you, Jesuits, he cried to the servants. Go away, Smerdyakov. I'll send you the gold piece I promised you today, but be off. Don't cry, Grigory. Go to Marfa. She'll comfort you and put you to bed. The rascals won't let us sit in peace after dinner, he snapped peevishly, as the servants promptly withdrew at his word. Smerdyakov always pokes himself in now, after dinner. It's you he's so interested in. What have you done to fascinate him, he added to Ivan. Nothing whatever, answered Ivan. He's pleased to have a high opinion of me, he's a lackey and a mean soul. Raw material for revolution, 
however, when the time comes. For revolution. There will be others and better ones. But there will be some like him as well. His kind will come first, and better ones after. And when will the time come? The rocket will go off and fizzle out, perhaps. The peasants are not very fond of listening to these soup makers, so far. Ah, brother, but a Balaam's ass like that thinks and thinks, and the devil knows where he gets to. He's storing up ideas, said Ivan, smiling. You see, I know he can't bear me, nor anyone else, even you, though you fancy that he has a high opinion of you. Worse still with Alyosha, he despises Alyosha. But he doesn't steal, that's one thing, and he's not a gossip, he holds his tongue, and doesn't wash our dirty linen in public. He makes capital fish pasties too. But, damn him, is he worth talking about so much? Of course he isn't. And as for the ideas he may be hatching, the Russian peasant, generally speaking, needs thrashing. That I've always maintained. Our peasants are swindlers, and don't deserve to be pitted, and it's a good thing they're still flogged sometimes. Russia is rich in birches. If they destroyed the forests, it would be the ruin of Russia. I stand up for the clever people. We've left off thrashing the peasants, we've grown so clever, but they go on thrashing themselves. And a good thing too. For with what measure ye meet it shall be measured to you again, or how does it go? Anyhow, it will be measured. But Russia's all swinishness. My dear, if you only knew how I hate Russia. That is, not Russia, but all this vice. But maybe I mean Russia. Tout Sela say de la coconnerie. Do you know what I like? I like wit. You've had another glass. That's enough. Wait a bit. I'll have one more, and then another, and then I'll stop. No, stay, you interrupted me. At Macro I was talking to an old man, and he told me, there's nothing we like so much as sentencing girls to be thrashed, and we always give the lads the job of thrashing them. And the girl he has thrashed today, the young man will ask in marriage tomorrow. So it quite suits the girls, too, he said. There's a set of desadas for you. But it's clever, anyway. Shall we go over and have a look at it, eh? Alyosha, are you blushing? Don't be bashful, child. I'm sorry I didn't stay to dinner at the superiors and tell the monks about the girls at Makro. Alyosha, don't be angry that I offended your superior this morning. I lost my temper. If there is a God, if he exists, then, of course, I'm to blame, and I shall have to answer for it. But if there isn't a God at all, what do they deserve, your fathers? It's not enough to cut their heads off, for they keep back progress. Would you believe it, Ivan, that that lacerates my sentiments? No, you don't believe it as I see from your eyes. You believe what people say, that I'm nothing but a buffoon. Alyosha, do you believe that I'm nothing but a buffoon? No, I don't believe it. And I believe you don't, and that you speak the truth. You look sincere and you speak sincerely. But not Ivan. Ivan's supercilious. I'd make an end of your monks, though, all the same. I'd take all that mystic stuff and suppress it, once for all, all over Russia, so as to bring all the fools to reason. And the gold and the silver that would flow into the mint. But why suppress it? asked Ivan. That truth may prevail. That's why. Well, if truth were to prevail, you know, you'd be the first to be robbed and suppressed. Ah. I dare say you're right. Ah, I'm an ass, burst out Fyodor Pavlovich, striking himself lightly on the forehead. Well, your monastery may stand then, Alyosha, if that's how it is. And we clever people will sit snug and enjoy our brandy. You know, Ivan, it must have been so ordained by the Almighty himself. Ivan, speak, is there a God or not? Stay, speak the truth, speak seriously. Why are you laughing again? I'm laughing that you should have made a clever remark just now about Smerdyakov's belief in the existence of two saints who could move mountains. Why, am I like him now, then? 
very much. Well, that shows I'm a Russian, too, and I have a Russian characteristic. And you may be caught in the same way, though you are a philosopher. Shall I catch you? What do you bet that I'll catch you tomorrow? Speak, all the same, is there a God, or not? Only, be serious. I want you to be serious now. No, there is no God. Alyosha, is there a God? There is. Ivan, and is there immortality of some sort, just a little, just a tiny bit? There is no immortality either. None at all. None at all. There's absolute nothingness then. Perhaps there is just something. Anything is better than nothing. Absolute nothingness. Alyosha, is there immortality? There is. God and immortality. God and immortality. In God is immortality. Hum. It's more likely Ivan's right. Good Lord. To think what faith, what force of all kinds, man has lavished for nothing, on that dream, and for how many thousand years. Who is it laughing at man? Ivan. For the last time, once for all, is there a God or not? I ask for the last time. And for the last time there is not. Who is laughing at mankind, Ivan? It must be the devil, said Ivan, smiling. And the devil? Does he exist? No, there's no devil either. It's a pity. Damn it all, what wouldn't I do to the man who first invented God? Hanging on a bitter aspen tree would be too good for him. There would have been no civilization if they hadn't invented God. Wouldn't there have been? Without God? No. And there would have been no brandy either. But I must take your brandy away from you, anyway. Stop, 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 dear boy, one more little glass. I've hurt Alyosha's feelings. You're not angry with me, Alyosha. My dear little Alexei. No, I am not angry. I know your thoughts. Your heart is better than your head. My heart better than my head, is it? Oh, Lord. And that from you. Ivan, do you love Alyosha? Yes. You must love him, Fyodor Pavlovich was by this time very drunk. Listen, Alyosha, I was rude to your elder this morning. But I was excited. But there's wit in that elder, don't you think, Ivan? Very likely. There is, there is. I-L-Y-A du Pyron Lodadon. He's a Jesuit, a Russian one, that is. As he's an honorable person there's a hidden indignation boiling within him at having to pretend and affect holiness. But, of course, he believes in God. Not a bit of it. Didn't you know? Why, he tells everyone so, himself. That is, not everyone, but all the clever people who come to him. He said straight out to Governor Schultz not long ago, Credo, but I don't know in what. Really? He really did. But I respect him. There's something of Mephistopheles about him, or rather of, the hero of our time. Arbanin, or what's his name? You see, he's a sensualist. He's such a sensualist that I should be afraid for my daughter or my wife if she went to confess to him. You know, when he begins telling stories. The year before last he invited us to tea, tea with liqueur, the ladies sent him liqueur, and began telling us about old times till we nearly split our sides. Especially how he once cured a paralyzed woman. If my legs were not bad I know a dance I could dance you, he said. What do you say to that? I've plenty of tricks in my time, said he. He did Dernadov, the merchant, out of sixty thousand. What, he stole it. He brought him the money as a man he could trust, saying, take care of it for me, friend, there'll be a police search at my place tomorrow. And he kept it. You have given it to the church, he declared. I said to him, you're a scoundrel, I said. No, said he, I'm not a scoundrel, but I'm broad-minded. But that wasn't he, that was someone else. I've muddled him with someone else, without noticing it. 
Come, another glass and that's enough. Take away the bottle, Ivan. I've been telling lies. Why didn't you stop me, Ivan, and tell me I was lying? I knew you'd stop of yourself. That's a lie. You did it from spite, from simple spite against me. You despise me. You have come to me and despised me in my own house. Well, I'm going away. You've had too much brandy. I've begged you for Christ's sake to go to Chermashnya for a day or two, and you don't go. I'll go tomorrow if you're so set upon it. You won't go. You want to keep an eye on me. That's what you want, spiteful fellow. That's why you won't go. The old man persisted. He had reached that state of drunkenness when the drunkard who has till then been inoffensive tries to pick a quarrel and to assert himself. Why are you looking at me? Why do you look like that? Your eyes look at me and say, you ugly drunkard. Your eyes are mistrustful. They're contemptuous. You've come here with some design. Alyosha, here, looks at me and his eyes shine. Alyosha doesn't despise me. Alexei, you mustn't love Ivan. Don't be ill-tempered with my brother. Leave off attacking him, Alyosha said emphatically. Oh, all right. Ugh, my head aches. Take away the brandy, Ivan. It's the third time I've told you. He mused, and suddenly a slow, cunning grin spread over his face. Don't be angry with a feeble old man, Ivan. I know you don't love me, but don't be angry all the same. You've nothing to love me for. You go to Chermashnya. I'll come to you myself and bring you a present. I'll show you a little wench there. I've had my eye on her a long time. She's still running about barefoot. Don't be afraid of barefooted wenches, don't despise them, they're pearls. And he kissed his hand with a smack. To my thinking, he revived at once, seeming to grow sober the instant he touched on his favorite topic. To my thinking. Ah, you boys. You children, little sucking pigs, to my thinking. I never thought a woman ugly in my life, that's been my rule. Can you understand that? How could you understand it? You've milk in your veins, not blood. You're not out of your shells yet. My rule has been that you can always find something devilishly interesting in every woman that you wouldn't find in any other. Only, one must know how to find it, that's the point. That's a talent. To my mind there are no ugly women. The very fact that she is a woman is half the battle, but how could you understand that? Even in V.A.'s fias, even in them you may discover something that makes you simply wonder that men have been such fools as to let them grow old without noticing them. Barefooted girls or unattractive ones, you must take by surprise. Didn't you know that? You must astound them till they're fascinated, upset, ashamed that such a gentleman should fall in love with such a little slut. It's a jolly good thing that there always are and will be masters and slaves in the world, so there always will be a little maid with of all work and her master, and you know, that's all that's needed for happiness. Stay, listen, Alyosha, I always used to surprise your mother, but in a different way. I paid no attention to her at all, but all at once, when the minute came, I'd be all devotion to her, crawl on my knees, kiss her feet, and I always, always, I remember it as though it were today, reduced her to that tinkling, quiet, nervous, queer little laugh. It was peculiar to her. I knew her attacks always used to begin like that. The next day she would begin shrieking hysterically, and this little laugh was not a sign of delight, though it made a very good counterfeit. That's the great thing, to know how to take every one. Once Belayevsky, he was a handsome fellow, and rich, used to like to come here and hang about her, suddenly gave me a slap in the face in her presence. And she, such a mild sheep, why, I thought she would have knocked me down for that blow. How she said on me. You're beaten, beaten now, she said. You've taken a blow from him. You have been trying to sell me to him, she said. And how dared he strike you in my presence. Don't dare come near me again, never, never. Run at once, challenge him to a duel. I took her to the monastery then to bring her to her senses. 
the Holy Fathers prayed her back to reason. But I swear, by God, Alyosha, I never insulted the poor crazy girl. Only once, perhaps, in the first year, then she was very fond of praying. She used to keep the feasts of Our Lady particularly and used to turn me out of her room then. I'll knock that mysticism out of her, thought I. Here, said I, you see your holy image. Here it is. Here I take it down, you believe it's miraculous, but here, I'll spit on it directly and nothing will happen to me for it. When she saw it, good Lord. I thought she would kill me. But she only jumped up, wrung her hands, then suddenly hid her face in them, began trembling all over and fell on the floor, fell all of a heap. Alyosha, Alyosha, what's the matter? The old man jumped up in alarm. From the time he had begun speaking about his mother, a change had gradually come over Alyosha's face. He flushed crimson, his eyes glowed, his lips quivered. The old sot had gone spluttering on, noticing nothing, till the moment when something very strange happened to Alyosha. Precisely what he was describing in the crazy woman was suddenly repeated with Alyosha. He jumped up from his seat exactly as his mother was said to have done, wrung his hands, hid his face in them, and fell back in his chair, shaking all over in an hysterical paroxysm of sudden violent, silent weeping. His extraordinary resemblance to his mother particularly impressed the old man. Ivan, Ivan. Water, quickly. It's like her, exactly as she used to be then, his mother. Spurt some water on him from your mouth, that's what I used to do to her. He's upset about his mother, his mother, he muttered to Ivan. But she was my mother, too, I believe, his mother. Was she not, said Ivan, with uncontrolled anger and contempt. The old man shrank before his flashing eyes. But something very strange had happened, though only for a second, it seemed really to have escaped the old man's mind that Alyosha's mother actually was the mother of Ivan too. Your mother, he muttered, not understanding. What do you mean? What mother are you talking about? Was she? Why, damn it! Of course she was yours too. Damn it! My mind has never been so darkened before. Excuse me, why, I was thinking, Ivan. He he he. He stopped. A broad, drunken, half-senseless grin overspread his face. At that moment a fearful noise and clamor was heard in the hall, there were violent shouts, the door was flung open, and Dmitri burst into the room. The old man rushed to Ivan in terror. He'll kill me. He'll kill me. Don't let him get at me, he screamed, clinging to the skirt of Ivan's coat. Chapter 9 The Sensualists Grigory and Smerdyakov ran into the room after Dmitri. They had been struggling with him in the passage, refusing to admit him, acting on instructions given them by Fyodor Pavlovich some days before. Taking advantage of the fact that Dmitri stopped a moment on entering the room to look about him, Grigory ran round the table, closed the double doors on the opposite side of the room leading to the inner apartments, and stood before the closed doors, stretching wide his arms, prepared to defend the entrance, so to speak, with the last drop of his blood. Seeing this, Dmitri uttered a scream rather than a shout and rushed at Grigory. Then she's there. She's hidden there. Out of the way, scoundrel. He tried to pull Grigory away, but the old servant pushed him back. Beside himself with fury, Dmitri struck out, and hit Grigory with all his might. The old man fell like a log, and Dmitri, leaping over him, broke in the door. Smerdyakov remained pale and trembling at the other end of the room, huddling close to Fyodor Pavlovich. She's here, shouted Dmitri. I saw her turn towards the house just now, but I couldn't catch her. Where is she? Where is she? That shout, she's here, produced an indescribable effect on Fyodor Pavlovich. All his terror left him. Hold him. Hold him, he cried, and dashed after Dmitri. Meanwhile Grigory had got up from the floor, but still seemed stunned. Ivan and Alyosha ran after their father. In the third room something was heard to fall on the floor with a ringing crash, it was a large glass vase, not an expensive one, on a marble pedestal which Dmitri had upset as he ran past it. 
At him, shouted the old man. Help! Ivan and Alyosha caught the old man and were forcibly bringing him back. Why do you run after him? He'll murder you outright, Ivan cried wrathfully at his father. Ivan! Alyosha! She must be here. Grushenka's here. He said he saw her himself, running. He was choking. He was not expecting Grushenka at the time, and the sudden news that she was here made him beside himself. He was trembling all over. He seemed frantic. But you've seen for yourself that she hasn't come, cried Ivan. But she may have come by that other entrance. You know that entrance is locked, and you have the key. Dmitri suddenly reappeared in the drawing room. He had, of course, found the other entrance locked, and the key actually was in Fyodor Pavlovich's pocket. The windows of all the rooms were also closed, so Grushenka could not have come in anywhere nor have run out anywhere. Hold him, shrieked Fyodor Pavlovich, as soon as he saw him again. He's been stealing money in my bedroom. And tearing himself from Ivan he rushed again at Dmitri. But Dmitri threw up both hands and suddenly clutched the old man by the two tufts of hair that remained on his temples, tugged at them, and flung him with a crash on the floor. He kicked him two or three times with his heel in the face. The old man moaned shrilly. Ivan, though not so strong as Dmitri, threw his arms round him, and with all his might pulled him away. Alyosha helped him with his slender strength, holding Dmitri in front. Madman! You've killed him, cried Ivan. Serve him right, shouted Dmitri breathlessly. If I haven't killed him, I'll come again and kill him. You can't protect him. Dmitri! Go away at once, cried Alyosha commandingly. Alexei! You tell me. It's only you I can believe, was she here just now, or not? I saw her myself creeping this way by the fence from the lane. I shouted, she ran away. I swear she's not been here, and no one expected her. But I saw her. So she must. I'll find out at once where she is. Goodbye, Alexei. Not a word to Aesop about the money now. But go to Katerina Ivanovna at once and be sure to say, he sends his compliments to you. Compliments, his compliments. Just compliments and farewell. Describe the scene to her. Meanwhile Ivan and Grigory had raised the old man and seated him in an armchair. His face was covered with blood, but he was conscious and listened greedily to Dmitri's cries. He was still fancying that Grushenka really was somewhere in the house. Dmitri looked at him with hatred as he went out. I don't repent shedding your blood, he cried. Beware, old man, beware of your dream, for I have my dream, too. I curse you, and disown you altogether. He ran out of the room. She's here. She must be here. Smerdyakov. Smerdyakov, the old man wheezed, scarcely audibly, beckoning to him with his finger. No, she's not here, you old lunatic. Ivan shouted at him angrily. Here, he's fainting. Water. A towel. Make haste, Smerdyakov. Smerdyakov ran for water. At last they got the old man undressed, and put him to bed. They wrapped a wet towel round his head. Exhausted by the brandy, by his violent emotion, and the blows he had received, he shut his eyes and fell asleep as soon as his head touched the pillow. Ivan and Alyosha went back to the drawing room. Smerdyakov removed the fragments of the broken vase, while Grigory stood by the table looking gloomily at the floor. Shouldn't you put a wet bandage on your head and go to bed, too? Alyosha said to him. We'll look after him. My brother gave you a terrible blow, on the head. He's insulted me. Grigory articulated gloomily and distinctly. He's insulted his father, not only you, observed Ivan with a forced smile. I used to wash him in his tub. He's insulted me, repeated Grigory. Damn it all, if I hadn't pulled him away perhaps he'd have murdered him. It wouldn't take much to do for Aesop, would it? whispered Ivan to Alyosha. God forbid, cried Alyosha. Why should he forbid? Ivan went on in the same whisper, with a malignant grimace. 
one reptile will devour the other. And serve them both right, too. Alyosha shuddered. Of course I won't let him be murdered as I didn't just now. Stay here, Alyosha, I'll go for a turn in the yard. My head's begun to ache. Alyosha went to his father's bedroom and sat by his bedside behind the screen for about an hour. The old man suddenly opened his eyes and gazed for a long while at Alyosha, evidently remembering meditating. All at once his face betrayed extraordinary excitement. Alyosha, he whispered apprehensively, where's Ivan? In the yard. He's got a headache. He's on the watch. Give me that looking glass. It stands over there. Give it me. Alyosha gave him a little round folding looking glass which stood on the chest of drawers. The old man looked at himself in it, his nose was considerably swollen, and on the left side of his forehead there was a rather large crimson bruise. What does Ivan say? Alyosha, my dear, my only son, I'm afraid of Ivan. I'm more afraid of Ivan than the other. You're the only one I'm not afraid of. Don't be afraid of Ivan either. He is angry, but he'll defend you. Alyosha, and what of the other? He's run to Grushenka. My angel, tell me the truth, was she here just now or not? No one has seen her. It was a mistake. She has not been here. You know Mitya wants to marry her, to marry her. She won't marry him. She won't. She won't. She won't. She won't on any account. The old man fairly fluttered with joy, as though nothing more comforting could have been said to him. In his delight he seized Alyosha's hand and pressed it warmly to his heart. Tears positively glittered in his eyes. That image of the Mother of God of which I was telling you just now, he said. Take it home and keep it for yourself. And I'll let you go back to the monastery. I was joking this morning, don't be angry with me. My head aches, Alyosha. Alyosha, comfort my heart. Be an angel and tell me the truth. You're still asking whether she has been here or not. Alyosha said sorrowfully, No, no, no. I believe you. I'll tell you what it is, you go to Grushenka yourself, or see her somehow, make haste and ask her, see for yourself, which she means to choose, him or me. Eh. What? Can you? If I see her I'll ask her, Alyosha muttered, embarrassed. No, she won't tell you, the old man interrupted, she's a rogue. She'll begin kissing you and say that it's you she wants. She's a deceitful, shameless hussy. You mustn't go to her, you mustn't. No, father, and it wouldn't be suitable, it wouldn't be right at all. Where was he sending you just now? He shouted, go, as he ran away. To Katerina Ivanovna. For money. To ask her for money? No. Not for money. He's no money, not a farthing. I'll settle down for the night, and think things over, and you can go. Perhaps you'll meet her. Only be sure to come to me tomorrow in the morning. Be sure to. I have a word to say to you tomorrow. Will you come? Yes. When you come, pretend you've come of your own accord to ask after me. Don't tell anyone I told you to. Don't say a word to Ivan. Very well. Goodbye, my angel. You stood up for me, just now. I shall never forget it. I've a word to say to you tomorrow, but I must think about it. And how do you feel now? I shall get up tomorrow and go out perfectly well, perfectly well. Crossing the yard Alyosha found Ivan sitting on the bench at the gateway. He was sitting writing something in pencil in his notebook. Alyosha told Ivan that their father had waked up, was conscious, and had let him go back to sleep at the monastery. Alyosha, I should be very glad to meet you tomorrow morning, said Ivan cordially, standing up. His cordiality was a complete surprise to Alyosha. I shall be at the Holokovs tomorrow, answered Alyosha, I may be at Katerina Ivanovna's, too, if I don't find her now. But you're going to her now, anyway. For that, compliments and farewell, said Ivan smiling. 
Alyosha was disconcerted. I think I quite understand his exclamations just now, and part of what went before. Dmitri has asked you to go to her and say that he, well, in fact, takes his leave of her. Brother, how will all this horror end between father and Dmitri? exclaimed Alyosha. One can't tell for certain. Perhaps in nothing, it may all fizzle out. That woman is a beast. In any case we must keep the old man indoors and not let Dmitri in the house. Brother, let me ask one thing more, has any man a right to look at other men and decide which is worthy to live? Why bring in the question of worth? The matter is most often decided in men's hearts on other grounds much more natural. And as for rights, who has not the right to wish? Not for another man's death. What even if for another man's death? Why lie to oneself since all men live so and perhaps cannot help living so? Are you referring to what I said just now, that one reptile will devour the other? In that case let me ask you, do you think me like Dmitri capable of shedding Aesop's blood, murdering him, eh? What are you saying, Ivan? Such an idea never crossed my mind. I don't think Dmitri is capable of it, either. Thanks, if only for that, smiled Ivan. Be sure, I should always defend him. But in my wishes I reserve myself full latitude in this case. Goodbye till tomorrow. Don't condemn me, and don't look on me as a villain, he added with a smile. They shook hands warmly as they had never done before. Alyosha felt that his brother had taken the first step towards him, and that he had certainly done this with some definite motive. Chapter 10 Both Together Alyosha left his father's house feeling even more exhausted and dejected in spirit than when he had entered it. His mind too seemed shattered and unhinged, while he felt that he was afraid to put together the disjointed fragments and form a general idea from all the agonizing and conflicting experiences of the day. He felt something bordering upon despair, which he had never known till then. Towering like a mountain above all the rest stood the fatal, insoluble question, how would things end between his father and his brother Dmitri with this terrible woman? Now he had himself been a witness of it, he had been present and seen them face to face. Yet only his brother Dmitri could be made unhappy, terribly, completely unhappy, there was trouble awaiting him. It appeared too that there were other people concerned, far more so than Alyosha could have supposed before. There was something positively mysterious in it, too. Ivan had made a step towards him, which was what Alyosha had been long desiring. Yet now he felt for some reason that he was frightened at it. And these women? Strange to say, that morning he had set out for Katerina Ivanovna's in the greatest embarrassment, now he felt nothing of the kind. On the contrary, he was hastening there as though expecting to find guidance from her. Yet to give her this message was obviously more difficult than before. The matter of the three thousand was decided irrevocably, and Dmitri, feeling himself dishonored and losing his last hope, might sink to any depth. He had, moreover, told him to describe to Katerina Ivanovna the scene which had just taken place with his father. It was by now seven o'clock, and it was getting dark as Alyosha entered the very spacious and convenient house in the high street occupied by Katerina Ivanovna. Alyosha knew that she lived with two aunts. One of them, a woman of little education, was that aunt of her half-sister Agafya Ivanovna who had looked after her in her father's house when she came from boarding school. The other aunt was a Moscow lady of style and consequence, though in straitened circumstances. It was said that they both gave way in everything to Katerina Ivanovna, and that she only kept them with her as chaperones. Katerina Ivanovna herself gave way to no one but her benefactress, the general's widow, who had been kept by illness in Moscow, and to whom she was obliged to write twice a week a full account of all her doings. When Alyosha entered the hall and asked the maid who opened the door to him to take his name up, it was evident that they were already aware of his arrival. Possibly he had been noticed from the window. At least, Alyosha heard a noise, caught the sound of flying footsteps and rustling skirts. Two or three women, perhaps, had run out of the room. Alyosha thought it strange that his arrival should cause such excitement. He was conducted however to the drawing room at once. 
It was a large room, elegantly and amply furnished, not at all in provincial style. There were many sofas, lounges, settees, big and little tables. There were pictures on the walls, vases and lamps on the tables, masses of flowers, and even an aquarium in the window. It was twilight and rather dark. Alyosha made out a silk mantle thrown down on the sofa, where people had evidently just been sitting, and on a table in front of the sofa were two unfinished cups of chocolate, cakes, a glass saucer with blue raisins, and another with sweetmeats. Alyosha saw that he had interrupted visitors, and frowned. But at that instant the portiere was raised, and with rapid, hurrying footsteps Katerina Ivanovna came in, holding out both hands to Alyosha with a radiant smile of delight. At the same instant a servant brought in two lighted candles and set them on the table. Thank God! At last you have come too. I've been simply praying for you all day. Sit down. Alyosha had been struck by Katerina Ivanovna's beauty when, three weeks before, Dmitri had first brought him, at Katerina Ivanovna's special request, to be introduced to her. There had been no conversation between them at that interview, however. Supposing Alyosha to be very shy, Katerina Ivanovna had talked all the time to Dmitri to spare him. Alyosha had been silent, but he had seen a great deal very clearly. He was struck by the imperiousness, proud ease, and self-confidence of the haughty girl. And all that was certain, Alyosha felt that he was not exaggerating it. He thought her great glowing black eyes were very fine, especially with her pale, even rather sallow, longish face. But in those eyes and in the lines of her exquisite lips there was something with which his brother might well be passionately in love, but which perhaps could not be loved for long. He expressed this thought almost plainly to Dmitri when, after the visit, his brother besought and insisted that he should not conceal his impressions on seeing his betrothed. You'll be happy with her, but perhaps, not tranquilly happy. Quite so, brother. Such people remain always the same. They don't yield to fate. So you think I shan't love her forever? No, perhaps you will love her forever. But perhaps you won't always be happy with her. Alyosha had given his opinion at the time, blushing, and angry with himself for having yielded to his brother's entreaties and put such foolish ideas into words. For his opinion had struck him as awfully foolish immediately after he had uttered it. He felt ashamed too of having given so confident an opinion about a woman. It was with the more amazement that he felt now, at the first glance at Katerina Ivanovna as she ran into him, that he had perhaps been utterly mistaken. This time her face was beaming with spontaneous good-natured kindliness, and direct warm-hearted sincerity. The pride and haughtiness which had struck Alyosha so much before, was only betrayed now in a frank, generous energy and a sort of bright, strong faith in herself. Alyosha realized at the first glance, at the first word, that all the tragedy of her position in relation to the man she loved so dearly was no secret to her, that she perhaps already knew everything, positively everything. And yet, in spite of that, there was such brightness in her face, such faith in the future. Alyosha felt at once that he had gravely wronged her in his thoughts. He was conquered and captivated immediately. Besides all this, he noticed at her first words that she was in great excitement, an excitement perhaps quite exceptional and almost approaching ecstasy. I was so eager to see you, because I can learn from you the whole truth, from you and no one else. I have come, muttered Alyosha confusedly, I, he sent me. Ah, he sent you. I foresaw that. Now I know everything, everything, cried Katerina Ivanovna, her eyes flashing. Wait a moment, Alexei Fyodorovich, I'll tell you why I've been so longing to see you. You see, I know perhaps far more than you do yourself, and there's no need for you to tell me anything. I'll tell you what I want from you. I want to know your own last impression of him. I want you to tell me most directly, plainly, coarsely even, oh, as coarsely as you like, what you thought of him just now and of his position after your meeting with him today. That will perhaps be better than if I had a personal explanation with him, as he does not want to come to me. Do you understand what I want from you? Now, tell me simply, tell me every word of the message he sent you with, 
I knew he would send you. He told me to give you his compliments, and to say that he would never come again, but to give you his compliments. His compliments? Was that what he said, his own expression? Yes. Accidentally perhaps he made a mistake in the word, perhaps he did not use the right word. No, he told me precisely to repeat that word. He begged me two or three times not to forget to say so. Katerina Ivanovna flushed hotly. Help me now, Alexei Fyodorovich. Now I really need your help. I'll tell you what I think, and you must simply say whether it's right or not. Listen. If he had sent me his compliments in passing, without insisting on your repeating the words, without emphasizing them, that would be the end of everything. But if he particularly insisted on those words, if he particularly told you not to forget to repeat them to me, then perhaps he was in excitement, beside himself. He had made his decision and was frightened at it. He wasn't walking away from me with a resolute step, but leaping headlong. The emphasis on that phrase may have been simply bravado. Yes, yes, cried Alyosha warmly. I believe that is it. And, if so, he's not altogether lost. I can still save him. Stay. Did he not tell you anything about money, about three thousand rubles? He did speak about it, and it's that more than anything that's crushing him. He said he had lost his honor and that nothing matters now, Alyosha answered warmly, feeling a rush of hope in his heart and believing that there really might be a way of escape and salvation for his brother. But do you know about the money, he added, and suddenly broke off. I've known of it a long time, I telegraphed to Moscow to inquire, and heard long ago that the money had not arrived. He hadn't sent the money, but I said nothing. Last week I learnt that he was still in need of money. My only object in all this was that he should know to whom to turn, and who was his true friend. No, he won't recognize that I am his truest friend, he won't know me, and looks on me merely as a woman. I've been tormented all the week, trying to think how to prevent him from being ashamed to face me because he spent that three thousand. Let him feel ashamed of himself, let him be ashamed of other people's knowing, but not of my knowing. He can tell God everything without shame. Why is it he still does not understand how much I am ready to bear for his sake? Why, why doesn't he know me? How dare he not know me after all that has happened? I want to save him forever. Let him forget me as his betrothed. And here he fears that he is dishonored in my eyes. Why, he wasn't afraid to be open with you, Alexei Fyodorovich. How is it that I don't deserve the same? The last words she uttered in tears. Tears gushed from her eyes. I must tell you, Alyosha began, his voice trembling too, what happened just now between him and my father. And he described the whole scene, how Dmitri had sent him to get the money, how he had broken in, knocked his father down, and after that had again specially and emphatically begged him to take his compliments and farewell. He went to that woman, Alyosha added softly. And do you suppose that I can't put up with that woman? Does he think I can't? But he won't marry her, she suddenly laughed nervously. Could such a passion last forever in a Karamazov? It's passion, not love. He won't marry her because she won't marry him. Again Katerina Ivanovna laughed strangely. He may marry her, said Alyosha mournfully, looking down. He won't marry her, I tell you. That girl is an angel. Do you know that? Do you know that? Katerina Ivanovna exclaimed suddenly with extraordinary warmth. She is one of the most fantastic of fantastic creatures. I know how bewitching she is, but I know too that she is kind, firm and noble. Why do you look at me like that, Alexei Fyodorovich? Perhaps you are wondering at my words, perhaps you don't believe me. Agrafina Alexandrovna, my angel, she cried suddenly to someone, peeping into the next room, come in to us. This is a friend. This is Alyosha. He knows all about our affairs. Show yourself to him. I've only been waiting behind the curtain for you to call me, said a soft, one might even say sugary, feminine voice. The portiere was raised and Grushenka herself, smiling and beaming, came up to the table. 
a violent revulsion passed over Alyosha. He fixed his eyes on her and could not take them off. Here she was, that awful woman, the beast, as Ivan had called her half an hour before. And yet one would have thought the creature standing before him most simple and ordinary, a good-natured, kind woman, handsome certainly, but so like other handsome ordinary women. It is true she was very, very good-looking with that Russian beauty so passionately loved by many men. She was a rather tall woman, though a little shorter than Katerina Ivanovna, who was exceptionally tall. She had a full figure, with soft, as it were, noiseless, movements, softened to a peculiar oversweetness, like her voice. She moved, not like Katerina Ivanovna, with a vigorous, bold step, but noiselessly. Her feet made absolutely no sound on the floor. She sank softly into a low chair, softly rustling her sumptuous black silk dress, and delicately nestling her milk-white neck and broad shoulders in a costly cashmere shawl. She was twenty-two years old, and her face looked exactly that age. She was very white in the face, with a pale pink tint on her cheeks. The modeling of her face might be said to be too broad, and the lower jaw was set a trifle forward. Her upper lip was thin, but the slightly prominent lower lip was at least twice as full, and looked pouting. But her magnificent, abundant dark brown hair, her sable-colored eyebrows and charming gray-blue eyes with their long lashes would have made the most indifferent person, meeting her casually in a crowd in the street, stop at the sight of her face and remember it long after. What struck Alyosha most in that face was its expression of childlike good nature. There was a childlike look in her eyes, a look of childish delight. She came up to the table, beaming with delight and seeming to expect something with childish, impatient, and confiding curiosity. The light in her eyes gladdened the soul, Alyosha felt that. There was something else in her which he could not understand, or would not have been able to define, and which yet perhaps unconsciously affected him. It was that softness, that voluptuousness of her bodily movements, that cat-like noiselessness. Yet it was a vigorous, ample body. Under the shawl could be seen full broad shoulders, a high, still quite girlish bosom. Her figure suggested the lines of the Venus of Milo, though already in somewhat exaggerated proportions. That could be divined. Connoisseurs of Russian beauty could have foretold with certainty that this fresh, still youthful beauty would lose its harmony by the age of thirty, would spread, that the face would become puffy, and that wrinkles would very soon appear upon her forehead and round the eyes, the complexion would grow coarse and red perhaps, in fact, that it was the beauty of the moment, the fleeting beauty which is so often met with in Russian women. Alyosha, of course, did not think of this, but though he was fascinated, yet he wondered with an unpleasant sensation, and as it were regretfully, why she drawled in that way and could not speak naturally. She did so evidently feeling there was a charm in the exaggerated, honeyed modulation of the syllables. It was, of course, only a bad, underbred habit that showed bad education and a false idea of good manners. And yet this intonation and manner of speaking impressed Alyosha as almost incredibly incongruous with the childishly simple and happy expression of her face, the soft, babbyish joy in her eyes. Katerina Ivanovna at once made her sit down in an armchair facing Alyosha, and ecstatically kissed her several times on her smiling lips. She seemed quite in love with her. This is the first time we've met, Alexei Fyodorovich, she said rapturously. I wanted to know her, to see her. I wanted to go to her, but I'd no sooner expressed the wish than she came to me. I knew we should settle everything together, everything. My heart told me so, I was begged not to take the step, but I foresaw it would be a way out of the difficulty, and I was not mistaken. Grushenka has explained everything to me, told me all she means to do. She flew here like an angel of goodness and brought us peace and joy. You did not disdain me, sweet, excellent young lady, drawled Grushenka in her sing-song voice, still with the same charming smile of delight. Don't dare to speak to me like that, you sorceress, you witch. Disdain you. Here, I must kiss your lower lip once more. It looks as though it were swollen, and now it will be more so, and more and more. Look how she laughs, Alexei Fyodorovich. It does one's heart good to see the angel. 
Alyosha flushed, and faint, imperceptible shivers kept running down him. You make so much of me, dear young lady, and perhaps I am not at all worthy of your kindness. Not worthy. She's not worthy of it. Katerina Ivanovna cried again with the same warmth. You know, Alexei Fyodorovich, we're fanciful, we're self-willed, but proudest of the proud in our little heart. We're noble, we're generous, Alexei Fyodorovich, let me tell you. We have only been unfortunate. We were too ready to make every sacrifice for an unworthy, perhaps, or fickle man. There was one man, one, an officer too, we loved him, we sacrificed everything to him. That was long ago, five years ago, and he has forgotten us, he has married. Now he is a widower, he has written, he is coming here, and, do you know, we've loved him, none but him, all this time, and we've loved him all our life. He will come, and Grushenka will be happy again. For the last five years she's been wretched. But who can reproach her, who can boast of her favor? Only that bedred an old merchant, but he is more like her father, her friend, her protector. He found her then in despair, in agony, deserted by the man she loved. She was ready to drown herself then, but the old merchant saved her, saved her. You defend me very kindly, dear young lady. You are in a great hurry about everything, Grushenka drawled again. Defend you. Is it for me to defend you? Should I dare to defend you? Grushenka, angel, give me your hand. Look at that charming soft little hand, Alexei Fyodorovich. Look at it. It has brought me happiness and has lifted me up, and I'm going to kiss it, outside and inside, here, here, here. And three times she kissed the certainly charming, though rather fat, hand of Grushenka in a sort of rapture. She held out her hand with a charming musical, nervous little laugh, watched the sweet young lady, and obviously liked having her hand kissed. Perhaps there's rather too much rapture, thought Alyosha. He blushed. He felt a peculiar uneasiness at heart the whole time. You won't make me blush, dear young lady, kissing my hand like this before Alexei Fyodorovich. Do you think I meant to make you blush, said Katerina Ivanovna, somewhat surprised. Ah, my dear, how little you understand me. Yes, and you too perhaps quite misunderstand me, dear young lady. Maybe I'm not so good as I seem to you. I've a bad heart, I will have my own way. I fascinated poor Dmitri Fyodorovich that day simply for fun. But now you'll save him. You've given me your word. You'll explain it all to him. You'll break to him that you have long loved another man, who is now offering you his hand. Oh, no. I didn't give you my word to do that. It was you kept talking about that. I didn't give you my word. Then I didn't quite understand you, said Katerina Ivanovna slowly, turning a little pale. You promised. Oh, no, angel lady, I've promised nothing, Grushenka interrupted softly and evenly, still with the same gay and simple expression. You see at once, dear young lady, what a willful wretch I am compared with you. If I want to do a thing I do it. I may have made you some promise just now. But now again I'm thinking, I may take to Mitya again. I liked him very much once, liked him for almost a whole hour. Now maybe I shall go and tell him to stay with me from this day forward. You see, I'm so changeable. Just now you said, something quite different, Katerina Ivanovna whispered faintly. Ah, just now. But, you know. I'm such a soft-hearted, silly creature. Only think what he's gone through on my account. What if when I go home I feel sorry for him? What then? I never expected. Ah, young lady, how good and generous you are compared with me. Now perhaps you won't care for a silly creature like me, now you know my character. Give me your sweet little hand, angelic lady, she said tenderly, and with a sort of reverence took Katerina Ivanovna's hand. Here, dear young lady, I'll take your hand and kiss it as you did mine. You kissed mine three times, but I ought to kiss yours three hundred times to be even with you. Well, but let that pass. And then it shall be as God wills. 
Perhaps I shall be your slave entirely and want to do your bidding like a slave. Let it be as God wills, without any agreements and promises. What a sweet hand, what a sweet hand you have. You sweet young lady, you incredible beauty. She slowly raised the hands to her lips, with the strange object indeed of being even with her in kisses. Katerina Ivanovna did not take her hand away. She listened with timid hope to the last words, though Grushenka's promise to do her bidding like a slave was very strangely expressed. She looked intently into her eyes, she still saw in those eyes the same simple-hearted, confiding expression, the same bright gaiety. She's perhaps too naive, thought Katerina Ivanovna, with a gleam of hope. Grushenka meanwhile seemed enthusiastic over the sweet hand. She raised it deliberately to her lips. But she held it for two or three minutes near her lips, as though reconsidering something. Do you know, angel lady, she suddenly drawled in an even more soft and sugary voice, do you know, after all, I think I won't kiss your hand. And she laughed a little merry laugh. As you please. What's the matter with you, said Katerina Ivanovna, starting suddenly. So that you may be left to remember that you kissed my hand, but I didn't kiss yours. There was a sudden gleam in her eyes. She looked with awful intentness at Katerina Ivanovna. Insolent creature, cried Katerina Ivanovna, as though suddenly grasping something. She flushed all over and leapt up from her seat. Grushenka too got up, but without haste. 